Hagman, ensconced in a crevice of stone, peered down. Bit under seven hundred paces, sir. Too far. We can try? Hagman shrugged. I can try, but maybe save it for later. Sharp nodded. Better to reveal the rifle's range to the French when things were more desperate. Vicente again looked bewildered, so Sharp explained. A rifle bullet can carry that far, but it would take a genius to be accurate. Dan's close to genius. He thought about taking a small party of riflemen halfway down the slope, and he knew that at three or four hundred yards they could do a lot of damage to a gun crew. But the gun crew, at that range, would answer them with canister, and though the lower slope of the hill was littered with rocks, few were of a size to shelter a man from canister. Sharp would lose soldiers if he went down the hill. He would do it, he decided, if the gun turned out to be a mortar, for mortars never carried canister but the French were bound to answer his foray with a strong skirmish line of infantry, stroke and counterstroke. It felt frustrating. All he could do was pray the gun was not a mortar. It was not a mortar. An hour after the working party began making a level platform, the cannon appeared, and Sharp saw it was a howitzer. That was bad enough, but it gave his men a chance, for a howitzer shell would come at an oblique angle, and his men would be safe behind the bigger boulders on the hilltop. Vicente borrowed the small telescope and watched the French gunners unlimber the gun and prepare its ammunition. A caisson, its long coffin-like lid cushioned so that the gun crew could travel on it, was being opened, and the powder bags and shells piled by the level ground. It looks like a very small gun, Vicente said. Doesn't have to be long barreled Sharp explained, because it isn't a precision gun. It just lobs shells on us. It'll be noisy, but we'll survive. He said that to cheer Vicente up, but he was not as confident as he sounded. Two or three lucky shells could decimate his command, but at least the howitzer's arrival had taken his men's minds off their larger predicament, and they watched as the gunners made ready. A small flag had been placed fifty paces in front of the howitzer, presumably so the gun captain could judge the wind which would tend to drift the shells westwards. Sure enough, Sharp saw them edge the howitzer's trail to compensate, and then watched through the telescope as the coins were hammered under the stubby barrel. Field guns were usually elevated with a screw, but howitzers used the old-fashioned wooden wedges. Sharp reckoned the skinny officer who supervised the gun must be using his largest wedges, straining to get maximum elevation, so that his shells would drop into the rocks on the hill's summit. The first powder bags were being brought to the weapon, and Sharp saw the flash of reflected sunlight glance off steel, and he knew the officer must be trimming the shell's fuse. Under cover, Sergeant! Sharp shouted. Every man had a place to go to, a place that was well protected by the great boulders. Most of the riflemen were in the redoubts, walled with stone, but half a dozen, including Sharp and Harper, were inside the old watchtower, where a stairway had once led to the ramparts. Only four of the steps were left, and they merely climbed to a gaping cavity in the stonework of the northern wall, and Sharp positioned himself there so he could see what the French were doing. The gun vanished in a cloud of smoke, followed a heartbeat later by the massive boom of the exploding powder. Sharp tried to find the missile in the sky, then saw the tiny wavering trail of smoke left by the burning fuse. Then came the sound of the shell, a thunder rolling overhead, and the smoke trail whipped only a couple of feet above the ruined watchtower. Everyone had been holding their breath, but now let it out as the shell exploded somewhere above the southern slope. Cotter's fuse too long, Harper said. He won't next time, Tung said. Daniel Hagman, white-faced, sat against the wall with his eyes closed. Vicente and most of his men were a little way down the slope, where they were protected by a boulder the size of a house, Nothing could reach them directly, but if a shell bounced off the face of the watchtower, it would probably fall among them. Sharp tried not to think of that. He'd done his best, and he knew he couldn't provide absolute safety for every man. They waited. Get on with it, Harris said. Harper crossed himself. Sharp looked through the hole in the wall and saw the gunner carrying the port fire to the barrel. He said nothing to the men for the noise of the gun would be warning enough, and he was not looking down the hill to see when the howitzer was fired, but the moment when the French put in an infantry attack.
That seemed the obvious thing for them to do. Fire the howitzer to keep the British and Portuguese heads down, and then send their infantry to make an assault. But Sharp saw no sign of any such attack. The dragoons were keeping their distance, the infantry was out of sight, and the gunners just kept working. Shell after shell arced to the hilltop. After the first shot, the fuses were cut to the precise length, and the shells cracked on rocks, fell, and exploded. Monotonously, steadily, shot after shot. And each explosion sent shards of hot iron crackling and whistling through the jumble of boulders on the hilltop. Yet the French seemed unaware of how much shelter the boulders provided. The summit stank of powder, the smoke drifted like mist through the rocks, and clung to the litching-covered stones of the watchtower. But miraculously, no one was badly hurt. One of Vicendi's men was struck by a sliver of iron that cut his upper arm, but that was the only casualty. Yet even so, the men hated the ordeal. They sat hunched, counting down the shots that came at a regular pace, one a minute, and the seconds stretched between each one, and no one spoke. And each shot was a boom from the base of the hill, a crash or thump as the shells struck, the ragged explosion of the powder charge, and the shriek of its fragmented casing. One shell failed to explode, and they all waited breathless as the seconds passed, and then realized that its fuse must have been faulty. How many bloody shells do they have? Harper asked after a quarter hour. No one could answer. Sharp had a vague recollection that a British six-pounder carried more than a hundred rounds of ammunition in its limber case on the axle boxes, but he wasn't sure of that, and French practice was probably different, so he said nothing. Instead, he prowled round the hilltop, going from the tower to the men in the redoubts, and then watching anxiously down the other flanks of the hill, and still there was no sign that the French contemplated an assault. He went back to the tower. Hagman had produced a small wooden flute, something he'd whittled himself during his convalescence, and now he played trills and snatches of old familiar melodies. The scraps of music sounded like birdsong. Then the hilltop would reverberate to the next explosion. The shell fragments would batter against the tower, and as the brutal sound faded, so the flute's breathy sound would re-emerge. I always wanted to play the flute, Sharp said to no one in particular. The fiddle! Harris said. I've always wanted to play the fiddle. Hard, that, Harper said. Because it's fiddly. They groaned, and Harper grinned proudly. Sharp was mentally counting the seconds, imagining the gun being pushed back into place, and then being sponged out. The gunner's thumb over the touch hole to stop the rush of air forced by the incoming sponge from setting fire to any unexploded powder in the breach. When every lingering scrap of fire had been extinguished inside the barrel, they would thrust home the powder bags, then the six-inch shell with its carefully cut fuse protruding from the wooden bung, and the gunner would ram a spike down the touch hole to pierce a canvas powder bag, and afterwards push a reed filled with more powder down into the punctured bag. They would stand back, cover their ears, and the gunner would touch the linstock to the reed, and just then Sharp heard the boom and almost instantly there was an almighty crash inside the tower itself, and he realized the shell had come right through the hole at the top of the truncated staircase, and now it fell down, fused smoking in a wild spiral, to lodge between two of the packs that held their food. And Sharp stared at it, saw the wisp of smoke shivering upwards, knew they must all die or be terribly maimed when it exploded. And he didn't think, just dived. He scrabbled at the fuse, knew he was too late to extract it, and so he dropped onto the shell, his belly smothering it, and his mind was screaming because he didn't want to die. It'll be quick, he thought, it'll be quick, and at least he wouldn't have to take decisions any more, and no one else would be hurt, and he cursed the shell because it was taking so long to explode, and he was staring at Daniel Hagman, who was staring back at him, eyes wide, and the forgotten flute held just an inch from his mouth. Stay there much longer, Harper said in a voice that could not quite hide the strain he was feeling, and you'll hatch the bloody thing. Hagman started to laugh. Then Harris and Cooper and Harper joined in, and Sharp climbed off the shell, and saw that the wooden plug that held the fuse was blackened by fire, but somehow the fuse had gone out, and he picked up the damned missile and hurled it out of the hole and listened to it clatter down the hill. Sweet Jesus, Sharp said. He was sweating, shaking, shaking, 
He collapsed back against the wall and looked at his men who were weak with laughter. Oh, God, he said. You'd have had a bellyache if that had pops you, Hagman said, and that started them all laughing again. Sharp felt drained. If you bastards have nothing better to do, he said, then take out the canteens, give everyone a drink. He was rationing the water like the food, but the day was hot and he knew everyone would be dry. He followed the rifleman outside. Vicente, who had no idea what had just happened, but only knew that a second shell had failed to explode, looked anxious. What happened? Fuse went out, Sharp said. Just went out. He went down to the northernmost redoubts and stared at the gun. How much bloody ammunition did the bastards have? The rate of fire had slowed a little, but that seemed more to do with the gunner's weariness than a shortage of shells. He watched them load another round, did not bother to take cover, and the shell exploded up behind the watchtower. The howitzer had recoiled eight or nine feet, much less than a field gun, and he watched as the gunners put their shoulders to the wheel and shoved it back into place. The air between Sharp and the gun wavered because of the day's heat, which was made more intense by a small grass fire ignited by the cannon's blast. That had been happening all day, and the howitzer's muzzle flame had left a fan-shaped patch of scorched grass and ferns in front of the barrel. And then Sharp saw something else, something that puzzled him, and he opened Christopher's small telescope, cursing the loss of his own, and he steadied the barrel on a rock and stared intently and saw that an officer was crouching beside the gunwheel with an upraised hand. That odd pose had been what puzzled him. Why would a man crouch by the front of a gun's wheels? And Sharp could just see something else. Shadows. The ground there had been cleared, but the sun was now low in the sky, and it was throwing long shadows. And Sharp could see that the cleared ground had been marked with two half-buried stones, each maybe the size of a twelve-pounder's round shot and that the officer was bringing the wheels right up to the two stones. When the wheels touched the stones, he dropped his hand, and the men went about the business of reloading. Sharp frowned, thinking. Now, why on a fine sunny day would the French artillery officer need to mark a place for his gun's wheels? The wheels themselves, iron-rimmed, would leave gouges in the soil that would serve as markers for when the gun was repositioned after each shot. Yet they had taken the trouble to put the stones there as well. He ducked down behind the wall as another blossom of smoke heralded a shell. This one fell fractionally short, and the jagged-edged iron scraps rattled against the low stone walls that Sharp's men had built. Pendleton poked his head above the redoubt. Why don't they use round shot, sir? he asked. Houses don't have round shot, Sharp said, and it's hard to fire a proper gun uphill. He was brusque, for he was wondering about those stones. Why put them there? Had he imagined them? But when he looked through the glass, he could still see them. Then he saw the gunners walk away from the howitzer. A score of infantrymen had appeared, but they were merely a guard for the gun, which was otherwise abandoned. They're having their supper, Harper suggested. He'd brought water for the men in the forward positions, and now sat beside Sharp. For a moment he looked embarrassed, and then grinned. That was a brave thing you did, sir. You'd have done the bloody same. I bloody wouldn't, Harper said vehemently. I'd have been out of that bloody door like a scalded cat if my legs had bloody worked. He saw the deserted gun. So it's over for the day? he asked. No, Sharp said, because he suddenly understood why the stones were there and he knew what he could do about it. Brigadier Vuillard, ensconced in the Kinta, poured himself a glass of Savage's finest white port. His blue uniform jacket was unhooked, and he'd eased a button of his breeches to make space for the fine shoulder of mutton that he'd shared with Christopher, a dozen officers and three women. The women were French, though certainly not wives, and one of them, whose golden hair glinted in the candlelight, had been seated next to Lieutenant Pelletier, who seemed unable to take his bespectacled eyes from a cleavage that was deep, soft, shadowed, and streaked, where sweat had made rivulets through the white powder on her skin. Her very presence had struck Pelletier almost dumb, 
so that all the confidence he'd shown on first meeting Vuya had fled. The brigadier, amused by the woman's effect on the artillery officer, leaned forward to accept a candle from Major Dulon that he used to light a cigar. It was a warm night. The windows were open and a big pale moth fluttered about the candelabra at the table's centre. Is it true? We are, asked Christopher, between the puffs that were needed to get the cigar properly alight. That in England the women are expected to leave the supper table before the cigars are lit. Respectable women, yes. Christopher took the toothpick from his mouth to answer. Even respectable women, I would have thought, make attractive companions to a good smoke and a glass of port. Vuya, content that the cigar was drawing properly, leaned back and glanced down the table. I have an idea, he said genially, that I know precisely who is going to answer the next question. What time is first light tomorrow? There was a pause as the officers glanced at each other. Then Pelletier blushed. Sunrise, sir, he said, will be at twenty minutes past four, but it will be light enough to see at ten minutes to four. So clever, the blonde who was called Annette whispered to him. And the moon state? We are asked. Pelletier blushed an even deeper red. No moon to speak of, sir. The last full moon was on the thirtieth of April, and the next will be. His voice faded away as he became aware that the others about the table were amused by his erudition. Do go on, Lieutenant, Ria said. On the twenty-ninth of this month, sir, so it's a waxing moon in its first quarter, sir, and very slight. No illumination in it, not now. I like a dark night, Annette whispered to him. You're a veritable walking encyclopedist, Lieutenant. We are said. So tell me what damage your shells did today. Very little, sir. I'm afraid. Pelletier, almost overwhelmed by Annette's perfume, looked as though he was about to faint. That summit is prodigiously protected by boulders, sir. If they kept their heads down, sir, then they should have survived mostly intact. Though, I'm sure we killed one or two. Only one or two. Pelletier looked abashed. We needed a mortar, sir. Vuya smiled. When a man lacks instruments, Lieutenant, he uses what he has to hand. Isn't that right, Annette? He smiled, then took a fat watch from his waistcoat pocket and snapped open the lid. How many rounds of shell do you have left? Thirty-eight, sir. Don't use them all at once, Vuya said. Then raised an eyebrow in mock surprise. Don't you have work to do, Lieutenant? He asked. The work was to fire the howitzer through the night, so that the ragged forces on the hilltop would get no sleep. Then, an hour before first light, the gunfire would stop, and we are reckoned the enemy would all be asleep when his infantry attacked. Pelletier scraped his chair back. Of course, sir, and thank you, sir. Thank you. For the supper, sir. We are made a gracious gesture of acceptance. I'm just sorry, Lieutenant, that you can't stay for the entertainment. I'm sure Mademoiselle Annette would have liked to hear about your charges, your rama, and your sponge. She would, sir. Pelletier asked, surprised. Go, Lieutenant. We are said. Just go. The Lieutenant fled, pursued by the sound of laughter, and the Brigadier shook his head. God knows where we find them. He said, "We must pluck them from their cradles, wipe the mother's milk from their lips, and send them to war." Still, young Pelletier knows his business. He dangled the watch on its chain for a second, then thrust it into a pocket. First light at ten minutes to four, Major. He spoke to Dulon. "We'll be ready," Dulon said. He looked sad. The failure of the previous night's attack still galling him. The bruise on his face was dark. Ready and rested, I hope," Vuya said. "We'll be ready," Dulong said again. Vuya nodded, but kept his watchful eyes on the infantry major. "Amarante is taken," he said, "which means some of Loison's men can return to Oporto. With luck, major, that means we shall have enough force to march south on Lisbon."
I hope so, sir, Dulong answered, uncertain where the conversation was going. But General Udley's division is still clearing the road to Vigo, Ria went on. Foy's infantry is scouring the mountains of partisans, so our forces will still be stretched, Major, stretched. Even if we get Delaborde's brigades back from General Loison, and even with Lorge's dragoons, we shall be stretched if we want to march on Lisbon. I'm sure we'll succeed all the same, Dulong said loyally. But we need every man we can muster, Major, every man, and I do not want to detach valuable infantry to guard prisoners. There was silence round the table. Dulong gave a small smile as he understood the implications of the brigadier's words, but he said nothing. Do I make myself clear, Major? We are asked in a harder tone. You do, sir, Dulong said. Bayonets fixed, then, we are said, tapping ash from his cigar. And use them, Major. Use them well. Dulong looked up, his grim face unreadable. No prisoner, sir. He did not inflect the words as a question. That sounds like a very good idea, Ria said, smiling. Now go and get some sleep. Major Dulong left, and Ria poured more port. War is cruel, he said sententiously, but cruelty is sometimes necessary. The rest of you, he looked at the officers on both sides of the table, you can ready yourselves for the march back to Oporto. We should have this business finished by eight tomorrow morning. So shall we set a march time of ten o'clock? For by then the watchtower on the hill would have fallen. The howitzer would keep Sharp's men awake by firing through the night. And in the dawn, as the tired men fought off sleep, and a wolf-grey light seeped across the world's rim, Dulong's well-trained infantry would go in for the kill. At dawn. Sharp had watched till the very last seep of twilight had gone from the hill, until there was nothing but bleak darkness, and only then, with Pendleton Tongue and Harris as his companions, he edged past the outer stone wall and felt his way down the path. Harper had wanted to come, had even been upset at not being allowed to accompany Sharp, but Harper would need to command the rifleman if Sharp did not come back. Sharp would have liked to take Hackman, but the old man was still not fully mended, and so he'd gone with Pendleton, who was young, agile, and cunning, and with Tongue and Harris, who were both good shots and both intelligent. Each of them carried two rifles, but Sharp had left his big cavalry sword with Harper, for he knew that the heavy metal scabbard was likely to knock on stones, and so betray his position. It was hard, slow work going down the hill. There was a thin suggestion of a moon, but stray clouds continually covered it, and even when it showed clearly, it had no power to light their path. And so they felt their way down, saying nothing, groping ahead for each step, and thereby making more noise than Sharp liked, but the night was full of noises. Insects, the sigh of the wind across the hill's flank, and the distant cry of a vixen. Hagman would have coped better, Sharp thought, for he moved through the dark with the grace of a poacher, while all four of the riflemen going down the hill's long slope were from towns. Pendleton, Sharp knew, was from Bristol, where he'd joined the army rather than face transportation for being a pickpocket. Tongue, like Sharp, came from London, but Sharp couldn't remember where Harris had grown up, and when they stopped to catch their breath and search the darkness for any hint of light, Sharp asked him. Richfield, sir, Harris whispered. Where Samuel Johnson came from? Johnson? Sharp could not quite place the name. Is he in the 1st Battalion? Very much so, sir, Harris whispered. And then they went on, and as the slope became less steep and they accustomed themselves to this blind journey, they became quieter. Sharp was proud of them. They might not have been born to such a task, as Hagman had, but they'd become stalkers and killers. They wore the green jacket. And then, after what seemed like an hour since they'd left the watchtower, Sharp saw what he expected to see. A glimmer of light. Just a glimmer that swiftly vanished, but it was yellow, and he knew it came from a screen lantern, and that someone, a gunner probably, had drawn back the screen to throw a small wash of light. And then there was another light, this one red and tiny, and Sharp knew it was the howitzer's port fire. Down, 
he whispered. He watched the tiny red glow. It was further away than he would have liked, but there was plenty of time. Close your eyes, he hissed. They closed their eyes, and a moment later the gun crashed its smoke, flame and shell into the night, and Sharp heard the missile trundle overhead, and he saw a dull light on his closed eyelids. Then he opened his eyes and could see nothing for a few seconds. He could smell the gun smoke, though and he saw the red port fire move as the gunner put it aside. On, he said, and they crept on down the hill, and the screen lantern blinked again as the gun crew pushed the Hartz's wheels back to the two stones which marked the place where they could be sure that despite the darkness the gun would be accurate. That was the realization that had come to Sharp at sunset, the reason why they'd marked the ground, because in the night the French gunners needed an easy method for realigning the howitzer, and the two big stones made better markers than gouges in the soil. So he'd known this night firing was going to happen, and knew exactly what he could do about it. It was a long time before the hearts are fired again, and by then Sharp and his men were two hundred paces away, and not much higher than the gun. Sharp had expected the second shot much sooner. Then he realized that the gunners would probably space their shells through the short night to keep his men awake, and that would mean a long time between shots. Harris, tongue, he whispered. Off to the right. If you get into trouble, get the hell back up to Harper. Pendleton, come on. He led the youngster away to the left, crouching as he moved, feeling his way through the rocks until he reckoned he'd gone about fifty paces from the path. And then he settled Pendleton behind a boulder and positioned himself behind a low gorse bush. You know what to do? Yes, sir. So enjoy it. Sharp was enjoying himself. It surprised him to realize it, but he was. There was a joy in thus foxing the enemy, though perhaps the enemy had expected what was about to happen and was ready for it. But this was no time to worry, just time to spread some confusion. And he waited and waited, until he was certain he was wrong and that the gunners would not fire again. And then the whole night was split apart by a tongue of white flame, bright and long, that was immediately swallowed by the cloud of smoke and Sharp had a sudden glimpse of the gun bucking back on its trail, its big wheels spinning a foot high in the air. And then his night vision was gone, seared from his eyes by the bright stab of fire. And he waited again. Only this time it was just a few seconds before he saw the yellow glow of the unshielded lantern, and he knew the gunners were manhandling the howitzer's wheels towards the stones. He aimed at the lantern. His vision was smeared by the after-effects of the fire, but he could see the square of lamplight clearly enough. He was just about to squeeze the trigger, and one of his men on the right of the path fired, and the lantern was dropped. Its shielding fell away, and Sharp could see two dark figures half-lit by the new and brighter light. He edged the rifle left and pulled the trigger, heard Pendleton fire. Then he snatched up the second rifle and aimed again into the pool of light. A Frenchman jumped forward to extinguish the lantern, and three rifles— one of them Sharp's sounded at the same time, and the man was snatched backwards, and Sharp heard a loud clang like a cracked bell ringing, and knew one of the bullets had hit the howitzer's barrel. Then the light went out. Come on! Sharp called to Pendleton, and the two of them ran further to their left. They could hear the French shouting, one man gasping and moaning, then a louder voice calling for silence. Down! Sharp whispered and the two went to ground, and Sharp began the laborious business of loading his two rifles in the dark. He saw a small flame burning back where he and Pendleton had been, and he knew that the wadding from one of their rifles had started a small grass fire. It flickered for a few seconds, then he saw dark shapes nearby and guessed that the French infantry who had been guarding the gun were out looking for whoever had just fired the shots. But the searchers found nothing, trampled the small fire dead, and went back to the trees. There was another pause. Sharp could hear the murmur of voices and reckoned the French were discussing what to do next. The answer came soon enough when he heard the trampling of feet, and he deduced that the infantry had been sent to scour the nearer hillside. But in the dark they merely blundered through the ferns and cursed whenever they tripped on rocks or became entangled by gorse. Officers and sergeants snarled and snapped at the men who were too sensible to spread out and get lost or maybe ambushed in the darkness. After a while they trailed back to the trees, and there was another long wait. 
though Sharp could hear the clatter of the howitzer's rammer as it shoved and scraped the next shell home. The French probably thought their attackers were gone, he decided. No shots had come for a long time, and their own infantry had made a perfunctory search, and the French were probably feeling safer. For the gunner foolishly tried to revive the port fire by whipping it back and forth a couple of times until its tip glowed a brighter red. He didn't need the extra heat to light the reed in the touch hole, but rather to see the touch hole. And it was his death sentence. For he then blew on the tip of the slow match held in the port fire's jaws, and either Harris or Tongue shot him, and even Sharp jumped with surprise when the rifle shot blistered the night. And he had a glimpse of flame far off to his right, and then the French infantry were forming ranks. The fallen port fire was snatched up, and just as the howitzer fired, so the muskets hammered a crude volley in the direction of Tongue and Harris and the grass fires started again. One sprang up just in front of the howitzer, and two smaller fires were ignited by the wadding of the French muskets. Sharp, his eyes still dazzled by the gun's big flame, nevertheless could see the crew heaving at the wheels, and he slid the rifle forward. He fired, changed weapons and fired again, aiming at the dark knot of men straining at the nearest gun wheel. He saw one fall away. Pendleton fired, Two more shots came from the right, and the grass fires were spreading. And then the infantry realized that the flames were illuminating the gunners, making them targets, and they frantically stamped out the small fires. But not before Pendleton had fired his second rifle, and Sharp saw another gunner spin away from the howitzer. Then a last shot came from Tongue or Harris before the flames were at last extinguished. Sharp and Pendleton went back fifty paces before reloading. We heard them that time, Sharp said. Small groups of Frenchmen, emboldening themselves with loud shouts, darted forward to search the slope again, but again found nothing. He stayed another half hour, fired four more times, and then went back to the hilltop, a journey which in the dark took almost two hours, though it was easier than going down, for there was just enough light in the sky to show the outline of the hill and the broken stub of the watchtower. Tongue and Harris followed an hour later, hissing the password up at the sentry before coming excitedly into the fort where they told the tale of their exploit. The howitzer fired twice more during the night. The first shot rattled the lower slope with canister, and the second, a shell, cracked the night with flame and smoke just to the east of the watchtower. No one got much sleep, but Sharp would have been surprised if anyone had slept well after the day's ordeal. And just before dawn, when the eastern edge of the world was a grey glow, he went round to make sure everyone was awake. Harper was laying a fire beside the watchtower wall. Sharp had forbidden any fires during the night, for the flames would have given the French gunners an excellent aiming mark. But now that the daylight was coming, it would be safe to brew up some tea. They can stay here forever, Harper had said, so long as we can stew some tea, sir. But one out of tea, and we'll have to surrender. The grey streak in the east spread, lightning at its base. Vicente shivered beside Sharp, for the night had turned surprisingly cold. You think they're coming? Vicente asked. They're coming, Sharp said. He knew that the howitzer's ammunition supply was not endless, and there could only have been one reason to keep the gun working through the night, and that was to fray his men's nerves so that they would be easy meat for a morning attack. And that meant the French would come at dawn. And the light grew, wan and grey, and pale as death, and the tops of the highest clouds were already golden red, as the light changed from grey to white, and white to gold, and gold to red. And then the killing began. Sir! Mr. Sharp! I see them! Dark shapes melding into the dark shadows of the northern slope. It was French infantry, or perhaps dismounted dragoons coming to attack. Rifles! Make ready! There were clicks as Baker rifles were cocked. Your men don't fire, understand? Sharp said to Vicente. Of course, Vicente said. The muskets would be hopelessly inaccurate at anything more than sixty paces, so Sharp would keep the Portuguese volley as a final defence, and let his riflemen teach the French the advantages of the seven lands and seven grooves twisting the quarter turn in the rifle barrels. Vicente was bouncing up and down on the balls of his feet, betraying the nervousness he felt. He fingered one end of his small moustache and licked his lips. We wait till they reach that white rock, yes? Yes, Sharp said. And why don't you shave that moustache off? 
Vicente stared at him. Why don't I shave my moustache? He could scarcely believe his ears. Shave it off, Sharp said. You look older. That's like a lawyer. Lewis would do it for you. He'd successfully taken Vicente's mind off his worries, and now he looked east where a mist hung over the low ground. No threat from there, he reckoned, and he had four of his riflemen watching the southern path, but only four, because he was fairly certain that the French would concentrate their troops on one side of the hill, and, once he was absolutely certain of that, he would bring those four back across to the northern side and let a couple of Vicente's men guard the southern path. When you're ready, lads, Sharp called, but don't fire high. Sharp didn't know it, but the French were late. Dulong had wanted his men closed up on the summit approach before the horizon turned grey, but it had taken longer than he anticipated to climb the dark slope, and besides his men were befuddled and tired after a night of chasing phantoms. Except the phantoms were real, and had killed one gunner, wounded three more, and put the fear of God into the rest of the artillery crew. Dulon, ordered to take no prisoners, felt some respect for the men he faced. And then the massacre began. It was a massacre. The French had muskets, the British had rifles, and the French had to converge on the narrow ridge that climbed to the small summit plateau, and once on the ridge they were easy meat for the rifles. Six men went down in the first few seconds, and Doulon's response was to lead the others on, to overwhelm the fort with manpower. But more rifles cracked, more smoke drifted from the hilltop, more bullets thumped home, and Doulon understood what he'd only appreciated before through lectures, the menace of a rifled barrel. At a range where a full battalion musket volley was unlikely to kill a single man, the British rifles were deadly. The bullets, he noticed, made a different sound. There was a barely detectable shriek in their whip-like menace. The guns themselves did not cough like a musket, but had a snap to their report, and a man struck by a rifle bullet was thrown back further than he would have been by a musket ball. Doulon could see the riflemen now, for they stood up in their rock pits to reload their damned guns, ignoring the threat of the howitzer's shells that sporadically arced over the French infantry's heads to explode on the crest. Doulong shouted at his men to fire at the green-jacketed enemy. But the musket shot sounded feeble, and the balls went wide, and still the rifle shot slashed home, and his men were reluctant to climb onto the narrow part of the ridge. So Doulong, knowing that example was all, and reckoning that a lucky man might possibly survive the rifle fire, and reach the redoubts, decided to set an example. He shouted at his men to follow, drew his sabre, and charged. For France! he cried. For the Emperor! Cease fire! Sharp shouted. Not one man had followed Doulon, not one. He came alone, and Sharp recognized the Frenchman's bravery, and to show it he stepped forward and raised his sword in a formal salute. Doulon saw the salute, checked and turned, and saw he was alone. He looked back to Sharp, raised his own sabre, then sheathed it with a violent thrust that betrayed the disgust he felt at his men's reluctance to die for the Emperor. He nodded at Sharp, then walked away. And twenty minutes later the rest of the French were gone from the hill. Vicente's men had been formed in two ranks on the tower's open terrace, ready to fire a volley that had not been needed. And two of them had been killed by a howitzer shell. And another shell had slammed a piece of its casing into Gattaca's leg, gouging a bloody path down his right thigh, but leaving the bone unbroken. Sharp had not even registered that the howitzer had been firing during the attack, but it had stopped now. The sun was fully risen, and the valleys were flooded by light. And Sergeant Harper, his rifle barrel fouled by powder deposits and hot from firing, had made the day's first pot of tea. Chapter 7 It was just before midday when a French soldier climbed the hill carrying a white flag of truce tied to the muzzle of his musket. Two officers accompanied him, one in French infantry blue and the other, Colonel Christopher, in his red British uniform jacket with its black facings and cuffs. Sharp and Vicente went to meet the two officers, who had advanced a dozen paces ahead of the glum-looking man with the white flag, and Vicente was forcibly struck by the resemblance between Sharp and the French infantry officer.
who was a tall, black-haired man with a scar on his right cheek and a bruise across the bridge of his nose. His ragged blue uniform bore the green-fringed epaulettes that showed he was a light infantryman, and his flared shako was fronted with a white metal plate stamped with a French eagle and the number 31. The badge was surmounted by a plume of red and white feathers, which looked new and fresh compared to the Frenchman's stained and threadbare uniform. We'll kill the frog first, Sharp said to Vicente, because he's the dangerous bugger, and then we'll fill it Christopher slowly. Sharp! The lawyer in Vicente was shocked. They're under a flag of truce. They stopped a few paces from Colonel Christopher, who took a toothpick from his lips and chucked it away. How are you, Sharp? he asked genially, then held up a hand to stay any answer. Give me a moment, will you? the colonel said, and one-handedly clicked open a tinderbox, struck a light, and drew on a cigar. When it was burning satisfactorily, he closed the tinderbox's lid on the small flames and smiled. Fellow with me is called Major Dulong. He don't speak a word of English, but he wanted to have a look at you. Sharp looked at Dulong, recognized him as the officer who had led so bravely up the hill, and then felt sorry that a good man had climbed back up the hill alongside a traitor. A traitor and a thief. Where's my telescope? He demanded of Christopher. Back down the hill, Christopher said carelessly. You can have it later. He drew on the cigar and looked at the French bodies among the rocks. Brigadier Vuillard has been a mite over-eager, wouldn't you say? Cigar? No. Please yourself. The colonel sucked deep. You've done well, Sharp. Proud of you. The 31st Leger, he jerked his head towards Doulon, ain't used to losing. You show the damn frogs how an Englishman fights, eh? And how Irishmen fight, Sharp said, and Scots, Welsh and Portuguese. Decent of you to remember the uglier breeds, Christopher said. But it's over now, Sharp, all over. Time to pack up and go. Frogs are offering you honours of war and all that. March out with your guns shouldered. Your colours flying, and let bygones be bygones. They ain't happy, Sharp, but I persuaded them. Sharp looked at Doulon again, and he wondered if there was a look of warning in the Frenchman's eyes. Doulon had said nothing, but just stood a pace behind Christopher and two paces to the side, and Sharp suspected the Major was distancing himself from Christopher's errand. Sharp looked back to Christopher. You think I'm a damn fool, don't you? he retorted. Christopher ignored the comment. I don't think you've time to reach Lisbon. Craddock will be gone in a day or two, and his army with him. They're going home, Sharp, back to England, so probably the best thing for you to do is wait in a porto. The French have agreed to repatriate all British citizens, and a ship will probably be sailing from there within a week or two, and you and your fellows can be aboard. Will you be aboard? Sharp asked. I very well might, Sharp. Thank you for asking. And if you'll forgive me for sounding immodest, I rather fancy I shall sail home to a hero's welcome. The man who brought peace to Portugal. There has to be a knighthood in that, don't you think? Not that I care, of course, but I'm sure Kate will enjoy being Lady Christopher. If you weren't under a flag of truce, Sharp said, I'd disembowel you here and now. I know what you've been doing. Dinner parties with French generals. "'Bringing them here so they could snap us up? "'You're a bloody traitor, Christopher, nothing but a bloody traitor!' "'The vehemence of his tone brought a small smile to Major Dulong's grim face. "'Oh, dear!' Christopher looked pained. "'Oh, dear me, dear me!' "'He stared at a nearby French corpse for a few seconds, then shook his head. "'I'll overlook your impertinent sharp.' I suppose that damn servant of mine found his way to you. He did? I yeah, thought as much. Louis has an unrivaled talent for misunderstanding circumstances. He drew on his cigar, then blew a plume of smoke that was whirled away on the wind. I was sent here sharp by His Majesty's government with instructions to discover whether Portugal was worth fighting for, whether it was worth an effusion of British blood. And I concluded, and I've no doubt you will disagree with me, that it was not. So I obeyed the second part of my remit, which was to secure terms from the French, not terms of surrender, Sharp, but of settlement. 
We shall withdraw our forces, and they will withdraw theirs. Though for form's sake, they will be allowed to march a token division through the streets of Lisbon. Then they're going. Bonsoir, adieu, and au revoir. By the end of July, there will not be one foreign soldier remaining on Portugal's soil. That is my achievement, Sharp. And it was necessary to dine with French generals, French marshals, and French officials to secure it. He paused, as if expecting some reaction, but Sharp just looked sceptical, and Christopher sighed. That is the truth, Sharp, however hard you may find it to believe. But remember, there are more things I know, Sharp interrupted. More things in heaven and earth than I bloody know about, but what the hell were you doing here? His voice was angry now. And you've been wearing a French uniform, Louis told me. Can't usually wear this red coat behind French lines, Sharp. Christopher said. And civilian clothes don't exactly command respect these days. So yes, I do sometimes wear French uniform. It's a ruse de guerre, Sharp. A ruse de guerre. A ruse of bloody nothing, Sharp snarled. Those bastards have been trying to kill my men, and you brought them here. Oh, Sharp, Christopher said sadly. We needed somewhere quiet to sign the memorandum of agreement, some place where the mob could not express its crude opinions. And so I offered the Kinta. I confess I did not consider your predicament as thoroughly as I should, and that is my fault. I am sorry. He even offered Sharp the hint of a bow. The French came here, they deemed your presence a trap, and, against my advice, attempted to attack you. I apologize again, Sharp, most profusely. But it's over now. You're free to leave. You do not offer a surrender. You do not yield your weapons. You march out with your head held high, and you will go with my sincerest congratulations. And, naturally, I shall make quite certain that your colonel learns of your achievement here. He waited for Sharp's answer, and when none came, smiled. And, of course, he went on, I shall be honoured to return your telescope. I clean forgot to bring it with me just now. You forgot nothing, you bastard. Sharp growled. Sharp, Christopher said reprovingly, try not to be brutish. Try to understand that diplomacy employs subtlety, intelligence, and yes, deceit. And try to understand that I have negotiated your freedom. You may leave the hill in triumph. Sharp stared into Christopher's face, which seemed so guileless, so pleased to be the bearer of this news. And what happens if we stay? he asked. I have not the foggiest idea. Christopher said. But of course I shall try to find out if that is indeed your wish, but my guess, Sharp, is that the French will construe such stubbornness as a hostile gesture. There are sadly folk in this country who will oppose our settlement. There are misguided people who would prefer to fight rather than accept a negotiated peace, and if you stay here, then that encourages their foolishness. My own suspicion is that if you insist upon staying, and thus break the terms of our agreement, the French will bring mortars from a porto and do their best to persuade you to leave. He drew on the cigar, then flinched as a raven pecked at the eyes of a nearby corpse. Major Doulon would like to collect these men. He gestured with cigar towards the bodies left by Sharp's riflemen. He's got one hour, Sharp said, and he can bring ten men, none of them armed and tell him some of my men will be on the hill, and they won't be armed either. Christopher frowned. Why would your men need to be on the open hillside? he asked. Because we've got to bury our dead, Sharp said, and it's all rock up there. Christopher drew on the cigar. I think it would be much better, Sharp, he said gently, if you brought your men down now. Sharp shook his head. I'll think about it he said. You'll think about it, Christopher repeated, looking irritated now. And how long, might I ask, would it take you to think about it? As long as it takes, Sharp said, and I can be a very slow thinker. You have one hour, Lieutenant, Christopher said. Precisely one hour. He spoke in French to Doulon, who nodded at Sharp, who nodded back. Then Christopher threw away the half-smoked cigar, turned on his heel, and went. He's lying, Sharp said. Vicente was less certain. You can be sure of that? I'll tell you why I'm sure, Sharp said. The bugger didn't give me an order. 
This is the army. You don't suggest, you order. Do this, do that. But he didn't. He's given me orders before, but not today. Vicente translated for the benefit of Sergeant Macedo, who with Harper had been invited to listen to Sharp's report. Both sergeants, like Vicente, looked troubled, but they said nothing. Why? Vicente asked. Would he not give you an order? Because he wants me to walk off this hilltop of my own accord, because what's going to happen down there isn't pretty. Because he was lying. You can't be sure of that, Vicente said sternly, sounding more like the lawyer he had been rather than the soldier he now was. Well, we can't be sure of bloody anything, Sharp grumbled. Vicente looked into the east. The guns have stopped at Amaranti. Maybe there is peace. And why would there be peace? Sharp asked. Why did the French come here in the first place? To stop us trading with Britain, Vicente said. So why withdraw now? The trading will start again. They haven't finished the job, and it isn't like the French to give up so quick. Vicente thought for a few seconds. Perhaps they know they will lose too many men. The further they go into Portugal, the more enemies they make and the longer the supply roads they have to protect. Perhaps they are being sensible. They're bloody frogs, Sharp said. They don't know the meaning of the word, and there's something else. Christopher didn't show me any bits of paper, did he? No agreement signed and sealed. Vicente considered that argument, then nodded to acknowledge its force. If you like, he said, I will go down and ask to see the paper. There isn't a piece of paper, Sharp said, and none of us are going off this hilltop. Vicente paused. Is that an order, senor? That is an order, Sharp said. We are staying. Then we stay, Vicente said. He clapped Mercedo on the shoulder, and the two went back to their men, so Vicente could tell them what had happened. Harper sat beside Sharp. Are you sure now? Of course I'm not bloody sure, Pat, Sharp said testily, but I think he's lying. He never even asked how many casualties we had up here. If he was on our side, he'd ask that, wouldn't he? Harper shrugged, as if he couldn't answer that question. So what happens if we leave? They make us prisoners, march us off to bloody France. Or send us home. If the war is over, Pat, they'll send us home. But if the war is over, then someone else will tell us. A Portuguese official, someone. Not him, not Christopher. And if the fighting's over, why give us just an hour? We'd have the rest of our lives to get off this hill, not one hour. Sharp stared down the slope where the last of the French bodies was being removed by a squad of infantrymen who'd climbed the path with a flag of truce and no weapons. Dulong had led them, and he had thought to bring two spades so that Sharp's men could bury their corpses. The two Portuguese killed by the howitzer in the dawn attack, and Rifleman Donnelly, who'd been lying on the hilltop under a pile of stones ever since Sharp had beaten Dulong's men off the summit. Vicente had sent Sergeant Macedo and three men to dig his two graves, and Sharp had given the second spade to Williamson. Digging the grave will be the end of your punishment, he had said. Ever since the confrontation in the wood, Sharp had been giving Williamson extra duties, keeping the man busy and trying to wear his spirit down. But Sharp reckoned Williamson had been punished enough. Leave your rifle here, Sharp added. Williamson had snatched the spade, dropped his rifle with unnecessary force, and, accompanied by Dodd and Harris, gone downhill to where there was enough soil above the rock to make an adequate grave. Harper and Slattery had carried the dead man down from the hilltop and rolled him into the hole, and then Harper had said a prayer, and Slattery had bowed his head, and now Williamson, stripped to his shirt sleeves, was shoveling the soil back into the grave while Dodd and Harris watched the French carry their last casualties away. Harper also watched the French. "'What happens if they bring a mortar?' he asked. "'We're buggered,' Sharp said. "'But a lot can happen before a mortar gets here.' "'What?' "'I don't know,' Sharp said irritably. He really did not know, any more than he knew what to do. Christopher had been very persuasive, and it was only a streak of stubbornness in Sharp that made him so certain the Colonel was lying. That and the look in Major Dulong's eyes. "'Maybe I'm wrong.' Trouble is, I like it here. Harper smiled. You like it here? I like being away from the army. 
Captain Hogan's all right, but the rest? I can't stand the rest. Jack Puddings, Harper said flatly, meaning officers. I'm better on my own, Sharp said. And out here, I'm on my own. So we're staying. Hey, Harper said. And I think you're right. You do? Sharp sounded surprised. Hey, do, Harper said. Mind you, my mother never reckoned there was any good at thinking. Sharp laughed. Go and clean your rifle pack. Cooper had boiled a can of water, and some of the riflemen used it to swill out their weapons barrels. Every shot left a little layer of caked powder that would eventually build up and make the rifle unusable. But hot water dissolved the residue. Some riflemen preferred to piss down the barrel. Hagman used the boiling water, then scraped at his barrel with his ramrod. You want me to clean yours, sir? He asked Sharp. It'll wait, Dan, Sharp said. Then saw Sergeant Bacedo and his men come back, and he wondered where his own gravediggers were. And so he went to the northernmost redoubt, from where he could see Harrison Dodd stamping the earth down over Donnelly's body, while Williamson leant on the spade. Aren't you finished? Sharp shouted at them. Hurry! Coming, sir, Harris called. And he and Dodd picked up their jackets and started up the hill. Williamson hefted the spade, looked as if he was about to follow, and then quite suddenly turned and ran down the hill. Jesus! Harper appeared beside Sharp and raised his rifle. Sharp pushed it down. He was not trying to save Williamson's life, but there was a truce on the hill, and even a single rifle shot could be construed as breaking the truce, and the howitzer could answer the shot while Dodd and Harris were still on the open slope. The bastard! Hagman watched Williamson run recklessly down the hill, as though he was trying to outrun the expected bullet. Sharp felt a terrible sense of failure. He hadn't liked Williamson, but even so it was the officer who had failed when a man ran. The officer would not get punished, of course, and the man, if he were ever caught, would be shot. But Sharp knew that this was his failure. It was a reproof to his command. Harper saw the stricken look on Sharp's face and did not understand it. We're best off without the bastard, sir, he said. Dodd and Harris looked dumbfounded, and Harris even turned as if he wanted to chase Williamson until Sharp called him back. I should never have sent Williamson to do that job, he said bitterly. Why not? Harper said. You weren't to know he'd run. I don't like losing men, Sharp said bitterly. That's not your fault, Harper protested. And whose is it? Sharp asked angrily. Williamson had vanished into the French ranks, presumably to join Christopher, and the only small consolation was that he had not been able to take his rifle with him. But it was still failure, and Sharp knew it. Best get under cover, he told Harper, because I'll start that damn gun again soon. The howitzer fired ten minutes before the hour was up. Though as no one on the hilltop possessed a watch, they didn't realize it. The shells struck a boulder just below the lowest redoubt, and ricocheted up into the sky, where it exploded in a gout of grey smoke, flame, and whistling shards of shattered casing. One scrap of hot iron buried itself in the stock of Dodd's rifle. The rest rattled on rocks. Sharp, still reproaching himself for Williamson's desertion, was watching the main road in the far valley. There was dust there, and he could just make out horsemen riding from the northwest, from the Aporto Road. Was it a mortar coming? If it was, he thought, then he'd have to think about making an escape. Maybe if they went fast, they could break through the Dragoon Cordon to the west, and get into the high ground where the rocky terrain would make things hard for horsemen. But it would likely prove a bloody passage for the first half mile. Unless he could try it at night. But if that was a mortar approaching, then it would be in action long before nightfall. He stared at the distant road, cursing the shortcomings of Christopher's telescope, and persuaded himself that he could see no kind of vehicle, whether gun carriage or mortar wagon, among the horsemen. But they were very far off, and he couldn't be certain. Mr. Sharp, sir, it was Dan Hagman. Can I have a go of the bastards? Sharp was still brooding over his failure, and his first instinct was to tell the old poacher not to waste his time. Then he became aware of the odd atmosphere on the hill. His men were embarrassed because of Williamson. Many of them probably feared that Sharp, in his anger, would punish them all for one man's sin, and others, very few, might have wanted to follow Williamson. 
but most probably felt that the desertion was a reproach to them all. They were a unit. They were friends. They were proud of each other, and one of them had deliberately thrown that comradeship away. Yet now Hagman was offering to restore some of that pride, and Sharp nodded. Go on, Dan, he said, but only you, only Hagman, he called to the other riflemen. He knew that they would all love to blaze away at the gun crew, but the distance was prodigious, right at the very end of a rifle's range, and only Hagman had the skill to even come close. Sharp looked again at the distant dust cloud, but the horses had turned onto the smaller track that led to Villa Real de Tzedes, and head-on he couldn't see whether they escorted any vehicle. So he trained the glass on the howitzer's crew and saw they were ramming a new shell down the stubby barrel. Get under cover! Hagman alone stayed in the open. He was loading his rifle, first pouring powder from his horn into the barrel. Most of the time he would have used a cartridge which had powder and ball conveniently wrapped in waxed paper. But for this kind of shot, at 700 yards, he would use the high-quality powder carried in the horn. He used slightly more than was provided in a cartridge, and, when the barrel was charged, he laid the weapon aside and took out the handful of loose bullets that nestled among the tea leaves at the bottom of his cartridge pouch. The enemy shell went just wide of the watchtower and exploded harmlessly over the steep western slope, and though the noise buffeted the eardrums and the broken casing rattled angrily against the stones, Hagman did not even look up. He was using the middle finger of his right hand to roll the bullets one by one in the palm of his left hand, and when he was sure he had found the most perfectly shaped ball, he put the others away and picked up his rifle again. At the back of the stock there was a small cavity covered with a brass lid. The cavity had two compartments. The larger held the rifle's cleaning tools, while the smaller was filled with patches made of thin and flexible leather that had been smeared with lard. He took one of the patches, closed the brass lid, and saw Vicente was watching him closely. He grinned. Slow all business, sir, isn't it? Now he wrapped the bullet in the patch, so that when the rifle fired, the expanding bullet would force the leather into the barrel's lands. The leather also stopped any of the gases escaping past the bullet, and so concentrated the powder's force. He pushed the leather wrap ball into the barrel, then used the rammer to force it down. It was hard work, and he grimaced with the effort, then nodded his thanks as Sharp took over. Sharp put the butt end of the steel ramrod against a rock and eased the rifle slowly forward until he felt the bullet crunch against the powder. He took out the ramrod, slid it into the hoops under the barrel, and gave the gun back to Hagman, who used powder from his horn to prime the pan. He smoothed the priming with a blackened index finger, lowered the frizzen, and grinned again at Vicente. She's like a woman, sir, Hagman said, patting the rifle. Take care of her, and she'll take care of you. You'll notice he let Mr. Sharp do the ramming, sir, Harper said guilelessly. Vicente laughed, and Sharp suddenly remembered the horseman, and he snatched up the small telescope and trained it on the road leading into the village. But all that was left of the newcomers was the dust thrown up by their horses' hooves. They were hidden by the trees around the Kinta, and so he couldn't tell whether the horseman had brought a mortar. He swore. Well, he would learn soon enough. Hagman lay on his back, his feet towards the enemy, then pillowed the back of his neck against a rock. His ankles were crossed, and he was using the angle between his boots as a rest for the rifle's muzzle. And because the weapon was just under four feet long, he had to curl his torso awkwardly to bring the stock into his shoulder. He settled at last, the rifle's brass butt at his shoulder, and its barrel running the length of his body. And though the pose looked clumsy, it was favoured by Marksman because it held the rifle so rigidly. Wind, sir? Left to right, Dan, Sharp said. Very light. Very light, Hagman repeated softly. Then he pulled back the flint. The swan-necked cock made a slight creaking noise as it compressed the mainspring. Then there was a click as the pawl took the strain, and Hagman hinged the backside up as high as it would go, then lined its notch with the blade sight dovetailed at the muzzle. He had to lower his head awkwardly to see down the barrel. He took a breath, let it half out, and held it. The other men on the hilltop also held their breath.
Hagman made some tiny adjustments, edging the barrel to the left and drawing the stock down to give the weapon more elevation. It was not only an impossibly long shot, but he was firing downhill, which was notoriously difficult. No one moved. Sharp was watching the howitzer crew through the telescope. The gunner was just bringing the port fire to the breach, and Sharp knew he should interrupt Hagman's concentration and order his men to take cover. But just then, Hagman pulled his trigger. The crack of the rifle startled birds up from the hillside. Smoke wreathed about the rocks, and Sharp saw the gunner spin round and the port fire drop as the man clutched his right thigh. He staggered for a few seconds, then fell. Right thigh, Dan, Sharp said, knowing that Hagman couldn't see through the smoke of his rifle. And you put him down, under cover, all of you. Quick! Another gunner had snatched up the port fire. They scrambled behind rocks and flinched as the shell exploded on the face of a big boulder. Sharp slapped Hagman's back. Unbelievable, Dan! I was aiming for his chest, sir. You spoiled his day, Dan, Harper said. You spoiled his bloody day. The other riflemen were congratulating Hagman. They were proud of him, delighted that the old man was back on his feet and as good as ever. And the shot had somehow compensated for Williamson's treachery. They were an elite again. They were riflemen. Do it again, sir? Hagman asked Sharp. Why not? Sharp said. If a mortar did come, then its crew would be frightened if they discovered they were within range of the deadly rifles. Hagman began the laborious process all over again. But no sooner had he wrapped the next bullet in its leather patch than to Sharp's astonishment the howitzer's trail was lifted onto the limber and the gun was dragged away into the trees. For a moment Sharp was exultant. Then he feared that the French were simply taking away the howitzer so that the mortar could use the cleared patch of land. He waited with a heavy sense of dread, but no mortar appeared. No one appeared. Even the infantry who had been posted close to the howitzer had gone back into the trees. And for the first time since Sharp had retreated to the watchtower, the northern slope was deserted. Dragoons still patrolled to the east and west, but after a half hour they too rode north towards the village. What's happening? Vicente asked. Then suddenly... Sharp saw the whole French force, the gun, the cavalry and the infantry, and they were all marching away down the road from Villarreal de Cedes. They must be going back to a porto. And he gazed, dumbfounded, not daring to believe what he saw. It's a trick, Sharp said. Has to be. He gave the telescope to Vicente. Maybe it is peace, Vicente suggested, after he had stared at the retreating French. Maybe the fighting really is over. Why else would they go? They're going, sir, Harper said. That's all that matters. He had taken the glass from Vicente and could see a farm wagon loaded with the French wounded. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, he exulted. But they're going. But why? Was it peace? Had the horsemen whom Sharp had feared were escorting a mortar brought a message instead, an order to retreat? Or was it a trick? Were the French hoping he would go down to the village and so give the dragoons a chance to attack his men on level ground? He was as confused as ever. I'm going down, he said. Me, Cooper, Harris, Perkins, Cressica and Sims. He deliberately named the last two, because they'd been friends of Williamson. And if any men were likely to follow the deserter, it was those two. And he wanted to show them he still trusted them. The rest of you stay here. I would like to come. Vicente said, and when he saw Sharp was about to refuse, he explained. The village, senor. I want to see the village. I want to see what happened to our people. Vicente, like Sharp, took five men. Sergeant Harper and Sergeant Macedo were left in charge on the hilltop, and Sharp's patrol set off down the hill. They went past the great fan-shaped scorch mark, which showed where the howitzer had been fired, and Sharp half expected a volley to blast from the wood but no gun sounded, and then he was under the shade of the trees. He and Cooper led, going stealthily, watching for an ambush among the laurels, birch and oak, but they were undisturbed. They followed the path to the Kinter, which had its blue shutters closed against the sun and looked quite undamaged. A tabby cat washed itself on the sun-warmed cobbles beneath the stable arch, 
and paused to stare indignantly at the soldiers, then went back to its ablutions. Sharp tried the kitchen door, but it was locked. He thought of breaking it down, then decided to leave it, and led the men round to the front of the house instead. The front door was locked, the driveway deserted. He backed slowly away from the Kinter, watching the shutters, almost expecting them to be thrown open to loose a blast of musketry. But the big house slept on in the early afternoon warmth. I think it's empty, sir, Harris said, though he sounded nervous. I reckon you're right, Sharp agreed, and he turned and walked on down the drive. The gravel crunched under his boots, so he moved to the verge and signalled that his men should do the same. The day was hot and still, even the birds were silent. And then he smelt it. And immediately he thought of India, and even imagined for a wild second that he was back in that mysterious country, for it was there that he'd experienced this smell so often. It was thick and rank and somehow honey-sweet, a smell that almost made him want to vomit. Then that urge passed, but he saw that Perkins, almost as young as Pendleton, was looking sickly. Take a deep breath, Sharp told him. You're going to need it. Vicente, looking as nervous as Perkins, glanced at Sharp. Is it... he began. Yes, Sharp said. It was death. Villa Real de Tzedes had never been a large or a famous village. No pilgrims came to worship in its church. Saint Joseph might be revered locally, but his influence had never extended beyond the vineyards. Yet for all its insignificance, it had not been a bad village in which to raise children. There was always work in the savage vineyards. The soil was fertile, and even the poorest house had a vegetable patch. Some of the villagers had possessed cows, most kept hens, and a few reared pigs, though there was no livestock left now. There had been little authority to persecute the villagers. Father Josepha had been the most important person in Villa Real de Tzedes, other than the English in the Kinta, and the priest had sometimes been irascible, but he'd also taught the children their letters. He had never been unkind. And now he was dead. His body, unrecognizable, was in the ashes of the church, where other bodies, shrunken by heat, lay among the charred and fallen rafters. A dead dog was in the street, a trickle of dried blood extending from its mouth and a cloud of flies buzzing above the wound in its flank. More flies sounded inside the biggest of the two taverns, and Sharp pushed open the door with the butt of his rifle and gave an involuntary shudder. Maria, the girl Harper had liked, was spread naked on the only table left unbroken in the taproom. She had been pinned to the table by knives thrust through her hands, and now the flies crawled across her bloody belly and breasts. Every wine barrel had been splintered, every pot smashed, and every piece of furniture other than the single table torn apart. Sharp slung his rifle and tugged the knives from Maria's palms so that her white arms flapped as the blades came free. Perkins stared aghast from the door. Don't just stand there, Sharp snapped. Find a blanket, anything, and cover her. Yes, sir. Sharp went back to the street. Vicente had tears in his eyes. There were bodies in half a dozen houses, blood in every house, but no living folk. Any survivors of Villarreal de Tzedes had fled the village, chased out by the casual brutality of their conquerors. We should have stayed here, Vicente said angrily. And died with them, Sharp asked. They had no one to fight for them. Vicente said. They had Lopez, Sharp said, and he didn't know how to fight, and if he had, then he wouldn't have stayed, and if we'd fought for them, we'd be dead now, and these folk would be just as dead. We should have stayed, Vicente insisted. Sharp ignored him. Cooper, Sims? The two men cocked their rifles. Cooper shot first. Sharp counted to ten, and then Sims pulled his trigger. Sharp counted to ten again, and then he fired into the air. It was a signal that Harper could lead the others down from the hilltop. Look for spades, Sharp said to Vicente. Spades? We're going to bury them. The graveyard was a walled enclosure just north of the village, 
and there was a small hut with sexton shovels that Sharp gave to his men. Deep enough so the animals don't scratch him up, he ordered, but not too deep. Why not too deep? Vicente bridled, thinking that a shallow grave was a callous insult to the dead. Because when the villagers come back, Sharp said, they'll dig them up to find their relatives. He found a large piece of sacking in the shed, and he used it to collect the charred bodies from the church, dragging them one by one to the graveyard. The left arm came off Father Josepha's body when Sharp tried to pull the priest free of the charred cross. But Sim saw what was happening and came to help roll the shrunken, blackened corpse onto the sacking. I'll take it, sir, Sim said, seizing hold of the sacking. You don't have to. Sims looked embarrassed. We're not going to run, sir, he blurted out, then looked fearful as if he expected to get the rough edge of Sharp's tongue. Sharp looked at him and saw another thief, another drunk, another failure, another rifleman. Then Sharp smiled. Thank you, Sims. Tell Pat Harper to give you some of his holy water. Holy water? Sims asked. The brandy he keeps in his second canteen, the one he thinks I don't know about. Afterwards, when the men who had come down from the hilltop were helping to bury the dead, Sharp went back to the church where Harper found him. Pickett's a set, sir. Good. And Sims says I was to give him some brandy. I hope you did. I did, sir, I did. And Mr. Vicente, sir, he's wanting to say a prayer or two. I hope God's listening. You want to be there? No, Pat. Doesn't think you would. The big Irishman picked his way through the ashes. Some of the wreckage still smoked where the altar had stood. But he pushed a hand into the blackened tangle and pulled out a twisted black crucifix. It was only four inches high, and he laid it on his left palm and made the sign of the cross. Mr. Vicente's not happy, sir. I know. He thinks we should have defended the village. But I told him, sir, I told him you don't catch the rabbit by killing the dog. Sharp stared into the smoke. Maybe we should have stayed here. Now you're talking like an Irishman, sir, Harper said, because there's nothing we don't know about lost causes. Sure, and we'd all have died. And if you see that the trigger guard in Gattaca's rifle is hanging loose, then don't give him hell about it. The screws are worn to boggery. Sharp smiled at Harper's effort to divert him. I know we did the right thing, Pat. I just wish Lieutenant Vicente could see it. He's a lawyer, sir. Can't see a bloody thing straight. And he's young. It's all his cow for a drink of milk. We did the right thing, Sharp insisted. But what do we do now? Harper tried to straighten the crucifix. When I was a wee child, he said, I got lost. I was no more than seven, eight, maybe. No bigger than Perkins, anyway. There were soldiers near the village, your lot, in red. And to this day... I don't know what the bastards were doing there, but I ran away from them. They didn't chase me, but I ran all the same, because that's what you did when the red bastards showed themselves. I ran and I ran, I did, and I ran until I didn't know where the hell I was. So what did you do? I followed a stream, Harper said, and came to these two wee houses, and my auntie lived in one, and she took me home. Sharp started to laugh, and, though it wasn't really funny, could not stop. Mary, Harper said. Auntie Mary, rest her soul. He put the crucifix into a pocket. I wish your Auntie Mary was here, Pat. But we're not lost. No. We go south, find a boat, cross the river. Keep going south. And if the army's gone from Lisbon? Walk to Gibraltar, Sharp said, knowing it would never come to that. If there was peace... Then he'd be farmed by someone in authority and sent to the nearest port. And if there was war, then he would find someone to fight. Simple, really, he thought. But we march at night, Pat. So we're still at war, you think? Oh, we're at war, Pat, Sharp said, looking at the wreckage and thinking of Christopher. We are bloody well at war. Vicente was staring at the new graves. He nodded when Sharp said he proposed marching south during the night, but he didn't speak until they were outside the cemetery gates. I am going to Porto, he said. You believe there's been a peace treaty? No, Vicente said, then shrugged. Maybe, I don't know.
But I do know Colonel Christopher and Brigadier Vuya are probably there. I didn't fight them here, so I must pursue them there. So you'll go to Oporto, Sharp said. And die? Maybe, Vicente said grandly. But a man cannot hide from evil. No, Sharp said. But if you fight it, fight it clever. I'm learning how to fight, Vicente said. But I already know how to kill. That was a recipe for suicide, Sharp thought, but he didn't argue. What I'm planning, he said instead, is to go back the way we came. I can find the way easy enough, and once I'm at Barca de Vintas, I'll look for a boat. There has to be something that'll float. I'm sure there is. So come with me that far, Sharp suggested, because it's close to a porter. Vicente agreed, and his men fell in behind Sharp's when they left the village. And Sharp was glad of it, for the night was pitch black again, and despite his confidence that he could find the way, he would have become hopelessly lost if Vicente had not been there. As it was, they made painfully slow progress, and eventually rested in the darkest heart of the night, and made better time when the wolf light edged the eastern horizon. Sharp was in two minds about going back to Barca de Vintas. There was a risk, for the village was perilously close to a porto. But on the other hand, he knew it was a place where the river was safe to cross, and he reckoned he should be able to find some wreckage from the huts and houses that his men could fashion into a raft. Vicente agreed, saying that much of the rest of the Dura Valley was a rocky ravine, and that Sharp would face difficulty in either approaching the river or finding a crossing place. A larger risk was that the French would be guarding Barca de Vintas, but Sharp suspected they'd be content with having destroyed all the boats in the village. Dawn found them in some wooded hills. They stopped by a stream and made a breakfast of stale bread and smoked meat so tough that the men joked about re-soling their boots, then grumbled because Sharp would not let them light a fire and so make tea. Sharp carried a crust to the summit of a nearby hill and searched the landscape with a small telescope. He saw no enemy. Indeed, he saw no one at all. A deserted cottage lay further up the valley where the stream ran, and there was a church bell tower a mile or so to the south, but there were no people. Vicente joined him. You think there might be French here? I always think that, Sharp said. And do you think the British have gone home? Vicente asked. No. Why not? Sharp shrugged. If we wanted to go home, he said, we'd have gone after Sir John Moore's retreat. Vicente stared south. I know we could not have defended the village, he said. I wish we could have done. It's just that they are my people, Vicente shrugged. I know, Sharp said. And he tried to imagine the French army in the dales of Yorkshire or in the streets of London. He tried to imagine the cottages burning, the alehouses sacked and the women screaming. But he could not envisage that horror. It seemed oddly impossible. Harper could doubtless imagine his home being violated, could probably recall it, but Sharp could not. Why do they do it? Vicente asked with a genuine note of anguish. Sharp collapsed the telescope, then scuffed the earth with the toe of his right boot. On the day after they'd climbed to the watchtower, he'd dried the rain-soaked boots in front of the fire, but he'd left them too close and the leather had cracked. There are no rules in war, he said uncomfortably. There are rules, Vicente insisted. Sharp ignored the protest. Most soldiers aren't saints. They're drunks, thieves, rogues. They've failed at everything, so they join the army, or else they're forced to join by some bastard of a magistrate. Then they're given a weapon and told to kill. Back home they'd be hanged for it, but in the army they're praised for it. And if you don't hold them hard, then they think any killing is permitted. Those lads, he nodded down the hill to the men grouped under the cork oaks, know damn well they'll be punished if they step out of line. But if I let them off the leash, they'd run this country ragged, they'd make a mess of Spain, and they'd never stop till someone killed them. He paused, knowing he'd been unfair to his men. Mind you, I like them, he went on. They're not the worst, not really, just unlucky. And they're damn fine soldiers. I don't know. He frowned, embarrassed. But the frogs? They don't have any choice. 
It's called conscription. Some poor bastard is working as a, a, a baker or a wheelwright one day, and the next he's in uniform and being marched half a continent away. They resent it, and the French don't flog their soldiers, so there's no way of holding them. Do you flog? Not me. He thought about telling Vicente that he had been flogged once, long ago, on a hot parade ground in India, but then decided it would sound like boasting. I'm just taken behind a wall and beat them up, he said instead. It's quicker. Vicente smiled. I could not do that. You could always give them a writ instead, Sharp said. I'd rather be beaten up than get tangled by a lawyer. Maybe, he thought, if he'd beaten Williamson, the man might have settled to authority. Maybe not. So, how far is the river? he asked. Three hours? Not much longer. Bugger all happening here. We might as well keep going. But the French? Vicente suggested nervously. None here, none there. Sharp nodded to the south. No smoke, no birds coming out of trees like a cat was after them. And you can smell French dragoons a mile off. Their horses all have saddle sores. They stink like a cesspit. So they marched. The Jew was still on the grass. They went through a deserted village that looked undamaged, and Sharp suspected the villagers had seen them coming and hidden themselves. There were certainly people there, for some drying washing was draped over two laurel bushes. But though Sergeant Macedo bellowed that they were friends, no one dared to appear. One of the pieces of washing was a fine man's shirt with bone buttons, and Sharp saw Cressica dawdling so that he would have a moment on his own when the others were ahead. The penalty for theft, Sharp called to his men, is hanging, and there are good hanging trees here. Cressica pretended he had not heard, but hurried on all the same. They stopped when they reached the Douro. Barca de Vintos was still some way to the west, and Sharp knew his men were tired, and so they bivouacked in a wood high on a bluff above the river. No boats moved there. Far off to the south a single spire of smoke wavered in the sky, and to the west there was a shimmering haze that Sharp suspected was the smoke of Oporto's cooking fires. Vicente said Barca de Vintas was little more than an hour away, but Sharp decided they would wait till next morning before marching again. Half a dozen of the men were limping because their boots were rotting, and Gattaca, who'd been wounded in the thigh, was feeling the pain. One of Vicente's men was walking barefoot, and Sharp was thinking of doing the same because of the condition of his boots. But there was a still better reason for delay. If the French are there, he explained, then I'd rather sneak up on them in the dawn, and if they're not, we've got all day to make some sort of raft. What about us? Vicente asked. Do you still want to go to Oporto? That's where the regiment is from, Vicente said. It's home. The men are anxious. Some have families there. See us to Barca de Vintas, Sharp suggested, then go home. But go the last few miles slowly. Go carefully. You'll be all right. He did not believe that, but he couldn't say what he did believe. So they rested. Pickets watched from the wood's edge while the others slept, and some time after midday, when the heat made everyone drowsy, Sharp thought he heard thunder far away. But there were no rain clouds in sight, and that meant the thunder had to be gunfire. But he couldn't be sure. Harper was sleeping, and Sharp wondered if he was just hearing the echo of the big Irishman's snores. But then he thought he heard the thunder again, though it was so faint that he could just have imagined it. He nudged Harper. What is it? I'm trying to listen, Sharp said. And I ain't trying to sleep. Listen! But there was silence except for the murmur of the river and the rustle of leaves in the east wind. Sharp thought about taking a patrol to reconnoitre Barca de Vintas, but decided against it. He did not want to divide his already perilously small force, and whatever dangers lurked at the village could wait till morning. At nightfall he thought he heard the thunder again, but then the wind gusted and snatched the sound away. Dawn was silent, still and the gently misted river looked as polished as steel. Luis, who had attached himself to Vicente's men, had proved to be a good cobbler, and had sewn up some of the more decrepit boots. He'd volunteered to shave Sharp, who'd shaken his head. I'll have a shave when we're across the river, he said. I pray you don't grow a beard, Vicente said. 
and then they marched, following a track that meandered along the high ground. The track was rough, overgrown and deeply rutted, and the going was slow, but they saw no enemy. And then the land flattened, the track turned into a lane that ran beside vineyards, and Barca de Vintas, its white walls lit bright by the rising sun, was ahead. There were no French there. Two score of folk had moved back into the plundered houses, and they looked alarmed at the uniformed ruffians who came across the small bridge over the stream. But Vicente calmed them. There were no boats, the people said. The French had taken or burned them all. They rarely saw the French, they added. Sometimes a patrol of dragoons would clatter through the village, stare across the river, steal some food, and then go away. They had little other news. One woman, who sold olive oil, eggs, and smoked fish in a Porto's market, said that the French were all guarding the river bank between the city and the sea. But Sharp did not put much weight on her words. Her husband, a bent giant with gnarled hands, guardedly allowed that it might be possible to make a raft from some of the village's broken furniture. Sharp put pickets on the village's western margin, where Hagman had been wounded. He climbed a tree there, and was amazed that he could see some of Oporto's outlying buildings on the hilly horizon. The big, flat-roofed white building that he remembered passing when he first met Vicente was the most obvious, and he was appalled that they were so close. He was no more than three miles from the big white building, and surely the French would have their own pickets on that hill, and surely they would have a telescope up there to watch the city approaches but he was committed to crossing the river here. And so he clambered down and was just brushing off his jacket when a wild-haired young man in ragged clothes mooed at him. Sharp stared back, astonished. The man mooed again, then grinned inanely before giving a cackle of laughter. He had dirty red hair, bright blue eyes and a slack, dribbling mouth, and Sharp realised he was an idiot and probably harmless. Sharp remembered Ronnie, a village idiot in Yorkshire, whose parents would shackle him to the stump of an elm on the village green, where Ronnie would bellow at the grazing cows, talk to himself, and growl at the girls. This man was much the same, but he was also importunate, plucking at Sharp's elbow as he tried to drag the Englishman towards the river. "'Made yourself a friend, sir?' Tung asked, amused. "'He's being a bloody nuisance, sir,' Perkins said. "'He don't mean harm.' Tung said, just wants you to go for a swim, sir. Sharp pulled away from the idiot. What's your name? he asked, then realised there was probably little point in speaking English to a Portuguese lunatic, but the idiot was so pleased at being spoken to that he gibbered wildly, grinned and bounced up and down on his toes. Then he plucked at Sharp's elbow again. I'll call you Ronnie, Sharp said, and what do you want? His men were laughing now. But Sharp had intended to go to the river bank anyway, to see what kind of challenge his raft would face, and so he let Ronnie pull him along. The idiot made conversation all the way, but none of it made any sense. He took Sharp right to the river bank, and when Sharp tried to detach his surprisingly strong grip, Ronnie shook his head and tugged Sharp on through some poplars, down through thick bushes, and then at last he relinquished his grip on Sharp's arm and clapped his hands. You're not such an idiot after all, are you? Sharp said. In fact, you're a bloody genius, Ronnie. There was a boat. Sharp had seen the ferry burnt and sunk on his first visit to Barca de Vintas, but now realised there must have been two craft, and this was the second. It was a flat, wide and cumbersome vessel, the kind of boat that could carry a small flock of sheep or even a carriage and its horses and it had been weighted with stones and sunk in this wide, ditch-like creek that jutted under the trees to make a small backwater. Sharp wondered why the villagers had not shown it to him before, and guessed that they feared all soldiers, and so they had hidden their most valuable boat until peaceful times returned. The French had destroyed every other boat, and had never guessed that this second ferry still existed. "'You're a bloody genius!' Sharp told Ronnie again, and he gave him the last of his bread— which was the only gift he had. But he also had a boat. And then he had something else, for the thunder he had heard so distantly the previous day sounded again. Only this time it was close, and it was unmistakable, and it was not thunder at all, and Christopher had lied, and there was no peace in Portugal. It was cannon fire. Chapter 8 
The sound of the firing was coming from the west, channeled up the steep-sided river valley, and Sharp couldn't tell whether the battle was being fought on the northern or southern bank of the Douro. Nor could he even tell whether it was a battle. Perhaps the French had established batteries to protect the city against an attack from the sea, and those batteries might just be firing at inquisitive frigates. Or maybe the guns were merely practice firing. But one thing was certain. He would never know what the guns were doing unless he got closer. He ran back to the village, followed by the shambling Ronnie, who was bellowing his inarticulate achievement to the world. Sharp found Vicente. The ferry's still here, Sharp said. He showed me, he pointed to Ronnie. But the guns, Vicente was bemused. We're going to find out what they're doing, Sharp said. But ask the villagers to raise the ferry. We might yet need it. But we'll go towards the city. All of us? Vicente asked. All of us. But tell them I want that boat floating by mid-morning. Ronnie's mother, a shrunken and bent woman, swathed in black, retrieved her son from Sharp's side and berated him in a shrill voice. Sharp gave her the last chunk of cheese from Harper's pack, explained that Ronnie was a hero, then led his motley group westwards along the river bank. There was plenty of cover. Orchards, olive groves, cattle sheds and small vineyards were crowded on the narrow piece of level land beside the Douro's northern bank. The cannons, hidden by the loom of the great hill on which the flat-roofed building stood, were sporadic. Their firing would swell to a battle intensity, then fade away. For minutes at a time there would be no shots, or just a single gun would fire and the sound of it would echo off the southern hills, rebound from the northern, and bounce its way down the valley. Perhaps, Vicente suggested, pointing up to the great white building, we should go to the seminary. Frogs will be there, Sharp said. He was crouching beside a hedge, and for some reason kept his voice very low. It seemed extraordinary that there were no French pickets, not one. But he was certain the French must have put men into the big building that dominated the river east of the city as effectively as a castle. What did you say it was? A seminary. Vicente saw Sharp was puzzled. A place where priests are trained. I thought of becoming a priest once. Good God, Sharp said, surprised. You wanted to be a priest? I thought of it, Vicente said defensively. Do you not like priests? Not much. Then I'm glad I became a lawyer, Vicente said with a smile. You're no lawyer, Jogi, Sharp said. You're a bloody soldier like the rest of us. He offered that compliment and then turned as the last of his men came across the small meadow to crouch behind the hedge. If the French did have men in the seminary, he thought, then either they were fast asleep, or, more likely, they'd seen the blue and green uniforms and confused them with their own jackets. Did they think the Portuguese blue were French coats? The Portuguese blue was darker than the French infantry coats, and the rifle green was much darker than the dragoons' coats. But at a distance the uniforms might be confused. Or was there no one in the building? Sharp took out the small telescope and stared for a long time. The seminary was huge, a great white block four stories high, and there had to be at least ninety windows in the south wall alone but he could see no movement in any of them, nor was anyone on the flat roof which had a red tile coping and surely provided the best lookout post east of the city. Shall we go there? Vicente prompted Sharp. Maybe, Sharp responded cautiously. He was tempted, because the building would offer a marvellous view of the city, but he still couldn't believe the French would leave the seminary empty. We'll go further along the bank first, though. He led with his riflemen. Their green jackets blended better with the leaves, offering them a small advantage if there was a French picket ahead, but they saw no one. Nor did Sharp see any activity on the southern bank. Yet the guns were still firing, and now, over the loom of the seminary hill, he could see a dirty white cloud of gun smoke being pumped into the river valley. There were more buildings now, many of them small houses built close to the river and their gardens were a maze of fences, vines, and olive trees that hid Sharp's men as they went on westwards. Above Sharp, to his right, the seminary was a great threat in the sky, its serried windows blank and black, and Sharp could not rid himself of the fear that a horde of French soldiers were hidden behind that sun-glossed cliff of stone and glass. Yet every time he looked, he saw no movement. 
Then, suddenly, there was a single French soldier just ahead. Sharp had turned a corner, and there the man was. He was in the middle of a cobbled slipway that led from a boat builder's shed to the river, and he was crouching to play with a puppy. Sharp desperately beckoned for his men to stop. The enemy was an infantryman, and he was only seven or eight paces away, utterly oblivious, his back to Sharp and his shako and musket on the cobblestones, letting the puppy playfully nip his right hand. And if there was one French soldier, there had to be more. Had to be. Sharp stared past the man to where a stand of poplars and thick bushes edged the slipway's far side. Was there a patrol there? He could see no sign of one, nor any activity among the boatyard's tumble-down sheds. Then the Frenchman either heard the scuff of a boot, or else sensed he was being watched. For he stood and turned, then realised his musket was still on the ground, and he stooped for it, then froze when Sharp's rifle pointed at his face. Sharp shook his head, then jerked the rifle to indicate that the Frenchman should stand up straight. The man obeyed. He was a youngster, scarce older than Pendleton or Perkins, with a round, guileless face. He looked scared and took an involuntary step back as Sharp came fast towards him. Then he whimpered as Sharp tugged him by the jacket back around the corner. Sharp pushed him to the ground, took his bayonet from its scabbard and threw it into the river. Tie him up, he ordered Tongue. Slit his throat, Tongue suggested. It's easier. Tie him up, Sharp insisted. Gag him and make a good job of it. He beckoned Vicente forward. He's the only one I've seen. There must be more, Vicente declared. God knows where they are. Sharp went back to the corner, peered around, and saw nothing except the puppy, which was now trying to drag the Frenchman's musket across the cobbles by its sling. He gestured for Harper to join him. I can't see anyone, Sharp whispered. He can't have been alone, Harper said. Yet still no one moved. I want to get into those trees, Pat, Sharp hissed nodding across the slipway. One like shit, sir, Harper said. And the two of them sprinted across the open space and threw themselves into the trees. No musket fled. No one shouted. But the puppy, thinking it was a game, followed them. Go back to your mother! Harper hissed at the dog, which just barked at him. Jesus! Sharp said, not because of the noise the dog was making, but because he could see boats. The French were supposed to have destroyed or taken every vessel along the Douro. But in front of him, stranded by the falling tide on the muddy outer bank of a great bend in the river, were three huge wine barges. Three! He wondered if they had been holed, and while Harper kept the puppy quiet, he waded through the sticky mud and hauled himself aboard the nearest barge. He was hidden from anyone on the north bank by thick trees, which was perhaps why the French had somehow missed the three vessels. And, better still, the barge Sharp had boarded seemed quite undamaged. There was a good deal of water in its bilge, but when Sharp tasted it he found it was fresh. So it was rainwater, not the salty tide water that swept twice daily up the Douro. Sharp splashed through the flooded bilge and found no gaping rents torn by axes. Then he heaved himself up onto a side deck where six great sweeps were lashed together with fraying lengths of rope. There was even a small skiff, stored upside down at the stern, with a pair of ancient oars, cracked and bleached, lodged halfway beneath its hull. Sir! Harper hissed from the bank. Sir! He was pointing across the river, and Sharp looked over the water and saw a red coat. A single horseman, evidently British, stared back at him. The man had a cocked hat, so was an officer, but when Sharp waved... He did not return the gesture. Sharp guessed the man was confused by his green coat. Get everyone here, now! Sharp ordered Harper, then looked back to the horseman. For a second or two he wondered if it was Colonel Christopher, but this man was heavier, and his horse, like most British horses, had a docked tail, while Christopher, aping the French, had left his horse's tail uncut. The man, who was sitting his horse beneath a tree, turned and looked as if he was speaking to someone, though Sharp could see no one else on the opposite bank. Then the man looked back to Sharp and gestured vigorously towards the three boats. Sharp hesitated. It was a safe bet that the man was senior to him, and if he crossed the river he would find himself back in the iron discipline of the army and no longer free to act as he wished. If he sent any of his men, it would be the same. But then he thought of Louis. Louis. 
and he summoned the barber, helping him up over the barge's heavy gunwale. Can you manage a small boat? he asked. Lewis looked momentarily alarmed, then nodded firmly. I can, yes. Then go over the river and find out what that British officer wants. Tell him I'm reconnoitering the seminary, and tell him there's another boat at Barca de Vintas. Sharp was making a swift guess that the British had advanced north and had been stopped by the Douro. He assumed the cannonade was from the guns firing at each other across the river. But without boats, the British would be helpless. Where the hell was the bloody navy? Harper, Macedo and Lewis manhandled the skiff over the gunwale and down the glutinous mud into the river. The tide was rising, but it still had some way to go before it reached the barges. Lewis took the oars, settled himself on the thwart, and, with admirable skill, pulled away from the bank. He looked over his shoulder to judge his direction, then sculled vigorously. Sharp saw another horseman appear behind the first, the second man also in red coat and black cocked hat, and he felt the bindings of the army reaching out to snare him. So he jumped off the barge and waded through the mud to the bank. You stay here, he ordered Vicenti. I'll look up the hill. For a moment, Vicenti seemed ready to argue. Then he accepted the arrangement, and Sharp beckoned his rifleman to follow him. As they disappeared into the trees, Sharp looked back to see Lewis was almost at the other bank. Then Sharp pushed through a strand of laurel and saw the road in front of him. This was the road by which he had escaped from Oporto, and to his left he could see the houses where Vicenti had saved his bacon. He could see no French. He stared again at the seminary, but nothing moved there. To hell with it, he thought. Just go! He led his men in skirmish order up the hill, which offered little cover. A few straggly trees broke the pasture, and a dilapidated shed stood halfway up. But otherwise, it was a death trap if there were any Frenchmen in the big building. Sharp knew he should have exercised more caution. But no one fired from the windows, no one challenged him and he quickened his pace so that he felt the pain in his leg muscles because the slope was so steep. Then, suddenly, he had arrived safe at the base of the seminary. The ground floor had small barred windows and seven arched doors. Sharp tried a door and found it locked, and so solid that when he kicked it he only succeeded in hurting himself. He crouched and waited for the laggards among his men to catch up. He could see westwards across the valley that lay between the seminary and the city, and he could see where the French guns at the top of Oporto's hill were shooting across the river, but their target was hidden by a hill on the southern bank. A huge convent stood on the obscuring hill, the same convent, Sharp remembered, where the Portuguese guns had duelled with the French on the day the city fell. All here, Harper told him. Sharp followed the seminary wall, which was made of massive blocks of stone. He went westwards towards the city. He would have preferred to go the other way, but he sensed the building's main entrance would face a porto. Every door he passed was locked. Why the hell were there no French here? He could see none, not even at the city's edge a half mile away. And then the wall turned to his right, and he saw a flight of steps climbing to an ornamental door. No sentries guarded the entrance, though he could at last see Frenchmen now. There was a convoy of wagons on a road that ran in the valley which lay to the north of the seminary. The wagons, which were drawn by oxen, were being escorted by dragoons, and Sharp used Christopher's small telescope to see that the vehicles were filled with wounded men. So was Soult sending his invalids back to France, or just emptying his hospitals before fighting another battle? And he was surely not now thinking of marching on to Lisbon, for the British had come north to the Douro, and that made Sharp think that Sir Arthur Wellesley must have arrived in Portugal to galvanise the British forces. The seminary entrance was framed by an ornate façade rising to a stone cross that had been chipped by musket fire. The main door, approached by stairs, was wooden, studded with nails, and, when Sharp twisted the great wrought-iron handle, surprised him by being unlocked. He pushed the door wide open with the muzzle of his rifle to see an empty tiled hallway with walls painted a sickly green. The portrait of a half-starved saint hung askew on one wall, the saint's body riddled with bullet punctures. A crude painting of a woman and a French soldier had been daubed next to the saint, and proved that the French had been in the seminary, though there were none evident now. 
Sharp went inside, his boots echoing from the walls. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Harper said, making the sign of the cross. I've never seen such a huge building. He gazed in awe down the shadowed corridor. How many bloody priests does a country need? Depends how many sinners there are, Sharp said. And now we search the place. He left six men in the entrance hall to serve as a picket, then went downstairs to unbolt one of the arched doors facing the river. That door would be his bolt hole if the French came to the seminary, and once that retreat was secure, he searched the dormitories, bathrooms, kitchens, refectory and lecture rooms of a vast building. Broken furniture littered every room, and in the library a thousand books lay strewn and torn across the hardwood floor. But there were no people. The chapel had been violated, the altar chopped for firewood, and the choir used as a lavatory. Bastards, Harper said softly. Gattaca, his trigger guard dangling by one last screw, gaped at an amateur painting of two women curiously joined to three French dragoons that had been daubed on the whitewashed wall where once a great triptych of the Holy Birth had surmounted the altar. Good, that, he said in a tone as respectful as he might have used at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition. I like my women a bit plumper, Slattery said. Come on, Sharp snarled. His most urgent task now was to find the seminary's store of wine. He was certain there would be one. But when at last he discovered the cellar, he saw with relief that the French had already been there, and nothing remained but broken bottles and empty barrels. Real bastards, Harper said feelingly. But Sharp would have destroyed the bottles and barrels himself to prevent his men from drinking themselves insensible. And that thought made him realize that he had already unconsciously decided that he would stay in this big building as long as he could. The French doubtless wanted to hold a porto, but whoever held the seminary dominated the city's eastern flank. The long facade with its myriad windows facing the river was deceptive, for the building was very narrow. Scarce a dozen windows looked straight towards a porto, though at the rear of the seminary, furthest from the city, a long wing jutted north. In the angle of the two wings was a garden where a score of apple trees had been cut down for firewood. The two sides of the garden, not cradled by the building, were protected by a high stone wall, pierced by a pair of fine iron gates that opened towards a porter. In a shed, hidden beneath a pile of netting that had once been used to keep birds from the fruit bushes, Sharp found an old pickaxe that he gave to Cooper. Stop making loopholes, he said, pointing to the long wall. Patrick, find some more tools, detail six men to help Coops, and the rest of the men are to go to the roof, but they're not to show themselves, understand? They're to stay hidden. Sharp himself went to a large room that he suspected had been the office of the seminary's master. It was shelved like a library, and it had been plundered like the rest of the building. Torn and broken spine books lay thick on the floorboards, a large table had been thrown against one wall, and a slashed oil painting of a saintly-looking cleric was half-burnt in the big hearth. The only undamaged object was a crucifix, black as soot, that hung high on the wall above the mantel. Sharp threw open the window that was immediately above the seminary's main door, and used the little telescope to search the city that lay so tantalizingly close across the valley. Then, disobeying his own instructions that everyone was to stay hidden, he leant across the sill in an attempt to see what was happening on the river's southern bank, but he could see nothing meaningful. And then, while he was still craning his neck, a stranger's voice boomed behind him. You must be Lieutenant Sharp. Name's Waters, Lieutenant Colonel Waters. And well done, Sharp, bloody well done. Sharp pulled back and turned to see a red-coated officer stepping through the mess of books and papers. I'm sharp, sir, he acknowledged. Bloody frogs are dozing, Waters said. He was a stocky man, bow-legged from too much horse-riding, with a weather-beaten face. Sharp guessed he was in his low forties, but looked older because his grizzled hair was grey. They should have had a battalion and a half up here, shouldn't they? That and a couple of gun batteries. Our enemies are dozing, Sharp, bloody dozing. You were the man I saw across the river? Sharp asked. The very same. Your Portuguese fellow came across. Smart man. So he rowed me back, and now we're floating those damn barges. Waters grinned. It's heave ho, me hearties, and if we can get the damn things afloat, then we'll have the buffs over first, then the rest of the first brigade. <laughs>
Should be interesting when Marshal Salt realises we've sneaked in his back door, eh? Is there any liquor in the building? All gone, sir. Good man, Waters said, mistakenly deducing that Sharp himself must have removed the temptation before the arrival of the redcoats. Then he stepped to the window, took a big telescope from a leather satchel hanging from his shoulder, and stared at a porto. So what's happening, sir? Sharp asked. Happening? We're running the frogs out of Portugal. Hop, hop, croak, croak, and good bloody riddance to the spavined bastards. Look at it. Waters gestured at the city. They don't have the first blind idea that we're here. Your Portuguese fellow said you've been cut off, is that true? Since the end of March. Ye gods, Waters said. You must be out of touch. The colonel pulled back from the window and perched on the sill where he told Sharp that Sir Arthur Wellesley had indeed arrived in Portugal. He came less than three weeks ago, Waters said, and he's put some snap into the troops. By God he has. Craddock was a decent enough fellow, but he had no snap, none. So we're on the march, Sharp. Left, right, left, right, and the devil take the highmost. British army over there. He pointed through the window, indicating the hidden ground beyond the high convent on the southern bank. Bloody frogs seem to think we'll come by sea, so all their men are either in the city or guarding the river between the city and the sea. Sharp felt a twinge of guilt for not believing the woman in Barca de Vintas, who told him exactly that. Sir Arthur wants to get across, Waters went on, and your fellows have conveniently provided those three barges, and you say there's a fourth. Three miles up river, sir. You ain't done a bad morning's work, Sharp, Waters said with a friendly grin. We only have to pray for one thing. That the French don't discover us here? Exactly. So, best remove my red coat from the window, eh? Waters laughed and crossed the room. Pray they go on sleeping with their sweet froggy dreams, because once they do wake up, then the day's going to be damned hot, don't you think? And those three barges can take how many men apiece? Thirty? And God alone knows how long each crossing will take. We could be shoving our damned heads into the tiger's mouth sharp. Sharp forbore to comment that he'd spent the last few weeks with his head inside the tiger's mouth. Instead, he stared across the valley, trying to imagine how the French would approach when they did attack. He guessed they would come straight from the city, across the valley and up the slope that was virtually bare of any cover. The northern flank of the seminary looked towards the road in the valley, and that slope was just as bare, all except for one solitary tree with pale leaves that grew right in the middle of the climb. Anyone attacking the seminary would presumably try to get to the garden gate, or the big front door, and that would mean crossing a wide paved terrace where carriages bringing visitors to the seminary could turn around, and where attacking infantry would be cut down by musket and rifle fire from the seminary's windows and its balustraded roof. A death trap! Colonel Waters was sharing the view and evidently thinking the same thoughts. I wouldn't want to be attacking up that slope, Sharp agreed. And I've no doubt we'll put some cannon on the other bank to make it all a bit less healthy, Waters said cheerfully. Sharp hoped that was true. He kept wondering why there were no British guns on the wide terrace of the convent that overlooked the river, the terrace where the Portuguese had placed their batteries in March. It seemed an obvious position, but Sir Arthur Wellesley appeared to have chosen to put his artillery down among the port lodges, which were out of sight of the seminary. What's the time? Waters asked, then answered his own question by taking out a turnip watch. Nearly eleven. Are you with the staff, sir? Sharp asked, because Waters' red coat, though decorated with some tarnished gold braid, had no regimental facings. I am one of Sir Arthur's exploring officers, Waters said cheerfully. We ride ahead to scout the land like those fellows in the Bible that Joshua sent ahead to spy out Jericho. Remember the tale? and a frau called Rahab gave them shelter. That's the luck of the Jews, ain't it? The chosen people get greeted by a prostitute, and I get welcomed by a rifleman. But I suppose it's better than a sloppy wet kiss from a bloody frog dragoon, eh? Sharp smiled. Do you know Captain Hogan, sir? The mapping fellow. Of course I know Hogan. A capital man. Capital! Water suddenly stopped and looked at Sharp. My God! Of course! You're his lost rifleman, ain't you? Ah, I've placed you now. He said you'd survive. Well done, Sharp. Ah, here comes the first of the gallant buffs. Vicente and his men had escorted thirty redcoats up the hill, 
but instead of using the unlocked arch door, they'd trudged round to the front and now gaped up at Waters and Sharp, who in turn looked down from the window. The newcomers wore the buff facings of the 3rd Regiment of Foot, a Kentish regiment, and they were sweating after their climb under the hot sun. A thin lieutenant led them, and he assured Colonel Waters that two more barge loads of men were already disembarking. Then he looked curiously at Sharp. What on earth are the rifles doing here? First on the field, Sharp quoted the regiment's favourite boast, and last off it. First? Well, you must have flown across the bloody river. The lieutenant wiped his forehead. Any water here? Barrel inside the main door, Sharp said, courtesy of the 95th. More men arrived. The barges were toiling to and fro across the river, propelled by the massive sweeps which were manned by local people who were eager to help. And every twenty minutes another eighty or ninety men would toil up the hill. One group arrived with a general, Sir Edward Paget, who took over command of the growing garrison from Waters. Paget was a young man, still in his thirties, energetic and eager, who owed his high rank to his aristocratic family's wealth but he had the reputation of being a general who was popular with his soldiers. He climbed to the seminary roof where Sharp's men were now positioned, and, seeing Sharp's small telescope, asked to borrow it. Lost me own, he explained. It's somewhere in the baggage in Lisbon. You came with Sir Arthur, sir? Sharp asked. Three weeks ago, Patchett said, staring at the city. Sir Edward, Waters told Sharp, is second in command to Sir Arthur. Which doesn't mean much. Sir Edward said, because he never tells me anything. What's wrong with this bloody telescope? You have to hold the outer lens in place, sir, Sharp said. Take mine, Waters said, offering the better instrument. Sir Edward scanned the city, then frowned. So what are the bloody French doing? He asked in a puzzled tone. Sleeping, Waters answered. Won't like it when they wake up, will they? Paget remarked. Asleep in the keeper's lodge with poachers all over the coverts. He gave the telescope back to Waters and nodded at Sharp. Damn pleased to have some riflemen here, Lieutenant. I dare say you'll get some target practice before the day's out. Another group of men came up the hill. Every window of the seminary's brief western façade now had a group of redcoats, and a quarter of the windows on the long northern wall were also manned. The garden wall had been loopholed and garrisoned by Vicente's Portuguese and by the Buff's Grenadier Company. The French, thinking themselves secure in a porto, were watching the river between the city and the sea, while behind their backs, on the high eastern hill, the redcoats were gathering, which meant the gods of war were tightening the screws, and something had to break. Two officers were posted in the entrance hall of the Palacio das Carancas to make sure all visitors took their boots off. His Grace, they explained, referring to Marshal Nicolas Soult, Duke of Dalmatia, whose nickname was now King Nicolas, is sleeping. The hallway was cavernous, arched, high, beautiful, and hard-heeled boots striding over its tiled floor echoed up the staircase to where King Nicolas slept. Early that morning, an hussar had come in hurriedly. His spurs had caught in the rug at the foot of the stairs, and he had sprawled with a terrible clatter of sabre and scabbard that had woken the marshal who had then posted the officers to make certain the rest of his sleep was not disturbed. The two officers were powerless to stop the British artillery firing from across the river, but perhaps the marshal was not so sensitive to gunfire as he was to loud heels. The marshal had invited a dozen guests to breakfast, and all had arrived before nine in the morning, and were forced to wait in one of the great reception rooms on the palace's western side, where tall glass doors opened onto a terrace decorated with flowers planted in carved stone urns and with laurel bushes that an elderly gardener was trimming with long shears. The guests, all but one of them men, and all but two of them French, continually strolled onto the terrace, which offered from its southern balustrade a view across the river, and thus a sight of the guns that fired over the Douro. In truth, there wasn't much to see because the British cannon were emplaced in Villa Nova de Gaia's streets, and so, even with the help of telescopes, the guests merely saw gouts of dirty smoke, and then heard the crash of the round shots striking the buildings that faced the Porto's quay. The only other sight worth seeing was the remains of the pontoon bridge, which the French had repaired at the beginning of April, but had now blown up because of Sir Arthur Wellesley's approach. Three scorched pontoons still swung to their anchors,
The rest, along with the roadway, had been blasted to smithereens and carried by the tide to the nearby ocean. Kate was the only woman invited to the marshal's breakfast, and her husband had been adamant that she wear her hussar uniform, and his insistence was rewarded by the admiring glances that the other guests gave to his wife's long legs. Christopher himself was in civilian clothes, while the other ten men, all officers, were in their uniforms, and, because a woman was present, they did their best to appear insouciant about the British cannonade. "'What they are doing,' a dragoon major resplendent in aiguillette and gold braid remarked, is shooting at our sentries with six-pound shots. They are swatting at flies with a bludgeon. He lit a cigar, breathed deep, and gave Kate a long, appreciative look. With a bum like that, he said to his friend, she should be French. She should be on her back. That too, of course. Kate kept herself turned away from the French officers. She was ashamed of the hussar uniform, which she thought immodest, and worse appeared to suggest her sympathies were with the French. You might make an effort, Christopher told her. I am making an effort, she answered bitterly, an effort not to cheer every British shot. You're being ridiculous. I am? Kate bridled. This is merely a demonstration, Christopher explained, waving towards the powder smoke that drifted like patchy fog through the red tile roofs of Villanova. Wellesley has marched his men up here, and he can't go any further. He's stuck. There are no boats, and the Navy isn't foolish enough to try and sail past the river forts. So Wellesley will hammer a few cannonballs into the city, then turn round and march back to Quimbra or Lisbon. In chess terms, my dear, this is a stalemate. Soult can't march south, because his reinforcements haven't arrived, and Wellesley can't come further north, because he doesn't have the boats. And if the military can't force a decision here, then the diplomats will have to settle matters, which is why I am here, as I keep trying to tell you. You're here, Kate said, because your sympathies are with the French. That is an exceptionally offensive remark, Christopher said haughtily. I am here because sane men must do whatever they can to prevent this war continuing. And to do that, we must talk with the enemy, and I cannot talk with them if I am on the wrong side of the river. Kate did not answer. She no longer believed her husband's complicated explanations of why he was friendly with the French, or his high talk of the new ideas controlling Europe's destiny. She clung instead to the simpler idea of being a patriot, and all she wanted now was to cross the river and join the men on the far side. But there were no boats, no bridge left, and no way to escape. She began to weep, and Christopher, disgusted at her display of misery, turned away. He worked at his teeth with an ivory pick, and marvelled that a woman so beautiful could be so prey to vapours. Kate cuffed at her tears, then walked to where the gardener was slowly clipping the laurels. How do I get across the river? she asked in Portuguese. The man did not look at her, just clipped away. You can't. I must. They shoot you if you try. He looked at her, taking in the tight-fitting hussar uniform, then turned away. They shoot you anyway. A clock in the palace's hallway struck eleven as Marshal Soult descended the great staircase. He wore a silk robe over his breeches and shirt. Is breakfast ready? he demanded. In the blue reception room, sir, an aide answered. And your guests are here. Good. Good. He waited as the doors were thrown open for him, then greeted the visitors with a broad smile. Take your seat, stool. Ah, I see we are being informal. This last remark was because the breakfast was laid in silver chafing dishes on a long sideboard, and the marshal went along the row lifting lids. Ham, splendid. Braised kidneys, excellent. Beef, some tongue, good, good. And liver. That does look tasty. Good morning, Colonel. This greeting was to Christopher, who replied by giving the marshal a bow. How good of you to come, Soult went on. And did you bring your pretty wife? Ah, I see her. Good, good. You shall sit there, Colonel. He pointed to a chair next to the one he would occupy. Soult liked the Englishman, who had betrayed the plotters who would have mutinied if Soult had declared himself king. The marshal still harboured that ambition, 
but he acknowledged that he would need to beat back the British and Portuguese army that had dared to advance from Quimbra before he assumed the crown and scepter. Soult had been surprised by Sir Arthur Wellesley's advance, but not alarmed. The river was guarded, and the marshal had been assured there were no boats on the opposite bank. And so, as far as King Nicolas was concerned, the British could sit on the Douro's southern bank and twiddle their thumbs forever. The tall windows rattled in sympathy with the pounding guns, and the sound made the marshal turn from the chafing dishes. Our gunners are a bit lively this morning, are they not? They're mostly British guns, sir, an aide answered. Doing what? Firing at our sentries on the quay, the aide said. They're swathing at flies with six-pound balls. Soult laughed. So much for the vaunted Wellesley, eh? He smiled at Kate and gestured that she should take the place of honour at his right. So good to have a pretty woman for company at breakfast. Better to have one before breakfast, an infantry colonel remarked, and Kate, who spoke more French than any of the men knew, blushed. Soult heaped his plate with liver and bacon, then took his seat. They're sweating sentries, he said. So what are we doing? Uh, Counter-battery fire, sir. The aide answered. You don't have any kidneys, sir. Can I bring you some? Oh, do, Caillou, I like kidneys. Any news from the Castello? The Castello de Sao was on the Douro's north bank, where the river met the sea, and was heavily garrisoned to fight off a British seaborne assault. They report two frigates just out of range, sir, but no other craft in sight. He dithers, doesn't he? Soult said with satisfaction. This Wellesley is a dither. Help yourself to the coffee, Colonel, he told Christopher. And if you would be so kind, a cup for me as well. Thank you. Soult took a bread roll and some butter. I talked with Ria last night, the Marshal said, and he's making excuses, hundreds of excuses. Another day, sir, Christopher said, and we would have captured the hill. Kate... Her eyes red, looked down at her empty plate. No, her husband had said. We. Another day, Soult responded scornfully. He should have taken it in a short minute to the very first day he arrived. Soult had recalled Vuillard and his men from Villarreal de Cedes the instant he heard that the British and Portuguese were advancing from Coimbra. But he'd been annoyed that so many men had failed to dislodge so small a force. Not that it mattered. What mattered now was that Wellesley had to be taught a lesson. Soult did not think that should prove too difficult. He knew Wellesley had a small army and was weak in artillery. He knew that because Captain Argentan had been arrested five days before and was now spinning all he knew and all he'd observed on his second visit to the British. Argentan had even met with Wellesley himself, and the Frenchman had seen the preparations being made for the Allied advance and the warning given to Soult by Argentan had enabled the French regiments south of the river to skip backwards out of the way of a force sent to hook about their rear. So now Wellesley was stuck on the wrong side of the Douro, without any boats to make a crossing except for any craft brought by the British Navy, and that, it seemed, was no danger at all. Two frigates dithering offshore. That was hard again to make the Duke of Dalmatia quake in his boots. Argentan, who had been promised his life in exchange for information, had been captured thanks to Christopher's revelation. And that put Soult in the Englishman's debt. Christopher had also revealed the names of the other men in the plot. Don Adieu of the 47th, the brothers Lafitte of the 18th Dragoons, as well as three or four other experienced officers. And Soult had decided to take no action against them. The arrest of Argentan would be a warning to them. And they were all popular officers, and it didn't seem sensible to stir up resentment in the army by a succession of firing squads, he would let the officers know that he knew who they were, then hint that their lives depended on their future conduct. Better to have such men in his pocket than in their graves. Cape was crying. She made no noise. The tears just rolled down her cheeks, and she brushed them away in an attempt to hide her feelings. But Soult had noticed... What is the matter? he asked gently. She fears, sir, Christopher said. She fears? Soult asked. Christopher gestured towards the window which still rattled from the pummeling of the cannons. 
Women and battle, sir, don't mix. Only between the sheets, Soot said genially. Tell her, he went on, that she has nothing to fear. The British cannot cross the river, and if they try they will be repulsed. In a few weeks we shall be reinforced. He paused so that the translation could be made, and hoped he was right in saying that reinforcements would come soon, or else he didn't know how he was to continue his invasion of Portugal. Then we shall march south to taste the joys of Lisbon. Tell her we shall have peace by August. Ah, the cook! A plump Frenchman with extravagant moustaches had come into the room. He wore a blood-streaked apron with a wicked-looking carving knife thrust into its belt. You sent for me. He sounded grudging. Sir. Ah! Salt pushed back his chair and rubbed his hands. We must plan the supper, Sergeant Durand. Supper. I intend to sit sixteen. So, what do you suggest? I have eels. Eels? Salt responded happily. Stuffed with buttered whiting and mushrooms. Excellent. I shall fill it them. Sergeant Durand said doggedly. Fry them with parsley and serve the fillets with a red wine sauce. Then, for an entree, I have lamb, a very good lamb. Good. I do like lamb, Soult said. You can make a caper sauce. A caper sauce? Durand looked disgusted. The vinegar will drown the lamb, he said indignantly. And it's good lamb, tender and fat. A very delicate Caper sauce, perhaps, Soult suggested. The guns rose to a sudden fury, shaking the windows and rattling the crystal pear drops of the two chandeliers above the long table. But both the marshal and the cook ignored the sound. What I will do, Durand said, in a voice which suggested that there could be no discussion, is bake the lamb with some goose fat. Good, good. Soult said, and garnish it with onions, ham, and a few sep. A harassed-looking officer, sweating and red-faced from the day's heat, came into the room. Sir! A moment, Soult said, frowning, then looked back to Durand. Onions, ham, and some sep, he repeated. And perhaps we might add some lardon, sergeant. Lardon goes so well with lamb. I shall garnish it with a little chopped ham, Durand said stoically, some small onions and a few sep. Soult surrendered. I know it will taste superb, quite superb, and Durand, thank you for this breakfast, thank you. It would have been better eaten when it was cooked, Durand said, then sniffed and went from the room. Soult beamed at the cook's retreating back, then scowled at the newcomer who'd interrupted him. You're Captain Brossard, are you not? You wish some breakfast? The marshal indicated with a butter knife that Brossard should take the seat at the end of the table. How's General Foy? Brossard was an aide to Foy, and he had no time for breakfast, nor indeed to offer a report on General Foy's health. He had brought news, and for a second he was too full of it to speak properly, but then he controlled himself and pointed eastwards. The British, sir, they're in the seminary. Soult stared at him for a heartbeat, not quite believing what he heard. They are what? he asked. British, sir, in the seminary. But Colonel assured me there were no boats, Soult protested. Colonel was the city's French governor. None on their banks, sir. All the boats in the city had been pulled from the water and piled on the quays, where they were available for the French to use, but would be of no use to anyone coming from the south. But they're nevertheless crossing, Brassard said. They're already on the hill. Soult felt his heart miss a bead. The seminary was on a hill that dominated the road to Amaranti, and that road was his lifeline back to the depots in Spain and also the connection between the garrison in Oporto and General Loison's men on the Tomega. If the British cut that road, then they could pick off the French army piece by piece, and Soult's reputation would be destroyed along with his men. The marshal stood, knocking over his chair in his anger. Tell General Foy to push them back into the river, he roared. Now, go, push them into the river.
The men hurried from the room, leaving Kate and Christopher alone. And Kate saw the look of utter panic on her husband's face and felt a fierce joy because of it. The windows rattled, the chandeliers shivered, and the British were coming. Well, 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 we have rifles among our congregation. We are blessed indeed. I didn't know any of the 95th were attached to the 1st Brigade. The speaker was a burly Rubicon man with a balding head and an affable face. If it were not for his uniform, he would have looked like a friendly farmer, and Sharp could imagine him in an English market town, leaning on a hurdle, prodding plump sheep, and waiting for a livestock auction to begin. You are most welcome, he told Sharp. That's Daddy Hill, Harris told Pendleton. Now, now, young man, General Hill boomed. You shouldn't use an officer's nickname within his earshot, liable to get you punished. Sorry, sir. Harris had not meant to speak so loudly. But you're a rifleman, so you're forgiven. And a very scruffy rifleman, too, I must say. What is the army coming to when we don't dress for battle, eh? He beamed at Harris, then fished in his pocket and brought out a handful of almonds. Something to occupy your tongue, young man. Thank you, sir. There were now two generals on the seminary roof. General Hill, commander of the 1st Brigade, whose forces were crossing the river and whose kindly nature had earned him the nickname of Daddy, had joined Sir Edward Paget just in time to see three French battalions come from the city's eastern suburbs and form into two columns that would assault the seminary hill. The three battalions were in the valley, being pushed and harried into their ranks by sergeants and corporals. One column would come straight up at the seminary's facade, while the other was forming near the Amaranti Road to assault the northern flank. But the French were also aware that British reinforcements were constantly arriving at the seminary, and so they'd sent a battery of guns to the riverbank with orders to sink the three barges. The columns waited for the gunners to open fire, probably hoping that once the barges were sunk, the gunners would turn their weapons onto the seminary. And Sharp, who had been wondering why Sir Arthur Wellesley had not put guns at the convent across the river, saw that he'd worried about nothing. For no sooner did the French batteries appear than a dozen British guns, which had been parked out of sight at the back of the convent terrace, were wheeled forward. That's the medicine for Frenchmen, General Hill exclaimed when the great row of guns appeared. The first to fire was a five-and-a-half-inch howitzer, the British equivalent of the cannon that had bombarded Sharp on the Watchtower Hill. It was loaded with a spherical case shot, a weapon that only Britain deployed, which had been invented by Lieutenant Colonel Shrapnel, and the manner of its working was kept a closely guarded secret. The shell, which was packed with musket balls about a central charge of powder, was designed to shower those balls and the scraps of its casing down onto enemy troops. Yet to work properly, it had to explode well short of its target, so that the shot's forward momentum carried the lethal missiles onto the enemy, and that precision demanded that the gunners cut their fuses with exquisite skill. The howitzer's gunner had that skill. The howitzer boomed and rocked back on its trail. The shell arced over the river, leaving the telltale wisp of fuse smoke in its wake, then exploded twenty yards short and twenty feet above the leading French gun, just as it was being unlimbered. The explosion tore the air red and white, the bullets and shattered casings screamed down, and every horse in the French team was eviscerated. And every man in the French gun crew, all fourteen of them, was either killed or wounded, while the gun itself was thrown off its carriage. Oh dear, Hill said, forgetting the bloodthirsty welcome with which he greeted the sight of the British batteries. Those poor fellows, he said. Dear me. The cheers of the British soldiers in the seminary were drowned by the huge bellow of the other British guns opening fire. From their eyrie on the southern bank they dominated the French position, and their spherical case, common shells and round shot swept the French guns with dreadful effect. The French gunners abandoned their pieces, left their horses squealing and dying, and fled. And then the British guns racked their elevating screws, or loosened the howitzer coins, and started to pour shot and shell into the massed ranks of the nearest French column. They raked it from the flank, pouring round shot through close-packed files, exploding case shot over their heads and killing with a terrible ease. The French officers took one panicked look at their broken artillery, and ordered the infantry up the slope. Drummers at the heart of the two columns began their incessant rhythm,
and the front rank stepped off as another round shot whipped through the files to plough a red furrow in the blue uniforms. Men screamed and died, yet still the drums beat, and the men chanted their war cry. Vive l'Empereur! Sharp had seen columns before and was puzzled by them. The British army fought against other infantry arrayed in two ranks, and every man could use his musket, and if cavalry threatened, they marched and wheeled into a square of four ranks, and still every man could use his musket. But the soldiers at the heart of the two French columns could never fire without hitting the men in front. These columns both had around forty men in a rank, and twenty in each file. The French used such a formation, a great battering block of men, because it was simpler to persuade conscripts to advance in such an array and because against badly trained troops the very sight of such a great mass of men was daunting. But against redcoats it was suicide. Vive l'Empereur! the French shouted in rhythm with the drums, though their shout was half-hearted because both formations were climbing steep slopes and the men were breathless. God save our good King George! General Hill sang in a surprisingly fine tenor voice. Long live our noble George, don't shoot too high. He sang the last four words, and the men on the roof grinned. Hagman hauled back the flint of his rifle and sighted on a French officer who was labouring up the slope with a sword in his hand. Sharp's riflemen were on the northern wing of the seminary, facing the column that was not being flayed by the British guns on the convent terrace. A new battery had just deployed low on the river's southern bank, and it was adding its fire to the two batteries on the convent hill. But none of the British guns could see the northern column, which would have to be thrown back by rifle and musket fire alone. Vicente's Portuguese were manning the loopholes on the northern garden wall, and by now there were so many men in the seminary that every loophole had three or four men, so that each could fire, then step back to reload, while another took his place. Sharp saw that some of the redcoats had green facings and cuffs. The Barkshires, he thought which meant the whole of the buffs were in the building, and new battalions were now arriving. Aim at the officers, Sharp called to his riflemen. Muskets don't fire! This order's for rifles only! He made the distinction because a musket fired at this range was a wasted shot, but his riflemen would be lethal. He waited a second, took a breath. Fire! Hagman's officer jerked back, both arms in the air, sword cartwheeling back over the column. Another officer was down on his knees, clutching his belly, and a third was holding his shoulder. The front of the column stepped over the corpse, and the blue-coated line seemed to shudder as more bullets slammed into them. And then the long, leading French ranks, panicked by the whistle of rifle bullets about their ears, fired up at the seminary. The volley was ear-splitting. The smoke smothered the slope like sea fog, and the musket balls rattled on the seminary walls and shattered its glass windows. The volley at least served to hide the French for a few yards, but then they reappeared through the smoke, and more rifles fired, and another officer went down. The column divided to pass the solitary tree, then the long ranks reunited when they were past it. The men in the garden began firing. Then the redcoats crammed into the seminary windows, and arrayed with Sharp's men on the roof, pulled their triggers. Muskets crashed. Smoke thickened, the balls plucked at men in the column's front ranks and put them down. And the men advancing behind lost their cohesion as they tried not to step on their dead or wounded colleagues. Fire low, a sergeant of the buffs called to his men. Don't waste his majesty's lead. Colonel Waters was carrying spare canteens about the roof for men who were parched by biting the cartridges. The saltpeter and the gunpowder dried the mouth fast, and men gulped the water between shots. The column attacking the seminary's western face was already shredded. Those Frenchmen were being assailed by rifle and musket fire. But the cannonade from the southern bank of the river was far worse. Gunners had rarely been offered such an easy target, the chance to rake the flank of an enemy's infantry column, and they worked like demons. Spherical case cracked in the air, shooting fiery strands of smoke in crazy trajectories, Round shots bounced and hammered through the ranks, and shells exploded in the column's heart. Three drummers were hit by case shot. Then a round shot whipped the head off another drummer boy, and when the instruments went silent, the infantrymen lost heart and began to edge backwards. Musket volleys spat from the seminary's three upper floors, 
and the big building now looked as though it was on fire because powder smoke was writhing thick from every window. The loopholes jetted flame, the balls struck wavering ranks, and then the French in the western column began to retreat faster, and the backward movement turned to panic, and they broke. Some of the French, instead of retreating to the cover of the houses on the valley's far side, houses that were even now being struck by round shot so that their rafters and masonry were being splintered and the first fires were burning in the wreckage, ran to join the northern attack, which was shielded by the seminary from the cannon fire. That northern column kept coming. It was taking dreadful punishment, but it was soaking up the bullets and musket balls, and the sergeants and officers continually pushed men into the front ranks to replace the dead and the wounded. And so the column came ponderously uphill. But no one in the French ranks had really thought what they would do when they reached the hilltop, where there was no door facing them. They would have to skirt the building and try to break through the big gates leading to the garden. And when the men in the front ranks saw no place to go, they simply stopped advancing and began shooting instead. A ball plucked at sharp sleeve. A newly arrived lieutenant of the Northamptonshire Regiment fell back with a sigh a bullet in his forehead. He lay on his back, dead before he fell, looking strangely peaceful. The redcoats had placed their cartridges and propped their ramrods on the red tile parapet to make loading quicker, but there were now so many on the roof that they jostled each other as they fired down into the dim mass of Frenchmen who were wreathed in their own smoke. One Frenchman ran bravely forward to fire through a loophole, but he was hit before he could reach the wall. Sharp had fired one shot, then he just watched his men. Pendleton and Perkins, the youngest, were grinning as they fired. Cooper and Tongue were reloading for Hagman, knowing he was a better shot, and the old poacher was calmly picking off one man after the other. A cannonball screamed overhead, and Sharp twisted round to see that the French had placed a battery on the hill to the west, at the city's edge. There was a small chapel there, with a bell tower, and Sharp saw the bell tower vanish in smoke, then crumble into ruin as the British batteries at the convent hammered the newly arrived French guns. A Berkshire man turned to watch, and a bullet whipped through his mouth, mangling his teeth and tongue, and he swore incoherently, spitting a stream of blood. Don't watch the city! Sharp bellowed. Keep shooting! Keep shooting! Hundreds of Frenchmen were firing muskets uphill, and the vast majority of the shots were simply wasted against stone walls, but some found targets. Dodd had a flesh wound in his left arm, but he kept firing. A redcoat was hit in the throat and choked to death. The solitary tree on the northern slope was twitching as it was struck by bullets, and shreds of leaf were flying away with the French musket smoke. A sergeant of the buffs fell back with a bullet in his ribs, and then Sir Edward Paget sent men from the western side of the roof, who had already seen their column defeated, to add their fire to the northern side. The muskets flared and coughed and spat down. The smoke thickened, and Sir Edward grinned at Daddy Hill. Brave bastards! Sir Edward had to shout over the noise of muskets and rifles. They won't stand, Ned! Hill called back. They won't stand! Hill was right. The first Frenchmen were already backing down the hill because of the futility of shooting at stone walls. Sir Edward, exultant at this easy victory, went to the parapet to look at the retreating enemy. And he stood there, gold braid catching the smoke-dim sun, watching the enemy column disintegrate and run away. But a few stubborn Frenchmen still fired, and suddenly Sir Edward gasped, clapped a hand to his elbow, and Sharp saw that the sleeve of the general's elegant red coat was torn, and that a jagged piece of white bone was showing through the ripped wool and bloody mangled flesh. Jesus! Paget swore. He was in terrible pain. The ball had shattered his elbow and seared up through his biceps. He was half bent over with the agony and very pale. Take him down to the doctors, Hill ordered. You'll be all right, Ned. Paget forced himself to stand straight. An aide had taken off a neckcloth and was trying to bind his general's wound, but Paget shook him off. The command is yours, he said to Hill through clenched teeth. So it is. Hill acknowledged. Keep firing! Sharp shouted at his men. It did not matter that the rifle barrels were almost too hot to touch. What mattered was to drive the remaining French back down the hill, or better still, to kill them. Another rush of feet announced that more reinforcements had arrived at the seminary.
for the French had yet to find any way of stopping the traffic across the river. The British artillery, kings of this battlefield, were hammering any French gunner who dared show his face. Every few moments a brave French crew would run to the abandoned guns on the quay in hope of putting a round shot into one of the barges. But every time they were struck by spherical case, and even by canister, for the new British battery down at the water's edge was close enough to use the deadly ammunition across the river. The musket balls flared from the cannon's mouths like duck shot, killing six or seven men at a time, and after a while the French gunners abandoned their efforts and just hid in the houses at the back of the quay. And then, quite suddenly, there were no Frenchmen firing on the northern slope. The grass was horrid with dead men and wounded men, and with fallen muskets and with little flickering fires where the musket wadding had set light to the grass. But the survivors had fled to the Amaranti Road in the valley. The single tree looked as though it had been attacked by locusts. A drum trundled down the hill, making a rattling noise. Sharp saw a French flag through the smoke, but could not see whether the staff was topped by an eagle. Stop firing! Hill called. Clean your barrels! Sharp shouted. Check your flints! For the French would be back. Of that he was certain. They would be back. Chapter 9 More men came to the seminary. A score of Portuguese civilians arrived with hunting guns and bags of ammunition, escorted by a plump priest who was cheered by the redcoats when he arrived in the garden with a bell-mouthed blunderbuss like those carried by stagecoach drivers to repel highwaymen. The buffs had relit the fires in the kitchens and now fetched great metal cauldrons of tea or hot water to the roof. The tea cleaned out the soldiers' throats and the hot water swilled out their muskets and rifles. Ten boxes of spare ammunition were also carried up and Harper filled his shako with the cartridges which were not as fine as those supplied for the rifles, but would do in a pinch. And this is what you call the pinch, sir, eh? he asked, distributing the cartridges along the parapet where the rifles and ramrods lent. The French were thickening in the low ground to the north. If they had any sense, Sharp thought, the enemy would bring mortars to that low ground. But so far none had appeared. Perhaps all the mortars were to the west of the city, guarding against the Royal Navy, and too far away to be fetched quickly. Extra loopholes were battered through the garden's northern wall. Two of the Northamptonshires had manhandled a great pair of rain butts to the wall and propped the door of the garden shed across the barrel's tops to make a fire step from which they could shoot over the wall's coping. Harris brought sharp a mug of tea, then looked left and right before producing a leg of cold chicken from his cartridge box. Thought you might like this as well, sir. Where did you get it? I found it, sir, Harris said vaguely. And I got one for you too, Sarge. Harris gave a leg to Harper, then produced a breast for himself, brushed some loose powder from it, and bit into it hungrily. Sharp discovered he was famished, and the chicken tasted delicious. Where did it come from? he insisted. I think they were General Paget's dinner, sir, Harris confessed. But he's probably lost his appetite. I should think he has, Sharp said. And a pity to let good chicken waste, eh? He turned as a drumbeat sounded, and saw the French were forming their ranks again, but this time only on the northern side of the seminary. To your places, he called, chucking the chicken bone far out into the garden. A few of the French were now carrying ladders, presumably plundered from the houses that were being battered by the British guns. When they come, he called, aim for the men with the ladders. Even without the rifle fire, he doubted the French could get close enough to place the ladders against the garden wall, but it did no harm to make certain. Most of his riflemen had used the lull in the fight to load their newly cleaned barrels with leather-wrapped balls and prime powder, which meant their first shots ought to be lethally accurate. After that, as the French pressed closer and the noise rose and the smoke thickened, they would use cartridges, leave the leather patches in their butt traps, and so sacrifice accuracy for speed. Sharp now loaded his own rifle, using a patch, but no sooner had he returned the ramrod to its slots than General Hill was beside him. I've never fired a rifle, Hill said. Very like a musket, sir, Sharp said, embarrassed at being singled out by a general. May I? Hill reached for the weapon, and Sharp yielded it. It's rather beautiful. Hill said wistfully, caressing the baker's flank. 
Not nearly as cumbersome as a musket. It's a lovely thing, Sharp said fervently. Hill aimed the gun down the hill, seemed about to cock and fire, then suddenly handed it back to Sharp. I'd dearly like to try it, he said, but if I missed me aim, then the whole army would know about it, eh? And I'd never leave that down. He spoke loudly, and Sharp understood he'd been an unwitting participant in a little piece of theatre. Hill had not really been interested in the rifle, but rather in taking the men's minds away from the threat beneath them. In the process, he'd subtly flattered them by suggesting they could do something he could not, and he had left them grinning. Sharp thought about what he'd just seen. He admired it, but he also admired Sir Arthur Wellesley, who would never have resorted to such a display. Sir Arthur would ignore the men, and the men in turn would fight like demons to gain his grudging approval. Sharp had never wasted much time worrying why some men were born to be officers and others not. He had jumped the gap, but that didn't make the system any less unfair. Yet to complain of the world's unfairness was the same as grumbling that the sun was hot or that the wind sometimes changed its direction. Unfairness existed. It always had and it always would. And the miracle, to sharp size, was that some men like Hill and Wellesley, though they had become wealthy and privileged through unfair advantages, were nevertheless superb at what they did. Not all generals were good. Many were downright bad. But Sharp had usually been lucky and found himself commanded by men who knew their business. Sharp didn't care that Sir Arthur Wellesley was the son of an aristocrat, and had purchased his way up the ladder of promotion, and was as cold as a lawyer's sense of charity. The long-nosed bugger knew how to win, and that was what mattered. And what mattered now was to beat these Frenchmen. The column, much larger than the first, was surging forward, driven by the drumsticks. The Frenchmen cheered, perhaps to give themselves confidence, and they must have been encouraged by the fact that the British guns on the river's far side could not see them. But then, provoking a British cheer, a spherical case shot fired by a howitzer exploded just ahead of the column's centre. The British gunners were firing blind, arching their shots over the seminary, but they were firing well, and their first shot killed the French cheering dead. Rifles only, Sharp called. Fire when you're ready. Don't waste the patch. Hagman! Go for that big man with the sabre. I see him, sir, Hagman said, and shifted his rifle to aim at the officer who was striding ahead, setting an example, asking to be rifle meat. Look for the ladders, Sharp reminded the others, then walked to the parapet, put his left foot on the coping and the rifle to his shoulder. He aimed at a man with a ladder, sighting on the man's head in the expectation that the bullet would fall to take him in the lower belly or groin. The wind was in Sharp's face, so would not drift the shot. He fired, and was immediately blinded by the smoke. Hagman fired next, then there was the crackle of the other rifles. The muskets kept silent. Sharp went to his left to see past the smoke, and saw that the sabre-carrying officer had vanished, as had any other man struck by a bullet. They had been swallowed by the advancing column that stepped over and past the victims. Then Sharp saw a ladder reappear as it was snatched up by a man in the fourth or fifth rank. He felt in his cartridge box for another round and began to reload. He didn't look at the rifle as he reloaded. He just did what he'd been trained to do, what he could do in his sleep. And just as he primed the rifle, so the first musket balls were shot from the garden wall. Then the muskets opened fire from the windows and roof, and the seminary was again wreathed in smoke and noise. The cannon shots rumbled above, so close that Sharp almost ducked once, and the case shot banged above the slope. Bullets and musket balls ripped into the French files. Close to a thousand men were in the seminary now, and they were protected by stone walls and given a wide-open target. Sharp fired another shot down the hill, then walked up and down behind his men, watching. Slattery needed a new flint, and Sharp gave him one. Then Tarrant's mainspring broke, and Sharp replaced the weapon with Williamson's old rifle, which Harper had been carrying ever since they left Villa Real at Sedej. The enemy's drums sounded nearer, and Sharp reloaded his own rifle as the first French musket bullets rattled against the seminary's stones. They're firing blind, Sharp told his men. Firing blind! Don't waste your shots. Look for targets! That was difficult, because of the smoke hanging over the slope but vagaries of wind sometimes stirred the fog to reveal blue uniforms, and the French were close enough for Sharp to see faces. 
He aimed at a man with an enormous moustache, fired, and lost sight of the man as the smoke blossomed from his rifle's muzzle. The noise of the fight was awesome. Muskets crackling incessantly, the drum beats thumping, the case shots banging overhead, and beneath all that violence was the sound of men crying in distress. A redcoat slumped down near Harper, blood puddling by his head, until a sergeant dragged the man away from the parapet, leaving a smear of bright red on the roof's lead. Far off, it had to be on the river's southern bank, a band was playing the drum major, and Sharp tapped his rifle's butt in time to the tune. A French ramrod came whirling through the air to clatter against the seminary wall, evidently fired by a conscript who had panicked and pulled his trigger before he cleared his barrel. Sharp remembered how in Flanders, at his very first battle as a red-coated private, a man's musket had misfired, but he'd gone on reloading, pulling the trigger, reloading, and when they drilled out his musket after the battle, they found sixteen useless charges crammed down the barrel. What was the man's name? He'd been from Norfolk, despite being in a Yorkshire regiment, and he'd called everyone Boar. Sharp couldn't remember the name, and it annoyed him. A musket ball whipped past his face, another hit the parapet and shattered a tile. Down in the garden, Vicente's men in the redcoats were not aiming their muskets, but just pushing the muzzles into the loopholes, pulling the triggers, and getting out of the way so the next man could use the embrasure. There were some green jackets in the garden now, and Sharp guessed a company of the 60th, the Royal American Rifles, must be attached to Hill's Brigade, and was now joining the fight. They would do better, he thought, to climb to the roof than try to fire their bakers through the loopholes. The single tree on the northern slope was thrashing, as though in a gale, and there was scarcely one leaf left on its splintered branches. Smoke drifted through the winter bare twigs that twitched continually from the bullet strikes. Sharp primed his rifle, put it to his shoulder, looked for a target, saw a knot of blue uniforms very close to the garden wall, and put the bullet into them. The air hissed with bullets. God damn it, but why didn't the bastards pull back? A brave group of Frenchmen tried to run down the seminary's western face to reach the big gate, but the British guns of the convent saw them, and the shells cracked black and red, smearing blood across the paved terrace and up the garden wall's whitewashed stones. Sharp saw his men grimacing as they tried to force the new bullets down the powder-fouled barrels. There was no time to clean the rifles. They just hammered the bullets down and pulled the trigger. Fire and fire again. And the French were doing the same, a mad duel of bullets. And above the smoke, across the northern valley, Sharp saw a horde of new French infantry streaming out of the city. Two men in shirt sleeves were carrying boxes of ammunition round the roof. Who needs it? they shouted, sounding like London street traders. Fresh lid! Who needs it? Fresh lid! New powder! One of General Hill's aides was carrying canteens of water to the parapet, while Hill himself, red-faced and anxious, stood close to the redcoats, so he was seen to share their danger. He caught Sharp's gaze and offered a grimace, as if to suggest that this was harder work than he had anticipated. More troops came to the roof, men with fresh muskets and full cartridge boxes, and with them were the riflemen of the 60th, whose officer must have realised he had been in the wrong place. He gave Sharp a companionable nod, then ordered his men to the parapet. Flames jetted down, smoke thickened, and still the French tried to blast their way through stone walls with nothing but musket fire. Two Frenchmen succeeded in scaling the garden wall, but hesitated at the top and were seized and dragged across the coping to be battered to death by musket butts on the path beneath. Seven dead redcoats were laid out on another gravel path, their hands curling in death, and the blood of their wounds slowly hardening and turning black but most of the British dead were in the seminary's corridors, dragged away from the big windows that made the best targets for the frustrated French. A whole new column was now climbing the slope, coming to swell the shattered ranks of the first, but though the beleaguered men in the seminary could not know it, these newcomers were the symptom of French defeat. Marshal Soult, desperate for fresh troops to attack the seminary, had stripped the city itself of infantry and the people of Oporto, finding themselves unguarded for the first time since the end of March, swarmed down to the river and dragged their boats out of warehouses, shops and backyards where the occupiers had kept them under guard. A swarm of those small craft now rowed across the river, past the shattered remnants of the pontoon bridge, to the quays of Villanova de Gaia, where the brigade of guards was waiting.
An officer peered anxiously across the Douro to reassure himself that the French were not waiting in ambush on the opposite quay, then shouted at his men to embark. The guards were rowed back to the city, and still more boats appeared, and more redcoats crossed. Soult did not know it, but his city was filling with the enemy. Nor did the men attacking the seminary know it, not till the redcoats appeared at the city's eastern edge, and by then the second giant column had climbed into the death storm of bullets flicking from the seminary's walls, roof, and windows. The noise rivaled that of Trafalgar, where Sharp had been dazed by the incessant boom of the great ship's guns. But this noise was higher pitched as the musket's discharges blended into an eerie, hard-edged shriek. The higher slope of the seminary hill was sodden with blood, and the surviving Frenchmen were using the bodies of their dead comrades as protection. A few drummers still tried to drive the broken columns on, but then came a shout of alarm from a French sergeant, and the shout spread, and suddenly the smoke was dissipating and the slope emptying as the French saw the brigade of guards advancing across the valley. The French ran. They'd fought bravely, going against stone walls with muskets, but now they panicked, and all discipline vanished as they ran for the road going east towards Amaranti. Other French forces, cavalry and artillery among them, were hurrying from the higher part of the city, escaping the flood of redcoats ferried across the Douro, and fleeing the revenge of the townsfolk who hunted up the alleys and streets to find wounded Frenchmen whom they attacked with fish filleting knives or battered with clubs. There was screaming and howling in Oporto's streets, but only a strange silence in the bullet-scarred seminary. Then General Hill cupped his hands. Follow them! he shouted. Follow them! I want a pursuit! Rifles! To me! Sharp called. He held his men back from the pursuit. They'd already endured enough, he reckoned, and it was time to give them a rest. Clean your guns! he ordered them. And so they stayed, as the redcoats and riflemen of the 1st Brigade formed ranks outside the seminary, and then marched away eastwards. A score of dead men were left on the roof. There were long streaks of blood, showing where they had been pulled away from the parapet. The smoke about the building slowly cleared until the air felt clean again. The slopes beneath the seminary were strewn with discarded French packs and French bodies, not all of them dead. A wounded man crawled away between the blood-spattered blossoms of ragweed. A dog sniffed at a corpse. Ravens came on black wings to taste the dead, and women and children hurried from the houses in the valley to begin the plunder. A wounded man tried to twitch away from a girl who could not have been more than eleven, and she drew a butchering knife from her apron belt, a knife that had been sharpened so often that its blade was little more than a whisper of thin steel attached to a bone handle and she sliced it across the Frenchman's throat, then grimaced because his blood had splashed onto her lap. Her little sister was dragging six muskets by their slings. The small fires started by wadding smoked between the corpses, where the plump Portuguese priest, the blunderbuss still in one hand, made the sign of the cross over the Frenchman he had helped to kill. While the living French, in panic disarray, ran, and the city of Oporto had been recaptured. The letter addressed to Richard Sharp, Esquire, was waiting on the mantel of the parlour in the House Beautiful, and it was a miracle that it survived, because that afternoon a score of Royal Artillery gunners made the house into their billet, and the first thing they did was to break up the parlour's furniture to make a fire, and the letter was an ideal piece of kindling. But then Captain Hogan arrived just before the fire was lit and managed to retrieve the paper. He'd come looking for Sharp, and had asked the gunners if any messages had been left in the house, thinking Sharp might have left one. "'English folk live here, lads,' he told the gunners as he opened the unsealed letter. "'So wipe your feet and clean up behind yourselves.' He read the brief message and thought for a while. "'I suppose none of you have seen a tall rifle officer from the 95th. No? Well, if he shows up, tell him to go to the Palacio de Carancas.' "'The what, sir?' a gunner asked. "'Big building down the hill,' Hogan explained. "'Headquarters.' Hogan knew Sharp was alive, for Colonel Waters had told him of meeting Sharp that morning. But though Hogan roamed the streets, he hadn't found Sharp, and so a pair of orderlies were sent to search the city for the stray riflemen. A new pontoon bridge was already being floated across the Douro. The city was free again, and it celebrated with flags, wine, and music, 
Hundreds of French prisoners were under guard in a warehouse, and a long row of captured French guns was parked on the river's quay, where the British merchant ships that had been captured when the city fell now flew their own flags again. Marshal Soult and his army had marched away east towards the bridge at Amaranti that the French had captured so recently, and they were blissfully unaware that General Beresford, the new commander of the Portuguese army, had recaptured the bridge and was waiting for them. If they can't cross at Amaranti, Wellesley demanded that evening, then where will they go? The question was asked in the blue reception room of the Palacio de Scarancas, where Wellington and his staff had eaten a meal that had evidently been cooked for Marshal Soult, and which had been found still hot in the palace's ovens. The meal had been lamb, which Sir Arthur liked, but so tricked out with onions, scraps of ham and mushrooms that its taste had been quite spoilt for him. I thought the French appreciated cooking, he had grumbled, then demanded that an orderly bring him a bottle of vinegar from the kitchens. He had doused the lamb, scraped away the offending mushrooms and onions, and decided the meal was much improved. Now, with the remnants of the meal cleared away, the officers crowded about a hand-drawn map that Captain Hogan had spread on the table. Sir Arthur traced a finger across the map. They'll want to get back to Spain, of course, he said. But how? He had expected Colonel Waters, the most senior of the exploring officers, to answer the question. But Waters had not ridden the North Country. And so the Colonel nodded to Captain Hogan, the most junior officer in the room. Hogan had spent the weeks before Soult's invasion mapping the Trasos Montes, the wild northern mountains where the roads twisted and the rivers ran fast and the bridges were few and narrow. Portuguese troops were even now marching to cut off those bridges, and so deny the French the roads which would lead them back to their fortresses in Spain. And Hogan now tapped the vacant space on the map north of the road from Oporto to Amarante. If Amarante is taken, sir, and our fellows capture Braga tomorrow... Hogan paused and glanced at Sir Arthur, who gave an irritable nod. Then Sult is in a pickle, a real pickle. He'll have to cross the Serra de Santa Catalina, and there are no carriage roads in those hills. What is there? Wellesley asked, staring at the forbidding vacancy of the map. Goat tracks, Hogan said, wolves, footpaths, ravines, and very angry peasants. Once he gets to here, sir, he tapped the map to the north of the Serra de Santa Catalina. He's got a passable road that'll take him home, but to reach that road he'll have to abandon his wagons, his guns, his carriages, in fact everything that can't be carried on a man or a mule's back. Thunder growled above the city. The sound of rain began, then grew heavier, pelting down onto the terrace and rattling on the tall, uncurtained windows. Damn bloody weather, Wellesley growled, knowing it would slow down his pursuit of the beaten French. It rains on the ungodly too, sir, Hogan observed. Damn them as well, Wellesley bridled. He was not sure how much he liked Hogan, whom he'd inherited from Craddock. The damn man was Irish for a start, which reminded Wellesley that he himself had been born in Ireland, a fact of which he was not particularly proud. And the man was plainly not high-born, and Sir Arthur liked his aides to come from good families, Yet he recognised that prejudice as quite unreasonable, and he was beginning to suspect that the quiet-spoken Hogan had a good deal of competence, while Colonel Waters, of whom Wellesley did approve, spoke very warmly of the Irishman. So, Wellesley summed up the situation. They're on the road between here and Amaranti, and they can't come back without fighting us, and they can't go forward without meeting Beresford. So they must go north into the hills. And where do they go after that? To this road here, sir, Hogan answered, pointing a pencil at the map. It goes from Braga to Chavez, sir, and if he manages to get past the Ponte Nova and reach Frivanche, which is a village here, he paused to make a pencil mark on the map. Then there's a track that'll take him north across the hills to Montalegre, and that's just a stone's throw from the frontier. Sir Arthur's aides were huddled about the dining table, looking down at the candle-lit map, though one man... A slight and pale figure, dressed in elegant civilian clothes, did not bother to take any interest, but just stretched languidly in an armchair, where he managed to convey the insulting impression that he was bored by this talk of maps, roads, hills, and bridges. And this road, sir, Hogan went on, tracing his pencil from the Ponte Nova to Montalegre. 
It's a real devil. It's a twister, sir. You have to walk five miles to go a half mile forwards. And better still, sir, it crosses a couple of rivers, small ones, but in deep gorges with quick water, and that means high bridges, sir. And if the Portuguese can cop one of those bridges, then Monsieur Soult is lost, sir. He's trapped. He can only lead his men across the mountains, and they'll have the devil on their heels all the way. God speed the Portuguese, Wellesley grunted, grimacing at the sound of the rain which he knew would slow his allies, who were advancing inland in an attempt to sever the roads by which the French could reach Spain. They'd already cut them off at Amaranti, but now they would need to march further north, while Wellesley's army, fresh from its triumph at Oporto, would have to chase the French. The British were the beaters driving their game towards the Portuguese guns. Wellesley stared at the map. You drew this, Hogan? I did, sir. And it's reliable? It is, sir. Sir Arthur grunted. If it were not for the weather, he thought, he would bag Salt and all his men. But the rain would make it a damned difficult pursuit, which meant the sooner it began, the better. And so aides were sent with orders that would start the British army on its march at dawn. Then, the orders given, Sir Arthur yawned. He badly needed some sleep before the morning and he was about to turn in when the big doors were thrown open, and a very wet, very ragged, and very unshaven rifleman entered. He saw General Wellesley, looked surprised, and instinctively came to attention. Good God, Wellesley said sourly. I think you know, Lieutenant... Hogan began. Of course I know, Lieutenant Sharp, Wellesley snapped. But what I want to know is what the devil he's doing here. The 95th aren't with us. Hogan removed the candlesticks from the corners of the map and let it roll up. That's my doing, Sir Arthur, he said calmly. I found Lieutenant Sharp and his men wandering like lost sheep and took them into my care, and ever since he's been escorting me on my journeys to the frontier. I couldn't have coped with the French patrols on my own, Sir Arthur, and Mr. Sharp was a great comfort. Wellesley, while Hogan offered the explanation, just stared at Sharp. You are lost? he demanded coldly. Cut off, sir, Sharp said. During the retreat to Karuna? Yes, sir, Sharp said. In fact, his unit had been retreating towards Vigo, but the distinction was not important, and Sharp had long learned to keep replies to senior officers as brief as possible. So where the devil have you been these last few weeks? Wellesley asked tartly. Skulking? Yes, sir, Sharp said and the staff officers stiffened at the whiff of insolence that drifted through the room. I ordered the lieutenant to find a young Englishwoman who was lost, sir, Hogan hurried to explain. In fact, I ordered him to accompany Colonel Christopher. The mention of that name was like a whip-crack. No one spoke, though the young civilian who'd been pretending to sleep in the armchair, and who'd opened his eyes wide with surprise when Sharp's name was first mentioned, now paid very close attention. He was a painfully thin young man, and pallid, as though he feared the sun, and there was something feline, almost feminine, in his delicate appearance. His clothes, so very elegant, would have been well suited to a London drawing-room or a Paris salon. But here, amidst the unwashed uniforms and sun-tanned officers of Wellesley's staff, he looked like a pampered lapdog among hounds. He was sitting up straight now, and staring intently at Sharp. Colonel Christopher. Wellesley broke the silence. So you've been with him? he demanded of Sharp. General Craddock ordered me to stay with him, sir, Sharp said, and took the general's order from his pouch and laid it on the table. Wellesley did not even glance at the paper. What the devil was Craddock doing? he snapped. Christopher's not even a properly commissioned officer. He's a damned foreign office flunky. These last words were spat at the pale young man, who, rather than respond, made an airily dismissive gesture with the delicate fingers of his right hand. He caught Sharp's eye, then, and turned the gesture into a small wave of welcome, and Sharp realised with a start of recognition that it was Lord Pumphrey whom he had last met in Copenhagen. His lordship, Sharp knew, was mysteriously prominent in the Foreign Office, but Pumphrey offered no explanation of his presence in a porto, as Wellesley snatched up General Craddock's order, read it, and then threw the paper down. So what did Christopher order you to do? he asked Sharp. To stay at a place called Villa Real de Cedes, sir, 
And do what there, pray? Be killed, sir. Be killed? Sir Arthur asked in a dangerous tone. He knew Sharp was being impudent, and though the rifleman had once saved his life, Sir Arthur was quite ready to slap him down. He brought a French force to the village, sir. They attacked us. Not very effectively, it seems, Wellesley said sarcastically. Not very, no, sir, Sharp agreed. But there were twelve hundred of them, sir, and only sixty of us. He said no more, and there was silence in the big room as men worked out the odds. Twenty to one. Another peal of thunder racked the sky, and a shard of lightning flickered to the west. Twelve hundred, Richard? Hogan asked in a voice which suggested Sharp might like to amend the figure downwards. There were probably more, sir, Sharp said stoically. The 31st Leger attacked us, but they were backed up by at least one regiment of dragoons and a howitzer. Only the one, though, sir, and we saw them off. He stopped, and no one spoke again. And Sharp remembered he hadn't paid tribute to his ally, and so turned back to Wellesley. I had Lieutenant Vicente with me, sir, of the 18th Portuguese, and his thirty-odd lads helped us a lot. But I'm sorry to report he lost a couple of men, and I lost a couple too. And one of my men deserted, sir. I'm sorry about that. There was another silence, a much longer one, in which the officers stared at Sharp, and Sharp tried to count the candles on the big table. And then Lord Pumphrey broke the silence. You tell us, Lieutenant, that Mr. Christopher brought these troops to attack you? Yes, sir. Pumphrey smiled. Did he bring them, or was he brought by them? He brought them. Sharp said vigorously, and then he had the bloody nerve to come up the hill and tell me the war was over, and we ought to walk down and let the French take care of us. Thank you, Lieutenant, Pumphrey said with exaggerated civility. There was another silence. Then Colonel Waters cleared his throat. You will recall, sir, he said softly, that it was Lieutenant Sharp who provided us with our navy this morning. In other words, he was saying to Sir Arthur Wellesley, "Show some damned gratitude." But Sir Arthur was in no mood to show gratitude; he just stared at Sharp. And then Hogan remembered the letter that he had rescued from the House Beautiful, and he took it from his pocket. "It's for you, Lieutenant," he said, holding the paper towards Sharp. "But it wasn't sealed, and so I took the liberty of reading it." Sharp unfolded the paper. "He is going with the French," Sharp read, "and forcing me to accompany him, and I do not want to." It was signed Kate, and had plainly been written in a tearing hurry. The him, I assume, Hogan asked, is Christopher. Yes, sir. So the reason that Miss Savage absented herself in March, Hogan went on, was Colonel Christopher. Yes, sir. She's sweet on him. She's married to him, Sharp said, and was puzzled because Lord Pumphrey looked startled. A few weeks earlier. Hogan was talking to Wellesley now. Colonel Christopher was courting Miss Savage's mother. Does any of this ridiculous talk of romance help us determine what Christopher is doing? Sir Arthur asked with considerable asperity. It's amusing, if nothing else, Pumphrey said. He stood up, flicked a speck of dust from a cuff, and smiled at Sharp. Did you really say Christopher married this girl? He did, sir. Then he is a bad boy. Lord Pumphrey said happily, "Because he's already married." His lordship plainly enjoyed that revelation. He married Pierce Courtnell's daughter ten years ago in the happy belief that she was worth eight thousand a year. Then discovered she was hardly worth sixpence. It is not, I hear, a contented marriage. And might I observe, Sir Arthur, that Lieutenant Sharp's news answers our questions about Colonel Christopher's true allegiance? It does. Wellesley asked, puzzled. Christopher cannot hope to survive a bigamous marriage if he intends to make his future in Britain or in a free Portugal, Lord Pumphrey observed. But in France, or in a Portugal ruled by France, the French won't care how many wives he left in London. But you said he wants to return. I tended a surmise that he would wish to do so, Pumphrey corrected the general. He has, after all, been playing both sides of the table, and if he thinks we're winning, then he'll doubtless want to return, and equally doubtless he will then deny ever marrying Miss Savage. She might have another opinion, 
Wellesley observed dryly. If she's alive to utter it, which I doubt, Humphrey said. No, sir, he cannot be trusted, and dare I say that my masters in London would be immensely grateful if you were to remove him from their employment. That's what you want? It's not what I want, Humphrey contradicted Wellesley, and for a man of such delicate and frail appearance he did it with considerable force. It's what London would want. You can be certain of that. Wellesley asked, plainly disliking Pumphrey's insinuations. He has knowledge that would embarrass us, Pumphrey admitted, including the Foreign Office codes. Wellesley gave his great horse neigh of a laugh. He's probably given those to the French already. I doubt it, sir, Pumphrey said, examining his fingernails with a slight frown. A man usually holds his best cards till last, and in the end Christopher will want to bargain. Either with us or with the French, and I must say that His Majesty's government does not wish either eventuality. Then I leave his fate to you, my lord, Wellesley said with obvious distaste. And as it doubtless means filthy work, then I'd better lend you the services of Captain Hogan and Lieutenant Sharp. As for me, I'm going to bed. He nodded curtly and left the room, followed by his aides clutching sheaves of paper. Lord Pumphrey took a decanter of vino verde from the table and crossed to his armchair, where he sat with an exaggerated sigh. Sir Arthur makes me go weak at the knees, he said, and pretended to be unaware of the shocked reaction on both Sharp and Hogan's faces. Did you really save his life in India, Richard? Sharp said nothing, and Hogan answered for him. That's why he treats Sharp so badly, the Irishman said. Knows he can't stand being beholden, and especially can't stand being beholden to a misbegotten rogue like Sharp. Pumphrey shivered. Do you know what we in the Foreign Office dislike doing most of all? Going to foreign places. They are so uncomfortable. But here I am, and I suppose we must attend to our duties. Sharp had crossed to one of the tall windows where he was staring out into the wet darkness. What are my duties? he asked. Lord Pumphrey poured himself a liberal glass of wine. Not to put too fine a point on it, Richard, he said. Your duty is to find Mr. Christopher, and then... He did not finish the sentence, but instead drew a finger across his throat, a gesture Sharp saw mirrored in the dark window. Who is Christopher, anyway? Sharp wanted to know. He was a thruster, Richard, Pumphrey said, his voice acid with disapproval. A rather clever thruster in the Foreign Office. A thruster was a man who would bully and whip his way to the head of the field while riding to hounds, and in doing so upset dozens of other hunters. Yet he was thought to have a very fine future, Pumphrey continued, if he could just curb his compulsion to complicate affairs. He likes intrigue, does Christopher. The Foreign Office, of necessity, deals in secret matters, and he rather indulges in such things. Still, despite that, he was reckoned to have the makings of an excellent diplomat, and last year he was sent out here to determine the temper of the Portuguese. There were rumours, happily ill-founded, that a large number of folk, especially in the north, were more than a little sympathetic to the French, and Christopher was merely supposed to be determining the extent of that sympathy. Couldn't the embassy do that? Hogan demanded. Not without being noticed, Pumphrey said and not without occasioning some offence to a nation which is, after all, our most ancient ally. And I rather suspect that if you dispatch someone from the embassy to ask questions, then you will merely fetch the answers people think you want to hear. No, Christopher was supposed to be an English gentleman travelling in North Portugal, but, as you observe, the opportunity went to his head. Craddock was then half-witted enough to give him brevet rank, and so Christopher began hatching his plots. Lord Pumphrey gazed up at the ceiling, which was painted with reveling deities and dancing nymphs. My own suspicion is that Mr. Christopher has been laying bets on every horse in the race. We know he was encouraging a mutiny, but I strongly suspect he betrayed the mutineers. The encouragement was to reassure us that he worked for our interests, and the betrayal endeared him to the French. He's determined, is he not, to be on the winning side.' 
but the main intrigue, of course, was to enrich himself at the expense of the savage ladies. Pumphrey paused, then offered a seraphic smile. I've always rather admired bigamists. One wife would be altogether too much for me, but for a man to take two. Did I hear you say he wants to come back? Sharp asked. I surmise as much. James Christopher is not a man to burn his bridges unless he has no alternative. Oh, yes, I'm sure he'll be designing some way to return to London if he finds a lack of opportunity with the French. Now I'm supposed to shoot the shit-faced bastard, Sharp said. Not precisely how we in the Foreign Office would express the matter, Lord Pumphrey said severely, but you are, I see, seized of the essence. Go and shoot him, Richard, and God bless your little rifle. And what are you doing here? Sharp thought to ask. Other than being exquisitely uncomfortable, Pumphrey asked, I was sent to supervise Christopher. He approached General Craddock with news of a proposed mutiny. Craddock, quite properly, reported the affair to London, and London became excited at the thought of suborning Bonaparte's army in Portugal and Spain, but felt that someone of wisdom and good judgment was needed to propel the scheme, and so, quite naturally, they asked me to come. And we can forget the scheme now, Hogan observed. Indeed we can, Pumphrey replied tartly. Christopher brought a Captain Argentan to talk with General Craddock, he explained to Sharp. And when Craddock was replaced, Argentan made his own way across the lines to confer with Sir Arthur. He wanted promises that our forces wouldn't intervene in the event of a French mutiny, but Sir Arthur wouldn't hear of his plots, and told him to tuck his tail between his legs and go back into the outer darkness whence he came. So, no plots, no mysterious messengers with cloaks and daggers, just plain old-fashioned soldiering. It seems, alas, that I am surplus to requirements, and Mr. Christopher, if your lady friend's note is to be believed, has gone with the French, which must mean, I think, that he believes they will still win this war. Hogan had opened the window to smell the rain, but now turned to Sharp. We must go, Richard. We have things to plan. Yes, sir. Sharp picked up his battered shako and tried to bend the visor back into shape then thought of another question. My lord? Richard? Lord Pumphrey responded gravely. You remember Astrid? Sharp asked awkwardly. Of course I remember the fair Astrid, Pumphrey answered smoothly. Ole Skavgard's comely daughter. I was wondering if you had news of her, my lord, Sharp said. He was blushing. Lord Pumphrey did have news of her but none he cared to tell Sharp, for the truth was that both Astrid and her father were in their graves, their throats cut on Pumphrey's orders. I did hear, his lordship said gently, that there was a contagion in Copenhagen, malaria, perhaps, or was it cholera? Alas, Richard, he spread his hands. She's dead. I do fear so. Oh, Sharp said inadequately. He stood stricken, blinking. He had thought once that he could leave the army and live with Astrid, and so make a new life in the clean decencies of Denmark. I'm sorry, he said. As am I, Lord Pumphrey said easily. So very sorry. But tell me, Richard, about Miss Savage. Might one assume she's beautiful? Yes, Sharp said, she is. I thought so, Lord Pumphrey said resignedly. And she'll be dead, Hogan snarled at Sharp, if you and me don't hurry. Yes, sir, Sharp said, and hurried. Hogan and Sharp walked through the night rain, going uphill to a schoolhouse that Sharp had commandeered as quarters for his men. You do know, Hogan said with considerable irritation, that Lord Pumphrey is a molly. Of course I know he's a molly. He can be hanged for that, Hogan observed with indecent satisfaction. I still like him, Sharp said. He's a serpent, all diplomats are, worse than lawyers. He ain't stuck up, Sharp said. There is nothing, Hogan said, nothing in all the world that Lord Pomfrey wants more than to be stuck up with you, Richard. He laughed, his spirits restored.
And how the hell are we to find that poor wee girl and her rotten husband, eh? We? Sharp asked. You're coming too? This is far too important to be left to some lowly English lieutenant, Hogan said. This is an errand that needs the sagacity of the Irish. Once in the schoolhouse, Sharp and Hogan settled in the kitchen where the French occupiers of the city had left an undamaged table. And because Hogan had left his good map at the general's headquarters, he used a piece of charcoal to draw a cruder version on the table's scrub top. From the main schoolroom, where Sharp's men had spread their blankets, came the sound of women's laughter. His men, Sharp reflected, had been in the city less than a day, yet they had already found a dozen girls. Best way to learn the language, sir, Harper had assured him. And we're all very short on education, sir, as you doubtless know. Right! Hogan kicked the kitchen door shut. Look at the map, Richard. He showed how the British had come up the coast of Portugal and dislodged the French from Oporto, and how at the same time the Portuguese army had attacked in the east. They've retaken Amarante, Hogan said, which is good because it means Salt can't cross that bridge. He's stuck, Richard. Stuck. So he's got no choice. He'll have to strike north through the hills to find a wee road up here. The charcoal scratched as he traced a wiggly line on the table. And it's a bastard of a road, and if the Portuguese can keep going in this god-awful weather, then they're going to cut the road here. The charcoal made a cross. It's a bridge called Ponte Nova. Do you remember it? Sharp shook his head. He'd seen so many bridges and mountain roads with Hogan that he could no longer remember which was which. The Ponte Nova, Hogan said, means the new bridge. And naturally it's as old as the hills, and one tub of powder will send it crashing down into the gorge. And then, Richard, Monsieur Soult is properly buggered. But he's only buggered if the Portuguese can get there. He looked gloomy, for the weather was not propitious for a swift march into the mountains. And if they can't stop Soult at the Ponte Nova, then there's a half chance they'll catch him at the Saltador. You remember that, of course. I do remember that, sir, Sharp said. The Saltador was a bridge high in the mountains, a stone span that leapt across a deep and narrow gorge, and the spectacular arch had been nicknamed the Leaper, the Saltador. Sharp remembered Hogan mapping it, remembered a small village of low stone houses, but chiefly remembered the river tumbling in a seething torrent beneath the soaring bridge. If they get to the Saltador and cross it, Hogan said, then we can kiss them goodbye and wish them luck. They'll have escaped. He flinched as a crash of thunder reminded him of the weather. Ah, well, he sighed. We can only do our best. And just what are we doing? Sharp wanted to know. Now that, Richard, is a very good question, Hogan said. He helped himself to a pinch of snuff, paused, then sneezed violently. God help me, but the doctors say it clears the bronchial tubes, whatever the hell they are. Now, as I see it, one of two things can happen. He tapped the charcoal streak marking the Ponte Nova. If the French are stopped at that bridge, then most will surrender. They'll have no choice. Some will take to the hills, of course, but they'll find armed peasants all over the place looking for throats and other parts to cut. So we'll either find Mr. Christopher with the army when it surrenders, or, more likely, he'll run away and claim to be an escaped English prisoner. In which case, we go into the mountains... Find him and put him up against the wall. Truly? That worries you? I'd rather hang him. Ah, well, we can discuss the method when the time comes. Now, the second thing that might happen, Richard, is that the French are not stopped at the Ponte Nova, in which case we need to reach the Saltador. Why? Think what it was like, Richard, Hogan said. A deep ravine, steep slopes everywhere, the kind of place where a few riflemen could be very vicious. And if the French are crossing the bridge, then we'll see him, and your baker rifles will have to do the necessary. We can get close enough, Sharp asked, trying to remember the terrain about the leaping bridge. There are cliffs, high bluffs. I'm sure you can get within two hundred paces. That'll do, Sharp said grimly. So one way or another, we have to finish him, Hogan said, leaning back. He's a traitor, Richard. He's probably not as dangerous as he thinks he is, 
but if he gets to Paris, then no doubt the Monsieurs will suck his brain dry and so learn a few things we'd rather they didn't know. And if he got back to London, he's slippery enough to convince those fools that he was always working for their interests. So, all things considered, Richard, I'd say he was better off dead. And Kate? Oh, we're not going to shoot her, Hogan said reprovingly. Back in March, sir, Sharp said, he ordered me to rescue her. Does that order still stand? Hogan stared at the ceiling, which was smoke-blackened and pierced with lethal-looking hooks. In the short time I've known you, Richard, he said, I've noticed you possess a lamentable tendency to put on shining armour and look for ladies to rescue. King Arthur, God rest his soul, would have loved you. He'd have had you fighting every evil knight in the forest. Is rescuing Kate Savage important? Not really. The main thing is to punish Mr. Christopher, and I fear that Miss Kate will have to take her chances. Sharp looked down at the charcoal map. How do we get to the Pontanova? We walk, Richard. We walk. We cross the mountains, and those tracks aren't fit for horses. You'd spend half the time leading them, worrying about their feed, looking after their hooves, and wishing you didn't have them. Mules now. I'd saddle some mules and take them. But where will we find mules tonight? It's either mules or Shanks's pony, but either way we can only take a few men. Your best, and your fittest. And we have to leave before dawn. What do I do with the rest of my men? Hogan thought about it. Major Potter could use them, he suggested, to help guard the prisoners here. I don't want to lose them back to Shorncliffe, Sharp said. He feared that the 2nd Battalion would be making inquiries about their lost riflemen. They might not care that Lieutenant Sharp was missing, but the absence of several prime marksmen would definitely be regretted. My dear Richard, Hogan said. If you think Sir Arthur is going to lose even a few good riflemen, then you don't know him half as well as you think. He'll move hell and high water to keep you here, and you and I have to move like hell to get to Pondinova before anyone else. Sharp grimaced. The French have a day's start on us. No, they don't. Like fools, they went towards Amarante, which means they didn't know that the Portuguese had recaptured it. By now they'll have discovered their predicament, but I doubt they'll start north till dawn. If we hurry, we beat them. He frowned, looking down at the map. There's only one real problem I can see, other than finding Mr. Christopher when we get there. A problem? I can find my way to Pontinova from Braga, Hogan said. But what if the French are already on the Braga road? We'll have to take to the hills, and it's wild country, Richard, an easy place to get lost. We need a guide, and we need to find him fast. Sharp grinned. If you don't mind travelling with a Portuguese officer, who thinks he's a philosopher and a poet, then I think I know just the man. I'm Irish, Hogan said. There's nothing we love more than philosophy and poetry. He's a lawyer, too. If he gets us to Pontinova, Hogan said, then God will doubtless forgive him for that. The women's laughter was loud, but it was time to end the party. It was time for a dozen of Sharp's best men to mend their boots and fill their cartridge boxes. It was time for revenge. Chapter 10 Kate sat in a corner of the carriage and wept. The carriage was going nowhere. It was not even a proper carriage, not half as comfortable as the Kinter's fragile gig that had been abandoned in a porto and nothing like as substantial as the one her mother had taken south across the river in March. And how Kate now wished she'd gone with her mother. But instead she'd been stricken by romance, and certain that love's fulfilment would bring her golden skies, clear horizons, and endless joy. Instead she was in a two-wheeled Porto hackney, with a leaking leather roof, cracked springs, and a broken-down gelding between its shafts and the carriage was going nowhere because the fleeing French army was stuck on the road to Amaranti. Rain seethed on the roof, streaked the windows, and dripped onto Kate's lap. And she didn't care. She just hunched in the corner and wept. The door was tugged open, and Christopher put his head in. There are going to be some bangs, he told her, but there's no need to be alarmed. He paused, decided he could not cope with her sobbing, so just closed the door. Then he jerked it open again. They're disabling the guns. 
he explained. That's what the noise will be. Kate could not have cared less. She wondered what would become of her, and the awfulness of her prospects was so frightening that she burst into fresh tears just as the first guns were fired muzzle to muzzle. On the morning after the fall of Oporto, Marshal Soult had been woken to the appalling news that the Portuguese army had retaken Amarante, and that the only bridge by which he could carry his guns, limbers, caissons, wagons, and carriages back to the French fortresses in Spain was therefore in enemy hands. One or two hotheads had suggested fighting their way across the river Tamega, but scouts reported that the Portuguese were occupying Amarante in force, that the bridge had been mined, and had a dozen guns now dominating its roadway, that it would take a day of bitter and bloody fighting to get across, and even then there would probably be no bridge left, for the Portuguese would doubtless blow it. And Soult did not have a day. Sir Arthur Wellesley would be advancing from Oporto, so that left him only one option which was to abandon all the army's wheeled transport, every wagon, every limber, every caisson, every carriage, every mobile forge, and every gun. They would all have to be left behind, and twenty thousand men, five thousand camp followers, four thousand horses, and almost as many mules must do their best to scramble over the mountains. But Soult was not going to leave the enemy good French guns to turn against him, and so the weapons were each loaded with four pounds of powder, were double-shotted and placed muzzle to muzzle. Gunners struggled to keep their port fires alight in the rain, and then, on a word of command, touched the two reed fuses, and the powder flashed down to the overcharged chambers. The guns fired into each other, leapt back in a wrenching explosion of smoke and flames, and then were left with ripped, torn barrels. Some of the gunners were weeping as they destroyed their weapons, while others just cursed as they used knives and bayonets to rip open the powder bags that were left to spoil in the rain. The infantry were ordered to empty their packs and haversacks of everything except food and ammunition. Some officers ordered inspections and insisted their men throw away the plunder of the campaign. Cutlery, candlesticks, plate, all had to be abandoned by the roadside as the army took to the hills. The horses, oxen, and mules that hauled the guns, carriages, and limbers were shot rather than be ceded to the enemy. The animals screamed and thrashed as they died. The wounded who could not walk were left in their wagons and given muskets so they could at least try to protect themselves against the Portuguese, who would find them soon enough, and then attempt to exact revenge on helpless men. Soult ordered the military chest, eleven great barrels of silver coins, put by the road so the men could help themselves to a handful apiece as they went past. The women hitched up their skirts, scooped up the coins, and walked with their men. The dragoons, hussars, and chasseurs led their horses. Thousands of men and women were climbing into the barren hills, leaving behind wagons loaded with bottles of wine, with port, with crosses of gold stolen from churches, and with ancestral paintings plundered from the walls of northern Portugal's big houses. The French had thought they'd conquered a country, that they were merely waiting for a few reinforcements to swell the ranks as they marched on Lisbon, and none understood why they were suddenly faced with disaster, or why King Nicolas was leading them on a shambolic retreat through torrential rain. If you stay here, Christopher told Kate, you'll be raped. I'd been raped, she wept, night after night. Oh, for God's sake, Kate! Christopher, dressed in civilian clothes, was standing by the carriage's open door, with rain dripping from the point of his cocked hat. I'm not leaving you here. He reached in, took her by the wrist, and despite her screams and struggles, hauled her from the carriage. Walk, damn you! He snarled, and dragged her across the verge and up the slope. She'd only been out of the carriage a few seconds, and already her blue hussar uniform, which Christopher had insisted she wore, was soaked through. This isn't the end, Christopher told her, his grip painful on her thin wrist. The reinforcements never arrived, that's all, but we'll be back. Kate, despite her misery, was struck by the we. Did he mean the two of them, or did he mean the French? I want to go home, she cried. Stop being tedious! Christopher snapped, and keep walking! He pulled her on. Her new leather sole boots slipped on the path. The French are going to win this war, Christopher insisted. He was no longer certain of that, but when he weighed the balances of power in Europe, he managed to convince himself that it was true. <laughs>
I want to go back to Porto. Kate sobbed. We can't. Why not? She tried to pull away from him, and though she could not loosen his grip, she did manage to bring him to a halt. Why not? she asked. We just can't, he said. Now come on. He tugged her into motion again, unwilling to tell her that he could not go back to a porto because that damned man Sharp was alive. Good Christ in his heaven, but the bastard was only an overage lieutenant, and one he had now learned who was up from the ranks. But Sharp knew too much that was damning to Christopher, and so the colonel would need to find a safe haven, from where, by the discreet methods that he knew so well, he could send a letter to London. Then, in quiet, he could judge from the reply whether London believed his story, that he'd been forced to demonstrate an allegiance to the French in order to engineer a mutiny that would have freed Portugal. And that story sounded convincing to him, except that Portugal was being freed anyway. But all was not lost. It would be his word against Sharp's, and Christopher, whatever else he might be, was a gentleman, and Sharp was most decidedly not. There would be the delicate problem, of course, of what to do with Kate if he was called back to London, but he could probably deny that the marriage had ever taken place. He would put reports of it down to Kate's vapours. Women were given to vapours. It was notorious. What had Shakespeare said? Frailty, thy name is woman. So he would truthfully claim that the gabbled service in Villa Real at Sedich's small church was not a proper marriage, and say that he'd undergone it solely to save Kate's blushes. It was a gamble, he knew, but he'd played cards long enough to know that sometimes the most outrageous gambles paid the biggest winnings. And if a gamble failed, and if he could not salvage his London career, then it probably wouldn't matter, for he clung to the belief that the French would surely win in the end, and he would be back in a porto where, for lack of any other knowledge, the lawyers must account him as Kate's husband, and he would be wealthy. Kate would come to terms with it. She would recover when she was restored, as she would be, to comfort and home. Thus far, it was true, she had been unhappy, her joy at the marriage turning to horror in the bedroom. But young mares often rebelled against the bridal, yet after a whipping or two became docile and obedient, and Christopher wished that outcome for Kate, because her beauty still thrilled him. He dragged her on to where Williamson, now Christopher's servant, held his horse. Get on its back! he ordered Kate. I want to go home, she said. Get up! He almost hit her with the riding crop that was tucked under the saddle, but then she meekly let him help her onto the horse. Hold on to the reins, Williamson, Christopher ordered. He did not want Kate turning the horse and kicking it away westwards. Hold them tight, man! Yes, sir, Williamson said. He was still in his rifleman's uniform, though he'd exchanged his shako for a wide-brimmed leather hat. He had picked up a French musket, a pistol, and a sabre in the retreat from a porto, and the weapons made him look formidable, an appearance that was a comfort to Christopher. The colonel had needed a servant after his own had fled, but he wanted a bodyguard even more, and Williamson played the role superbly. He told Christopher tales of tavern brawls, of wild fights with knives and clubs, of bare-fisted boxing bouts, and Christopher lapped it up almost as eagerly as he listened to Williamson's bitter complaints about Sharp. In return, Christopher had promised Williamson a golden future. Learn French, he had advised the deserter, and you can join their army. Show that you're good and they'll give you a commission. They ain't particular in the French army. And if I wants to stay with you, sir, Williamson had asked. I was always a man to reward loyalty, Williamson, Christopher had said. And so the two suited each other, even if for now their fortunes were at a low ebb. As with thousands of other fugitives, they climbed into the rain, were buffeted by the wind, and saw nothing ahead but the hunger, bleak slopes, and wet rocks of the Serra de Santa Catalina. Behind them, on the road from Aporto to Amaranti, a sad trail of abandoned carriages and wagons stood in the downpour. The wounded French watched anxiously, praying that the pursuing British would appear before the peasants. But the peasants were closer than the redcoats, much closer, and soon their dark shapes were seen flitting in the rain, and in their hands were bright knives. And in the rain the wounded men's muskets would not fire. And so the screaming began. Sharp would have liked to take Hackman on his pursuit of Christopher, but the old poacher was not fully recovered from his chest wound, and so Sharp was forced to leave him behind. He took twelve men, 
his fittest and cleverest, and all complained vehemently when they were rousted out into a porter's rain before dawn, because their bellies were sour with wine, their heads sore and their tempers short. But not as short as mine, Sharp warned them, so don't make such a damn fuss. Hogan came with them, as did Lieutenant Vicente and three of his men. Vicente had learned that three mail carriages were going to Braga at first light, and told Hogan that the vehicles were notoriously fast and would be travelling on a good road. The drivers, carrying sacks of mail that had been waiting for the French to leave before they could be delivered to Braga, happily made room for the soldiers who collapsed on the mail sacks and fell asleep. They passed through the remnants of the city's northern defences in the wet half-light of dawn. The road was good, but the mail coaches were slowed because partisans had felled trees across the highway, and each barricade took a half hour or more to clear. If the French had known Amaranti had fallen, Hogan told Sharp, they'd have retreated on this road and would never have caught them. Mind you, we don't know that their Braga garrison has left for the rest. It had, and the mail arrived along with a troop of British cavalry who were welcomed by cheering inhabitants whose joy could not be dampened by the rain. Hogan, in his engineer's blue coat, was mistaken for a French prisoner, and some horse dung was thrown at him, before Vicente managed to persuade the crowd that Hogan was English. Irish! Hogan protested. Please! Same thing, Vicente said absent-mindedly. Good God in his heaven! Harper said, disgusted, then laughed because the crowd insisted on carrying Hogan on their shoulders. The main road from Braga went north across the frontier to Pontevedra but to the east a dozen tracks climbed into the hills, and one of them, Vicente promised, would take them all the way to Pontinova. But it was the same road that the French would be trying to reach, and so he warned Sharp that they might have to take to the trackless hills. If we are lucky, Vicente said, we shall be at the bridge in two days. And how long to the Saltador? Hogan asked. Another half day? And how long will it take the French? Three days, Vicente said. It must take them three days. He made the sign of the cross. I pray it takes them three days. They spent the night in Braga. Her cobbler repaired their boots, insisting he would take no money, and he used his best leather to make new soles that were studded with nails to give some grip in the wet high ground. He must have worked all night, for in the morning he shyly presented Sharp with leather covers for the rifles and muskets. The weapons had been protected from the rain by corks shoved into their muzzles, and by ragged clouts wrapped about the locks, but the leather sheaths were far better. The cobbler had greased the seams with sheep fat to make the covers waterproof, and Sharp, like his men, was absurdly pleased with the gift. They were given so much food that they ended up giving most of it to a priest who promised to distribute it among the poor. And then, in the rain-lashed dawn, they marched. Hogan rode, because the mayor of Braga had presented him with a mule, a sure-footed beast with a vile temper and a wall eye, which Hogan saddled with a blanket and then rode with his feet almost touching the ground. He suggested using the mule to carry their weapons, but of all the party he was the oldest and the least spry, and so Sharp insisted he ride. I've no idea what we'll find, Hogan told Sharp as they climbed into the rock-strewn hills. If the bridge at Pontinova has been blown, as it should have been by now, then the French will scatter. They'll just be running for their lives, and will be hard put to find Mr. Christopher in all that chaos. Still, we must try. And if it hasn't been blown? We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, Hogan said, and laughed. Ah, Jesus, I do hate this rain. Have you ever tried taking snuff in the rain, Richard? It's like sniffing up cap vomit. They walked eastwards through a wide valley edged by high, pale hills that were crowned with grey boulders. The road lay to the south of the river Cavado, which ran clear and deep through rich pastureland that had been plundered by the French, so that no cattle or sheep grazed the spring grass. The villages had once been prosperous, but were now almost deserted, and the few folk who remained were wary. Hogan, like Vicente and his men, wore blue, and that was also the colour of the enemy's coats while the riflemen's green jackets could be mistaken for the uniforms of dismounted French dragoons. Most people, if they expected anything, thought the British wore red, and so Sergeant Macedo, anticipating the confusion, had found a Portuguese flag in Braga, that he carried on a pole hacked from an ash tree. <laughs>
The flag showed a wreathed crest of Portugal surmounted by a great golden crown, and it reassured those folk who recognized the emblem. Not all did, but once the villagers had spoken with Vicente, they couldn't do enough for the soldiers. For God's sake, Sharp told Vicente, tell them to hide their wine. They're friendly, sure enough, Harper said as they left another small settlement where the dung heaps were bigger than the cottages. Not like the Spanish, they could be cold. Not all of them, but some were bastards. The Spanish don't like the English, Hogan told him. They don't like the English? Harper asked, surprised. So they're not bastards after all, then, eh? Just wary. But are you saying, sir, that the Portuguese do like the English? The Portuguese, Hogan said, hate the Spanish. And when you have a bigger neighbour whom you detest, then you look for a big friend to help you. So who's Ireland's big friend, sir? God, Sergeant. Hogan said. God! Dear Lord above, Harper said piously, staring into the rainy sky. For Christ's sake, wake up! Why don't you fight for the bloody French? Harris snarled. Enough! Sharp snapped. They marched in silence for a while. Then Vicente could not contain his curiosity. If the Irish hate the English, he asked, why do they fight for them? Harper chuckled at the question. Hogan raised his eyes to the grey heavens, and Sharp just scowled. The road, now that they were far from Braga, was less well maintained. Grass grew down its centre between ruts made by ox carts. The French had not scavenged this far, and there were a few flocks of bedraggled sheep and some small herds of cattle. But as soon as a herdsman or shepherd saw the soldiers, he hustled his beasts away. Vicente was still puzzled, and, having failed to elicit an answer from his companions, tried again. I really do not understand, he said in a very earnest voice, why the Irish would fight for the English king. Harris drew a breath as if to reply, but one savage look from Sharp made him change his mind. Harper began to whistle over the hills and far away, then could not help laughing at the strained silence that was at last broken by Hogan. It's hunger, the engineer explained to Vicente. Hunger and poverty and desperation. And because there's precious little work for a good man at home. And because we've always been a people that enjoy a good fight. Vicente was intrigued by the answer. And that is true for you, Captain? He asked. Not for me, Hogan allowed. My family's always had some money. Not much, but we never had to scratch in thin soil to raise our daily bread. No... I joined the army because I like being an engineer. I like practical things, and this was the best way to do what I liked. But someone like Sergeant Harper. He glanced at Harper. I dare say he's here because he'd be starving otherwise. True, Harper said. And you'll hate the English? Vicente asked Harper. Careful, Sharp growled. I hate the bloody ground the bastards walk on, sir. Harper said cheerfully, then saw Vicente cast a bewildered glance at Sharp. I didn't say I hated them all, Harper added. Life is complicated, Hogan said vaguely. I mean, there's a Portuguese legion in the French army, I hear. Vicente looked embarrassed. They believe in French ideas, sir. Ah, ideas, Hogan said. They're much more dangerous than big or little neighbors. I don't believe in fighting for ideas. He shook his head ruefully. And nor does Sergeant Harper. He don't? Harper asked. No, you bloody don't, Sharp snarled. So what do you believe in? Vicente wanted to know. The Trinity, sir, Harper said sententiously. The Trinity? Vicente was surprised. The Baker Rifle, Sharp said, the Sword Bernet, and me. Those two! Harper acknowledged and laughed. What it is, Hogan tried to help Vicente, is that it's like being in a house where there's an unhappy marriage and you ask a question about fidelity. You cause embarrassment. No one wants to talk about it. Harris? Sharp warned, seeing the red-headed rifleman open his mouth. I was only going to say, sir, Harris said, that there's a dozen horsemen on that hill over there. Sharp turned just in time to see the horsemen vanish across the crest. The rain was too thick, and the light too poor to see if they were in uniform. 
but Hogan suggested the French might well have sent cavalry patrols far ahead of their retreat. They'll be wanting to know whether we've taken Braga, he explained, because if we hadn't, then they'd turn this way and try to escape up to Pontevedra. Sharp gazed at the far hill. If there's bloody cavalry about, he said, then I don't want to be caught on the road. It was the one place in a nightmare landscape where horsemen would have an advantage. So, to avoid enemy horsemen, they struck north into the wilderness. It meant crossing the Cavada, which they managed at a deep ford, which led only to the high summer pastures. Sharp continually looked behind, but saw no sign of the horsemen. The path climbed into a wild land. The hills were steep, the valleys deep, and the high ground bare of anything except gorse, ferns, thin grass, and vast rounded boulders, some balanced on others so precariously that they looked as if a child's touch would send them bounding down the precipitous slopes. The grass was fit only for a few tangle-haired sheep, and scores of feral goats on which the mountain wolves and wild lynx fed. The only village they passed was a poor place with high rock walls about its small vegetable gardens. Goats were hobbled on pastures the size of inn-yards, and a few bony cattle stared at the soldiers as they passed. They climbed still higher, listening to the goat bells among the rocks, and passing a small shrine heaped with faded gorse blossom. Vicente crossed himself as he passed the shrine. They turned eastwards again, following a stony ridge where the great rounded boulders would make it impossible for any cavalry to form and charge, and Sharp kept watching southwards and saw nothing. Yet there had been horsemen, and there would be more, for he was making a rendezvous with a desperate army that had been bounced from imminent success to abject defeat in one swift day. It was hard travelling in the hills. They rested every hour, then trudged on. All were soaked, tired, and chilled. The rain was relentless, and the wind had now gone into the east so that it came straight into their faces. The rifle slings rubbed their wet shoulders raw, but at least the rain lifted that afternoon, even if the wind stayed brisk and cold. At dusk, feeling as weary as he ever had on the terrible retreat to Vigo, Sharp led them down from the ridge to a small deserted hamlet of low stone cottages roofed with turf. Just Lake Home, Harper said happily. The driest places to sleep were two long coffin shaped granaries that protected their contents from rats by being raised on mushroom shaped stone pillars. And most of the men crammed themselves into the narrow spaces while Sharp, Hogan, and Vicente shared the least damaged cottage where Sharp conjured a fire from damp kindling and brewed tea. The most essential skill of a soldier, Hogan said, when Sharp brought him the tea. What's that? Vicente asked, ever eager to learn his new trade. Making fire from wet wood, Hogan said. Aren't you supposed to have a servant? Sharp asked. I am, but so are you, Richard. I'm not one for servants, Sharp said. Nor am I, Hogan said. But you've done a grand job with that tea, Richard, and if His Majesty ever decides he doesn't want a London rogue to be one of his officers, then I'll give you a job as a servant. Pickets were set, more tea brewed, and moist tobacco coaxed delight in clay pipes. Hogan and Vicente began an impassioned argument about a man called Hume, of whom Sharp had never heard, and who turned out to be a dead Scottish philosopher. But, as it seemed, the dead Scotsman had proposed that nothing was certain, Sharp wondered why anyone bothered to read him, let alone argue about him. Yet the notion diverted Hogan and Vicente. Sharp, bored with the talk, left them to their debate and went to inspect the pickets. It started to rain again. Then peals of thunder shook the sky and lightning whipped into the high rocks. Sharp crouched with Harris and Perkins in a cave-like shrine where some faded flowers lay in front of a sad-looking statue of the Virgin Mary. Jesus bloody wept, Harper announced himself as he splashed through the downpour. And we could be tucked up with those ladies in a porto. He crammed himself in beside the three men. I didn't know you were here, sir, he said. I brought the boys some packet juice. He had a wooden canteen of hot tea. Jesus, he went on. You can't see a bloody thing out there. Were they like home, Sergeant? Perkins asked. What would you know, lad? In Donegal now, the sun never stops shining. The women all say yes, and both the gamekeepers have wooden legs. He gave Perkins the canteen and peered into the wet dark. How are we going to find your fellow in this, sir? God knows if we do, 
Does it matter now? I want my telescope back. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Harper said. You're going to wander into the middle of the French army and ask for it. Something like that, Sharp said. All day he'd been besieged by a sense of the futility of the effort, but that was no reason not to make the effort, and it seemed right to him that Christopher should be punished. Sharp believed that a man's loyalties were at his roots, that they were immovable, but Christopher evidently believed they were negotiable. That was because Christopher was clever and sophisticated, and if Sharp had his way, he would soon be dead. The dawn was cold and wet. They climbed back up to the boulder-strewn heights, leaving behind the valley which was filled with mist. The rain was soft now, but still in their faces. Sharp led and saw nobody, and still saw nobody, even when a musket banged and a cloud of smoke blossomed beside a rock, and he dived for cover as the bullet smacked on a boulder and whined into the sky. Everyone else sheltered, except for Hogan, who was stranded on his ugly mule, but Hogan had the presence of mind to shout. English, he called. English. He was half on and half off the mule, fearing another bullet, but hoping his claim to be English would prevent it. A figure in ragged goatskins appeared from behind the rock. The man had a vast beard, no teeth and a wide grin. Vicente called to him, and the two had a rapid conversation, at the end of which Vicente turned to Hogan. He calls himself Javali, and says he is sorry, but he did not know we were friends. He asks you to forgive him. Javali? Hogan asked. It means wild boar, Vicente sighed. Every man in this countryside gives himself a nickname and looks for a Frenchman to kill. There's just one of him, Sharp asked. Just the one. Then he's either bloody stupid or bloody brave, Sharp said then succumbed to an embrace from Javali and a gust of foul-smelling breath. The man's musket looked ancient. The wooden stock, which was bound to the barrel by old-fashioned iron hoops, was split, and the hoops themselves were rusted and loose. But Javali had a canvas bag filled with loose powder and an assortment of differently-sized musket balls, and he insisted on accompanying them when he learned there might be Frenchmen to kill. He had a wicked-looking curved knife stuck into his belt, and a small axe hanging by a fraying piece of string. Sharp walked on. Javali talked incessantly, and Vicente translated some of his story. His real name was Andrea, and he was a goatherd from Boro. He'd been an orphan since he was six, and thought he was now twenty-five years old, though he looked much older, and he worked for a dozen families by protecting their animals from lynx and wolves. And he had lived with a woman, he said proudly, but the dragoons had come and they had raped her when he wasn't there, and his woman had possessed a temper, he said, worse than a goat's, and she must have drawn a knife on her rapists, for they had killed her. Javali did not seem very upset by his woman's death, but he was still determined to avenge her. He patted the knife and then tapped his groin to show what he had in mind. Javali at least knew the quickest ways through the high ground, they were travelling well to the north of the road they'd left when Harris spotted the horsemen, and that road led through the wide valley that now narrowed as it went eastwards. The Cavado twisted beside the road, sometimes vanishing in stands of trees, while streams fed by the rain tumbled from the hills to swell the river. Vicente's estimate of two days was ruined by the weather, and they spent the next night high in the hills, half protected from the rain by the great boulders, and in the morning they walked on, and Sharp saw how the river valley had nearly narrowed to nothing. By mid-morning they were overlooking Salamonde, and then, looking back up the valley, where the last of the morning mist was vanishing, they saw something else. They saw an army. It came in a swarm along the road, and in the fields either side of the road, a great spread of men and horses in no particular order, a horde that was trying to escape from Portugal and from the British army that was now pursuing them from Braga. They have to hurry, Hogan said. It'll take them hours to get up that road, Sharp said, nodding towards the village that was built where the valley finally narrowed into a defile, from where the road, instead of running on level land, twisted beside the river into the hills. For the moment the French could spread themselves in fields and march with a broad front, but once past Salamonde, they were restricted to the narrow and deep-rutted road. Sharp borrowed Hogan's good telescope and stared down at the French army. Some units, he could see, marched in good order, 
but most were straggling loosely. There were no guns, wagons, or carriages, so that if Marshal Soult did manage to escape, he would have to crawl back into Spain and explain to his master how he'd lost everything of value. There must be twenty, thirty thousand down there, he said in wonderment as he handed back Hogan's glass. It'll take them the best part of the day to get through that village. But they've got the devil on their heels, Hogan pointed out, and that encourages a man to swiftness. They pressed on. A weak sun at last lit the pale hills, though grey showers fell to north and south. Behind them the French were a great dark mass, pressing up against the valley's narrow end, where, like grains of sand trickling through an hourglass, they streamed through Salamonde. Smoke rose from the village as the passing troops plundered and burned. The French road to safety began to climb now. It followed the defile made by the white-watered Cavado, which twisted out of the hills in great loops and sometimes leapt down series of precipices in misted waterfalls. A squadron of dragoons led the French retreat, riding ahead to smell out any partisans who might try to ambush the vast column. If the dragoons saw Hogan and his men high on the northern hills, they made no effort to reach them for the riflemen and Portuguese soldiers were too far away and much too high, and then the French had other things to worry about. For late in the afternoon the dragoons arrived at the Ponte Nova. Sharp was already above the Ponte Nova, gazing down at the bridge. It was here that the French retreat might be stopped, for the tiny village that clung to the high ground just beyond the bridge bristled with men, and on first seeing the Ponte Nova from high in the hills Hogan had been jubilant. We've done it, he said. We've done it. But then he trained his telescope on the bridge, and his good mood died. There are an answer, he said. Not a proper uniform there. He gazed for another minute. There's not a single bloody gun, he said bitterly, and the bloody fools haven't even destroyed the bridge. Sharp borrowed Hogan's glass to stare at the bridge. It possessed two hefty stone abutments, one on each bank, and the river was spanned by two great beams over which a wooden roadway had once been laid. The Ordonnanza, presumably not wanting to rebuild the bridge entirely once the French were defeated, had removed the plank roadway, but left the two enormous beams in place. Then, at the edge of the village on the bridge's eastern side, they'd dug trenches from which they could smother the half-dismantled bridge with musket fire. It might serve, Sharp grunted. And what would you do if you were the French? Hogan asked. Sharp stared down into the defile, then looked back westwards. He could see the dark snake of the French army coming along the road, but further back there was no sign yet of any British pursuit. Wait till dark, he said. Then attack across the beams. The ordinancer was enthusiastic, but it was little more than a rabble ill-armed and with scarce any training, and such troops might easily be panicked. Worse, there were not many ordinances at the Ponte Nova. There would have been more than enough if the bridge had been fully broken, but the twin beams were an invitation to the French. Sharp trained the telescope on the bridge again. Those beams are wide enough to walk on, he said. They'll attack in the night, hope to catch the defenders sleeping. Let's just hope the ordinances stay awake, Hogan said. He slid off the mule. And what we do, he said, is wait. Wait? If they're stopped here, Hogan explained, then this is as good a place as any to watch out for Mr. Christopher. And if they get across... He shrugged. I should go down there, Sharp said, and tell them to get rid of those beams. And how will they accomplish it? Hogan wanted to know. With dragoons firing at them from the other bank. The dragoons had dismounted and spread along the western bank, and Hogan could see the white puffs of their carbine smoke. It's too late to help, Richard, he said. Too late. You stay here. They made a rough camp in the boulders. Night fell swiftly because the rain had come again, and the clouds shrouded the setting sun. Sharp let his men light fires so they could brew tea. The French would see the fires, but that didn't matter for as the darkness shrouded the hills, a myriad flame showed in the high grounds. The partisans were gathering. They were coming from all across northern Portugal to help destroy the French army, an army that was cold, 
wet, hungry, bone weary, and trapped. Major Dulong still smarted from his defeat at Villarreal de Cedej. The bruise on his face had faded, but the memory of the repulse hurt. He sometimes thought of the rifleman who'd beaten him, and wished the man was in the thirty-first leger. He also wished that the thirty-first leger could be armed with rifles, but that was like wishing for the moon, because the emperor would not hear of rifles. Too fiddly, too slow. A woman's weapon, he said. Vive le fusil. Now, at the old bridge called Pontinova, where the French retreat was blocked, Dulong had been summoned to Marshal Soult, because the Marshal had been told that this was the best and bravest soldier in all his army. Dulong looked it, the Marshal thought, with his ragged uniform and scarred face. Dulong had taken the bright feather plume from his shako, wrapped it in oilcloth, and tied it to his sabre scabbard. He had hoped to wear that plume when his regiment marched into Lisbon, but it seemed that was not to be. Not this spring, anyway. Soult walked with Dulong up a small knoll from where they could see the bridge with its two beams, and see and hear the jeering ordinancer beyond. There are not many of them, Soult remarked. Three hundred? More, Dulong grunted. So how do you get rid of them? Dulong gazed at the bridge through a telescope. The beams were both about a meter wide, more than enough, though the rain would doubtless make them slippery. He raised the glass to see that the Portuguese had dug trenches from which they could fire directly along the beams. But the night would be dark, he thought, and the moon clouded. I would take a hundred volunteers, he said, fifty for each beam, and go at midnight. The rain was getting worse and the dusk was cold. The Portuguese muskets, Durong knew, would be soaked and the men behind them chilled to the bone. A hundred men, he promised the marshal, and the bridge is yours. Soult nodded. If you succeed, Major, he said, then send me word, but if you fail, I do not want to hear. He turned and walked away. Dulong went back to the 31st Leger, and he called for volunteers, and was not surprised when the whole regiment stepped forward. So he chose a dozen good sergeants, and let them pick the rest, and he warned them that the fight would be messy, cold, and wet. We will use the bayonet, he said, because the muskets won't fire in this weather. And besides, once you have fired one shot, you will not have time to reload. He thought about reminding them that they owed him a display of bravery, after their reluctance to advance into the rifle fire on the watchtower hill at Villa Real de Cedej, then decided they all knew that anyway, and so held his tongue. The French lit no fires. They grumbled, but Marshal Soult insisted. Across the river, the Ordinanza believed they were safe, and so they made a fire in one of the cottages, high above the bridge where their commanders could keep warm. The cottage had one small window, and just enough flame-light escaped through the unshuttered glass to reflect off the wet crossbeams that spanned the river. The feeble reflections shimmered in the rain, but they served as a guide for Dulong's volunteers. They went at midnight, two columns, fifty men in each, and Dulong told them they must run across the bridge, and he led the right-hand column, his sabre drawn, and the only sounds were the river hissing beneath, the wind shrieking in the rocks, the pounding of their feet, and a brief scream as one man slipped and fell into the cavado. Then Dulong was climbing the slope, and found the first trench empty, and he guessed the ordinanza had taken shelter in the small hovels that lay just beyond the second trench, and the fools had not even left a sentry by the bridge. Even a dog would have served to warn them of a French attack, but men and dogs alike were sheltering from the weather. Sergeant, the Major hissed, the houses, clean them out. The Portuguese were still asleep when the Frenchmen came. They arrived with bayonets and no mercy. The first two houses fell swiftly, their occupants killed scarcely before they were awake. But their screams alerted the rest of the ordinancer, who ran into the darkness to be met by the best-trained infantry in the French army. The bayonets did their work, and the cries of the victims completed the victory, because the survivors, confused and terrified by the terrible sounds in the dark night, fled. By a quarter past midnight, Durand was warming himself by the fire that had lit his way to victory. Marshal Soult took the medal of the Légion d'Honneur from his own coat and pinned it to the turnback of Major Durand's frayed jacket. Then, with tears in his eyes, the marshal kissed the major on both cheeks.
because the miracle had happened, and the first bridge belonged to the French. Kate wrapped herself in a damp saddle blanket, then stood beside her tired horse and watched dully as French infantry cut down pine trees, slashed off their branches, then carried the trimmed trunks to the bridge. More timber was fetched from the small cottages, and the ridge beams were just long enough to span the bridge's roadway. But it all took time, for the rough timbers had to be lashed together if the soldiers' horses and mules were to cross in safety. The soldiers, who were not working, huddled together against the rain and wind. It felt like winter suddenly. Musket shots sounded far away, and Kate knew it was the country people come to shoot at the hated invaders. A cantinière, one of the tough women who sold the soldiers coffee, tea, needles, thread, and dozens of other small comforts, took pity on Kate, and brought her a tin mug of lukewarm coffee laced with brandy. If they take much longer... She nodded at the soldiers rebuilding the bridge's roadway. We'll all be on our backs with an English dragoon on top, so at least we'll get something out of this campaign. She laughed and went back to her two mules which were laden with her wares. Kate sipped the coffee. She had never been so cold, wet or miserable, and she knew she only had herself to blame. Williamson stared at the coffee and Kate, unsettled by his gaze, moved to the far side of her horse. She disliked Williamson, disliked the hungry look in his eyes, and feared the threat in his naked desire of her. Were all men animals? Christopher, for all his elegant civility by day, liked to inflict pain at night. But then Kate remembered the single soft kiss that Sharp had given her, and she felt the tears come to her eyes. And Lieutenant Vicente, she thought, was a gentleman. Christopher liked to say how there were two sides in the world, just as there were black pieces and white pieces on a chessboard, and Kate knew she had chosen the wrong side. Worse, she didn't know how she was to find her way back to the right one. Christopher strode back down the stalled column. Is that coffee? he asked cheerfully. Good. I need something warming. He took the mug from her, drained it, then tossed it away. Another few minutes, my dear, he said, and we'll be on our way. One more bridge after this, then we'll be over the hills and far away in Spain. You'll have a proper bed again, eh? And a bath. How are you feeling? Cold. Hard to believe it's May, eh? Worse than England. Still, don't they say rain's good for the complexion? You'll be prettier than ever, my dearest. He paused as some muskets sounded from the west. The noise rattled loud for a few seconds, echoing back and forth between the defiled steep sides, then faded. Chasing off bandits, Christopher said. It's too soon for the pursuit to catch us up. I pray they do catch us, Kate said. Don't be ridiculous, my dear. Besides, we've got a brigade of good infantry and a pair of cavalry regiments as rearguard. We? Kate asked indignantly. I'm English. Christopher gave her a long-suffering smile. As am I, dearest. But what we want above all is peace, peace, and perhaps this retreat will be just the thing to persuade the French to leave Portugal alone. That's what I'm working on, peace. There was a pistol holstered in Christopher's saddle just behind Kate, and she was tempted to pull the weapon free, thrust it into his belly and pull the trigger. But she'd never fired a gun, didn't know if the long-barreled pistol was loaded, and besides, what would happen to her if Christopher were not here? Williamson would maul her, she thought, and for some reason she remembered the letter she had succeeded in leaving for Lieutenant Sharp, putting it on the House Beautiful's mantle without Christopher seeing what she was doing. She thought now what a stupid letter it was. What was she trying to tell Sharp? And why him? What did she expect him to do? She stared up the far hill. There were men on the high crest line, and Christopher turned to see what she was looking at. More of the scum, he said. Patriots, Kate insisted. Peasants with rusted muskets, Christopher said acidly, who torture their prisoners and have no idea, none, what principles are at stake in this war. They are the forces of old Europe, he insisted, superstitious and ignorant, the enemies of progress. He grimaced, then unbuckled one of his saddlebags to make sure that his black-fronted red uniform jacket was inside. 
If the French were forced to surrender, then that coat was his passport. He would take to the hills, and if any partisans accosted him, he would persuade them he was an Englishman escaping from the French. We're moving, sir, Williamson said. Bridge is up, sir. He knuckled his forehead to Christopher, then turned his leering face on Kate. Help you onto the horse, ma'am. I can manage, Kate said coldly. But she was forced to drop the damp blanket to climb into the saddle, and she knew that both Christopher and Williamson were staring at her legs in their tight hussar breeches. A cheer came from the bridge as the first cavalrymen led their horses over the precarious roadway. The sun prompted the infantry to stand, pick up their muskets and packs, and shuffle towards the makeshift crossing. One more bridge, Christopher assured Kate, and we're safe. Just one more bridge, the Leaper, and above them, high in the hills, Richard Sharp was already marching towards it, towards the last bridge in Portugal. The Saltador. Chapter Eleven. It had been at dawn that Sharp and Hogan saw their fears were realised. Several hundred French infantry were across the Ponte Nova. The Ordinanza were nothing but bodies in a plundered village, and energetic work parties were remaking the roadway across the Cavado's white water. The long and winding defile echoed with sporadic musket shots as Portuguese peasants, attracted to the beleaguered army like ravens to meat, took long-range shots. Sharp saw a hundred voltigeurs in open order climb a hill to drive off one brave band that had dared to approach within two hundred paces of the stalled column. There was a flurry of shots. The French skirmishers scoured the hill and then trudged back to the crowded road. There was no sign of any British pursuit. But Hogan guessed that Wellesley's army was still a half day's march behind the French. He won't have followed the French directly, he explained. He won't have crossed the Serra de Santa Catalina like they did. He'll have stayed on the roads. So he went to Braga first, and now he's marching eastwards. As for us, he stared down at the captured bridge. We'd best shift ourselves to the Saltador, he said grimly, because it's our last chance. To Sharp, it seemed there was no chance at all. More than twenty thousand French fugitives darkened the valley beneath him, and Christopher was lost somewhere in that mass. And how Sharp was ever to find the renegade, he did not know. But he pulled on his threadbare coat and picked up his rifle and followed Hogan, who Sharp saw was similarly pessimistic, while Harper perversely was oddly cheerful. Even when they had to wade through a tributary of the Cavado, which ran waist deep through a steep defile which fell towards the larger river, Hogan's mule balked at the cold, fast water, and the captain proposed abandoning the animal. But then Javali smacked the beast hard across the face, and while it was still blinking, picked it up and carried it bodily through the wide stream. The rifleman cheered the display of strength. While the mule, safe on the opposite bank, snapped its yellow teeth at the goat herd, who simply smacked it again. Useful like that, Harper said approvingly. The big Irish sergeant was soaked to the skin, and as cold and tired as any of the other men, but he seemed to relish the hardship. That's no worse than herding back home, he maintained as they trudged on. I remember once my uncle was taking a flock of mutton, pray meet the lot of them. Walking them on the hoof to Belfast, and half the boggers ran like shake when we'd not even got to Letter Kenny. Jesus, all that money gone to waste! Did you get them back? Perkins asked. You're joking, lad. I searched half the bloody night, and all I got was a clip round the ear from my uncle. My dear, was his fault. He'd never heard it so much as a rabbit before, and didn't know one end of his sheep from the other. But he was told there was good cash for mutton in Belfast. So he stole the flock off a skinflint in Colcarney and set off to make his fortune. Do you have wolves in Ireland? Vicente wanted to know. And red coats, Harper said, and saw Sharp scowl. May grandfather now, he went on hurriedly, claim to see a pack of them at Derry in a grail. Big they were, he said, and with red eyes and teeth like graveyard stones. And he told my grandmother that they chased him all the way to the Glenlohill Bridge. But he was a drunk. Jesus, he could soak the stuff up. Javali wanted to know what they were talking about, and immediately had his own tales of wolves attacking his goats 
and how he'd fought one with nothing but a stick and a sharp-edged stone. And then he claimed to have raised a wolf cub, and told how the village priest had insisted on killing it, because the devil lived in wolves. And Sergeant Macedo said that was true, and described how a sentry at Almeida had been eaten by wolves one cold winter's night. Do you have wolves in England? Vicente asked Sharp. Only lawyers. Richard! Hogan chided him. They were going north now. The road that the French would use from Ponte Nova to the Spanish frontier twisted into the hills until it met another tributary of the Cavado, the Mizarella, and the Saltador Bridge crossed the upper reaches of that river. Sharp would rather have gone down to the road and marched ahead of the French, but Hogan would not hear of it. The enemy, he said, would put dragoons across the Cavado as soon as the bridge was repaired, and the road was no place to be caught by horsemen and so they stayed in the high ground that became ever more rugged, stony, and difficult. Their progress was painfully slow, because they were forced to make long detours when precipices or slopes of scree barred their way, and for every mile they went forward they had to walk three, and Sharp knew the French were now advancing up the valley and gaining fast, for their progress was signalled by scattered musket shots from the hills about the Miserella's defile. Those shots, fired at too long a range by men activated by hatred, sounded closer and closer, until at mid-morning the French came into view. A hundred dragoons led, but not far behind them was infantry, and these men were not a panicked rabble, but marching in good order. Javali, the moment he saw them, growled incoherently, grabbed a handful of powder from his bag, half of which he spilled as he tried to push it into his musket's barrel. He rammed down a bullet, primed his musket, and shot into the valley. It was not apparent that he hit an enemy, but he gave a small, joyful shuffle, and then loaded the musket again. You were right, Richard, Hogan said ruefully. We should have used the road. The French were overtaking them now. You were right, sir, Sharp said. People like him, he jerked his head towards the wild-bearded javelin, would have been taking shots at us all morning. Maybe. Hogan said. He swayed on the mule's back, then glanced down again at the French. Pray the Saltida has been broken, he said, but he didn't sound hopeful. They had to clamber down into a saddle of the hills, then climb again to another hog-backed ridge littered with the massive rounded boulders. They lost sight of the fast-flowing Miserella and of the French on the road beside it but they could hear the occasional flurry of musket shots which told of partisans sniping into the valley. God grant the Portuguese have got to the bridge, Hogan said for the tenth or twentieth time since dawn. If all had gone well, then the Portuguese forces advancing northwards in parallel to Sir Arthur Wellesley's army should have blocked the French at Rui Vainch, so cutting the last eastwards road to Spain, and then sent a brigade into the hills to plug the final escape route at the Saltador. If all had gone well, the Portuguese should now be barring the mountain road with cannon and infantry. But the weather had slowed their march, as it had slowed Wellesley's pursuit, and the only men waiting for Marshal Soult at the Saltador were more ordinanza. There were over a thousand of them, half-trained and ill-armed, but an English major from the Portuguese staff had ridden ahead to give them advice. His strongest recommendation was to destroy the bridge, but many of the ordinanza came from the hard frontier hills, and the soaring arch across the Miserella was the lifeline of their commerce, and so they refused to heed Major War's advice. Instead, they compromised by knocking off the bridge's parapets and narrowing its roadway by breaking the roadway's stones with great sledgehammers, but they insisted on leaving a slim strip of stone to leap the deep ravine, and to defend the ribbon-like arch they barricaded the northern side of the bridge with an abachish made from thorn bushes, and behind that formidable obstacle, and on either side of it, they scraped earthworks behind which they could shelter as they fired at the French with ancient muskets and fowling guns. There was no artillery. The strip of bridge that remained was just wide enough to let a farm cart across the river's ravine. It meant that once the French were gone, the valley's commerce could resume while the roadway and parapets were rebuilt. But to the French, that narrow strip would mean only one thing. Safety. Hogan was the first to see that the bridge was not fully destroyed. He climbed off the mule and swore viciously, then handed Sharp his telescope, and Sharp stared down at the bridge's remnants. Musket smoke already shrouded both banks, 
as the dragoons of the French vanguard fired across the ravine, and the ordinancer in their makeshift redoubt shot back. The sound of the muskets was faint. They'll get across, Hogan said sadly. They'll lose a lot of men, but they'll clear that bridge. Sharp did not answer. Hogan was right, he thought. The French were making no effort to take the bridge now, but doubtless they were assembling an assault party, and that meant he would have to find a place from where his riflemen could shoot at Christopher as he crossed the narrow stone arch. There was nowhere on this side of the river, but on the Miserella's opposite bank there was a high stone bluff where a hundred or more Udenanza were stationed. The bluff had to be less than two hundred paces from the bridge, too far for the Portuguese muskets, but it would provide a perfect vantage for his rifles, and if Christopher reached the centre of the bridge, he'd be greeted by a dozen rifle bullets. The problem was reaching the bluff. It was not far away, perhaps a half mile, but between Sharp and that enticing high ground was the Miserella. We had to cross that river, Sharp said. How long will that take? Hogan asked. As long as it takes, Sharp said. We don't have a choice. The musketry grew in intensity, crackling like burning thorn, then fading before bursting back into life. The dragoons were crowding the southern bank to swamp the defenders with fire, but Sharp could do nothing to help. So, for the moment, he walked away. In the valley of the Cavado, just twelve miles from the advance guard that fought the Ordinanza across the ravine of the Miserella, the first British troops caught up with Soult's rearguard, which protected the men and women still crossing the Ponte Nova. The British troops were light dragoons, and they could do little more than exchange carbine fire with the French troops, who were drawn across the road to fill the valley between the river and the southern cliffs. But not far behind the dragoons, the brigade of guards was marching, and behind them was a pair of three-pounder cannons, guns that fired shots so light that they were derided as toys. But on this day, when no one else could deploy artillery, the two toys were worth their weight in gold. The French rearguard waited, while a dozen miles away the vanguard readied to attack the Saltador. Two battalions of infantry would assault the bridge, but it was plain that they would become mincemeat if the thick barrier of thorn were not removed from the bridge's far end. The abachish was four feet high, and just as thick, and made from two dozen thorn bushes that had been tied together and weighted down with logs and it made a formidable obstacle. And so a forlorn hope was proposed. A forlorn hope was a company of men who were expected to die, but in doing so they would clear a path for their comrades, and usually such suicidal bands were deployed against the heavily defended breaches of enemy fortresses. But today's band must cross the narrow remnant of a bridge and die under the flail of musket fire, and as they died they were to clear away the thorn abachish. Major Doulon of the 31st Léger, the new Légion d'Honneur medal still bright on his chest, volunteered to lead the forlorn hope. This time he could not use darkness, and the enemy was far more numerous, but his hard face showed no apprehension as he pulled on a pair of gloves and then twisted the loops of his sabre cords about his wrist so that he would not lose the weapon in the chaos he anticipated as the thorns were wrenched aside. General Loison, who commanded the French vanguard, ordered every available man to the riverbank to swamp the Ordinanza with musket, carbine, and even pistol fire. And when the noise had swelled to a deafening intensity, Doulon raised his sabre, then swung it forward as a signal to advance. The skirmishing company of his own regiment ran across the bridge. Three men could just go abreast on the narrow ribbon of stone, and Doulon was in the very first rank. The Ordinanza roared their defiance, and a volley blasted from the closest earthwork. Dulong was hit in the chest. He heard the bullet strike his new medal, and then distinctly heard the snap as a rib broke, and he knew the bullet must be in his lung. But he felt no pain. He tried to shout, but his breath was very short. Yet he began hauling at the thorns with his gloved hands. More men came, cramming themselves on the bridge's thin roadway. One slipped and fell screaming into the white tumult of the Miserella. Bullets smacked into the forlorn hope. The air was nothing but smoke and splintering noise and hissing bullets. But then Dulon managed to pitch a whole section of the Abachish into the river, and there was a gap wide enough to let a man through and big enough to save a trapped army. And he staggered through it, sabre raised, spitting bubbles of blood as his breath laboured. A huge shout came from behind him,
as the first of the support battalions ran towards the bridge with fixed bayonets. Two long surviving men cleared away the last of the Thorn Abachish. A dozen dead voltigeurs were unceremoniously kicked over the roadway's edge into the ravine, and suddenly the Saltador was dark with French troops. They screamed a war cry as they came, and the Ordonnancer, most of whom were still reloading after trying to stop Toulon's forlorn hope, now fled. Hundreds of men ran westwards, climbing into the hills to escape the bayonets. Dulon paused by the nearest abandoned earthwork, and there he bent over, his sabre dangling by the cords tied to his wrist, and a long dribble of mingled blood and saliva trickling from his mouth. He closed his eyes and tried to pray. A stretcher! a sergeant shouted. Make a stretcher! Find a doctor! Two French battalions chased the ordinancer away from the bridge. A few Portuguese still lingered on a high rocky bluff to the left of the road, but they were too far away for their musket fire to be anything except a nuisance, and so the French let them stay there and watch an army escape. For Major Dulon had prized open the last jaws of the trap, and the road north was open. Sharp, up in the rough ground south of the Miserella, heard the furious musketry and knew the French must be assaulting the bridge. And he prayed the ordinancer would hold them, but he knew that they would fail. They were amateur soldiers, and the French were professional, and though men would die, the French would still cross the Miserella, and once the first troops were over, then the rest of their army would surely follow. So he had little time in which to cross the river, which tumbled white in its deep rocky ravine, and Sharp had to go more than a mile upstream before he found a place where they might just negotiate the steep slopes and rain-swollen water. The mule would have to be abandoned, for the ravine was so precipitous that not even Javali could manhandle the beast down the cliff and through the fast water. Sharp ordered his men to strip the slings off their rifles and muskets, then buckle or tie them together to make a long rope. Javali, eschewing such an aid, scrambled down to the Miserella, waded through, and began climbing the other side. But Sharp feared losing one of his men to a broken leg up in these hills, and so he went more slowly. The men eased themselves down, using the rope as a support, then passed down their weapons. The river was scarcely a dozen paces across, but it was deep, and its cold water tugged hard at Sharp's legs as he led the crossing. The rocks underfoot were slick and uneven. Tongue fell over and was swept a few yards downstream before he managed to haul himself onto the bank. Sorry, sir, he managed to say through chattering teeth as water drained from his cartridge box. It took over forty minutes for them all to cross the ravine and climb its other side, where from a peak of rock Sharp could just see the cloud-shadowed hills of Spain. They turned east towards the bridge just as it began to rain again. All morning the dark showers had slanted about them, but now one opened directly above them, and then a crash of thunder bellowed across the sky. Ahead, far off to the south, there was a patch of sunshine lightening the pale hills, but above Sharp the sky grew darker and the rain heavier, and he knew the rifles would have difficulty firing in such a teeming downpour. He said nothing. They were all cold and dispirited. The French were escaping, and Christopher might already be over the Miserella and on his way into Spain. To their left, the grass-grown road twisted up into the last Portuguese hills, and they could see dragoons and infantry slogging up the road's tortuous bends. But those men were a half-mile away, and the rocky bluff was just ahead. Javali was already on its summit, and he warned the remnants of the Ordinanza, who waited among the ferns and boulders, that the uniformed men who approached were friends. The Portuguese, whose muskets were useless in the heavy rain, had been reduced to throwing rocks that bounded down the bluff's eastern face and were nothing but a minor nuisance to the stream of French who crossed the thin lifeline across the Miserella. Sharp shrugged off the Ordinanza who wanted to welcome him and threw himself down on the bluff's lip. Rain thrashed the rocks, poured down the cliff's face and drummed on his shako. A crash of thunder sounded overhead to be echoed by another from the southwest and Sharp recognized the second peal as the sound of guns. It was cannon fire, and the noise meant that Sir Arthur Wellesley's army must have caught up with the French, and that his artillery had opened fire. But that fight was miles away, back beyond the Pontinova, 
and here, at the final obstacle, the French were escaping. Hogan, panting from the exertion of climbing the bluff, dropped beside Sharp. They were so close to the bridge they could see the moustaches on the faces of the French infantry. See the striped brown and black pattern of a woman's long skirt. She walked beside her man, carrying his musket and his child, and had a dog tied to her belt by a length of string. Behind them, an officer led a limping horse. Is that cannon I'm hearing? Hogan asked. Yes, sir. Must be the three pounders, Hogan guessed. We could do with a couple of those toys here. But they had none. Only Sharp, Vicenti, and their men. And an army that was escaping. Back at the Ponte Nova, the gunners had manhandled their two toy cannon to the crest of a knoll that overlooked the French rearguard. It was not raining here. An occasional flurry whipped down from the mountains, but the muskets could still fire, and a brigade of guards loaded their weapons, fixed bayonets, and then formed to advance in column of companies. And the guns, the despised three-pounders, opened on the French, and the small balls, scarcely bigger than an orange each, whipped through the tight ranks and bounced on rock to kill more Frenchmen. And the band of the Coldstream Guards struck up Rule Britannia, and the great colours were unfurled to the damp air, and the three-pound balls struck again, each shot leaving a long spray of blood in the air, as though a giant unseen knife were slashing through the French ranks. The two light companies of the guards, and a company of the green-jacketed 60th, the Royal American Rifles, were advancing among a jumble of rocks and low stone walls on the French left flank, and the muskets and Baker rifles began taking their toll of French officers and sergeants. French skirmishers, men from the renowned 4th Léger, a regiment chosen by Soult to guard his rear because the 4th was famous for its steadiness, ran forward to drive the British skirmishers back, but the rifles were too much for them. They had never faced such long-range accurate fire before, and the Voltigeur backed away. Take them forward, Campbell! Take them forward! Sir Arthur Wellesley called to the brigade's commander. And so the 1st Battalion of the Cold Streamers and the 1st Battalion of the 3rd Foot Guards marched towards the bridge. Their bearskins made them seem huge. The band's drummers thumped for all they were worth. The rifles snapped, and the two three-pounders crashed back onto their trails to cut two more bloody furrows through the long lines of Frenchmen. They're going to break, Colonel Waters said. He'd served as Sir Arthur's guide all day, and was watching the French rearguard through his glass. He could see them wavering, see the sergeants dashing back and forth behind the ranks to push men into file. They're going to break, sir. Pray they do, Sir Arthur said. Pray they do. And he wondered what was happening far ahead, whether the French escape route had been blocked. He already had a victory, but how complete would it be? The two battalions of guards, both twice the size of an ordinary battalion, marched steadily, and their bayonets were two thousand specks of light in the cloud-dimmed valley, and their colours were red, white, blue, and gold above them. And in front of them the French shivered, and the cannons fired again, and the blood mist flickered in two long lines to show where the round shots ploughed the files. And Sir Arthur Wellesley did not even watch the guards. He was staring up into the hills, where a great black rainfall blotted the view. God grant, he said fervently, that the road is cut. Amen, Colonel Waters said. Amen. The road was not blocked, because a leaping strip of stone spanned the Miserella, and a seemingly endless line of French made their way across the hump-backed arch. Sharp watched them. They walked like beaten men tired and sullen, and he could see from their faces how they resented the handful of engineer officers who chivied them across the bridge. In April these men had been the conquerors of northern Portugal, and they had thought they were about to march south and capture Lisbon. They had plundered all the country north of the Douro, they had ransacked houses and churches, raped women, killed men, and strutted like the cocks of the dunghill. But now they had been whipped, broken, and chased and the distant sound of the two cannon told them that their ordeal was not yet over. And above them, on the rock-strewn hill crests, they could see dozens of bitter men who just waited for a straggler. And then the knives would be sharpened, the fires lit, and every Frenchman in the army had heard the stories of the horribly mutilated corpses found in the highlands.
Sharp just watched them. Every now and then the bridge arch would be cleared so that a recalcitrant horse could be coaxed over the narrow span. Riders were peremptorily ordered to climb down from their saddles, and two hussars were on hand to blindfold the horses and lead them across the stone remnant. The rain eased and then became heavy again. It was getting dark, an unnatural dusk brought by black cloud and veils of rain. A general, his uniform heavy with sodden braid, followed his blindfolded horse across the bridge. The water seethed white far below him, bouncing off the rocks of the ravine, twisting in pools, foaming on down to the cavado. The general hurried off the bridge, and then had trouble remounting his horse. The ordinancer jeered him and hurled a volley of rocks, but the missiles merely bounced on the bluff's lower slopes and rolled harmlessly towards the road. Hogan was watching the French bunched behind the bridge through his telescope, which he constantly wiped clear of water. "'Where are you, Mr. Christopher?' he asked bitterly. "'Maybe the bastard's gone ahead,' Harper said tonelessly. "'If I was him, sir, I'd be in the front. Get away. That's what he wants to do.' "'Maybe,' Sharp acknowledged. "'Maybe.' He thought Harper was probably right, and that Christopher might already be in Spain, with the French vanguard. But there was no way of knowing that. Well, watch till nightfall, Richard, Hogan suggested, in a flat voice that couldn't hide his disappointment. Sharp could see a mile back down the road, which was crammed thick as the men, women, horses and mules shuffled towards the bottleneck of the Saltador. Two stretchers were carried over the bridge the sight of the wounded men prompting shouts of triumph from the ordinancer on the bluff. Another man, his leg broken, limped over on a makeshift crutch. He was in agony, but it was better to struggle on with blistered hands and a bleeding leg than fall behind and be caught by the partisans. His crutch slipped on the bridge's stone and he fell heavily, and his predicament provoked another flurry of curses from the ordinancer. A French infantryman aimed his musket up at the taunting Portuguese, but when he pulled his trigger, the spark fell on damp powder, and nothing happened except that the jeering became louder. And then Sharp saw him. Saw Christopher. Or rather, he saw Kate first, recognized the oval of her face, the contrast of her pale skin and jet-black hair, her beauty apparent even in this dark, wet horror of an early dusk. And he saw, surprised, that she was wearing a French uniform, which was strange, he thought. But then he saw Christopher and Williamson beside her horse. The colonel was dressed in civilian clothes, and was trying to edge and bully and force his way through the crowd so that he could get across the bridge, and so know himself to be safe from his pursuers. Sharp snatched up Hogan's telescope, wiped its lens and stared. Christopher, he thought, looked older, almost aged with something grey about his face. Then he edged the lens to the right and saw Williamson's sullen face and felt a surge of pure anger. "'Have you seen him?' Hogan asked. "'He's there,' Sharp said, and he put the glass down, slid his rifle from its new leather case and eased the barrel forward across a lip of rock. "'That's him, Sordes. Harper had seen Christopher now. "'Where?' Hogan wanted to know. Twenty yards back from the bridge, sir,' Harper said. "'Beside the horse, and that's Miss Kate on the horse's back. "'Ah, oh, Jesus!' Harper had seen Williamson. "'Has that?' "'Yes,' Sharp said curtly. "'And he was tempted to aim the rifle at the deserter rather than at Christopher. "'Hogan was gazing through the telescope. "'A good-looking girl,' he said. "'She makes the heart beat faster right enough,' Harper said. "'Sharp kept the rifle's lock covered, hoping to keep the powder dry.' and now he took off the scrap of cloth, pulled back the flint, and aimed the gun at Christopher. And just then the heavens bellowed with thunder, and the rain, which was already heavy, increased in malevolence. It crashed in torrents to make Sharp curse. He could not even see Christopher now. He jerked the rifle up and stared down into the blurred air which was filled with silver streaks, a cloud-bursting rain, a deluge fit to make a man build an ark. Jesus! and he could see nothing. And just then a slash of lightning sliced the sky in two, and the rain drummed like the devil's hoofbeats, and Sharp pointed the barrel towards the heavens and pulled the trigger. He knew what would happen, and it did. The spark died, the rifle was useless. And so he threw the weapon down, stood up, 
and drew his sword. What the hell are you doing? Hogan asked. Going to fetch my damn telescope, Sharp said, and went towards the French. The 4th Leger, counted as one of the best infantry units in Soult's army, broke, and the two cavalry regiments broke with them. The three regiments had been well posted, dominating a slight ridge that ran athwart the road as it approached the Ponte Nova. But the sight of the brigade of guards and the constant smack of rifle bullets and the stinging blows of the twin three-pounders had finished the French rearguard. Their task had been to halt the British pursuit, then withdraw slowly and destroy the repaired Ponte Nova behind them. But instead they ran. Two thousand men and fourteen hundred horses were converging on the makeshift roadway across the Cavado. None tried to fight. They turned their backs and they fled, and the whole dark, panicked mass of them was crushed against the river's bank as the guards came up behind. Move the guns! Sir Arthur spurred his horse towards the gunners, whose weapons had scorched two wide fans of grass in front of the barrels. Move them up! he shouted. Move them up! Keep at them! It was beginning to rain harder. The sky was darkening, and forked lightning slithered above the northern hills. The guns were moved a hundred yards nearer the bridge, and then rolled up the southern slope of the valley to a small terrace, from where they could slam their round shot into the crowded French. Rain hissed and steamed on the barrels as the first rounds crashed out, and the blood flickered its red haze above the broken rearguard. A dragoon's horse screamed, reared and killed a man with its flailing hooves. More round shots slammed home. A few Frenchmen, those at the back who knew they'd never reached the bridge alive, turned back, threw down their muskets and held up their hands. The guards opened ranks to let the prisoners through, closed ranks and loosed a volley that punched into the rear of the French rabble. The fugitives were jostling, pushing and fighting their way onto the bridge, and the congestion on the unbalustrated roadway was so great that men and horses were forced off the edge to fall screaming into the cavado. And still the two guns kept at them, slamming shots onto the Ponte Nova itself now, blooding the rafters and the felled trunks that were the rearguard's only escape. The round shots drove more men and horses off the span's unprotected edges, so many that the dead and dying made a dam beneath the bridge. The high point of the French invasion of Portugal had been a bridge at a Porto, where hundreds of folk had drowned in panic. And now the French were on another broken bridge, and the dead of the Douro were being avenged and still the guns hammered the French, and now and then a musket or rifle would fire, despite the rain, and the British were a vengeful line converging on the horror that was the Ponte Nova. More French surrendered. Some were weeping with shame, misery, hunger, and cold as they staggered back. A captain of the Fourth Leger threw down his sword, and then in disgust picked it up and snapped the thin blade across his knee before letting himself be taken captive. Cease fire! a cold streamer officer shouted. A dying horse whinnied. The smoke of muskets and cannon was lost in the rain, and the bed of the river was pitiful with the moans of men and beasts who had broken their bones when they fell from the roadway. The dam of dying and dead, of soldiers and horses, was so high that the cavado was piling up behind them and drying up downstream of them, though a trickle of blood-reddened water escaped from the human spillway. A wounded Frenchman tried to drag himself up from the river, and died just as he reached the top of the bank, where the cold stream of bandsmen were collecting their wounded enemies. The doctors stropped their scalpels on leather belts, and took fortifying slugs of brandy. The guards took the bayonets from their muskets, and the gunners rested beside their three-pound cannon. For the pursuit was over, and Soult was gone from Portugal. Sharp went headlong down the bluff's steep escarpment, leaping recklessly between rocks and praying that he would not lose his footing on the soaking grass. The rain was hammering down, and thunder was drowning the distant noise of the guns at the Ponte Nova. It was getting darker and darker, twilight and storm combining to throw a hellish gloom across Portugal's wild northern hills, though it was the sheer intensity of the rain that did most to obscure the bridge. But as Sharp neared the foot of the bluff, where the ground began to level, he saw that the saltador was suddenly empty. A riderless horse was being led across the narrow span, and the beast had held back the men behind. And then Sharp saw a hussar leading the horse, and Christopher, Williamson and Kate were just behind the saddle beast. 
A group of infantrymen were walking away from the bridge as Sharp came from the rain with his drawn sword, and they stared at him, astonished. And one half moved to intercept him, but Sharp told him in two short words what to do, and the man, even if he did not speak English, had the good sense to obey. Then Sharp was on the saltador, and the hussar leading the horse just gaped at him. Christopher saw him and turned to escape, but more men were already climbing the roadway. And so there was no way off the bridge's other side. Kill him! Christopher shouted at both Williamson and the hussar, and it was the Frenchman who obediently began to draw his saber. But Sharp's sword hissed in the rain, and the man's sword hand was almost cut off at the wrist. And then Sharp rammed the blade at the hussar's chest, and there was a scream as the cavalryman fell into the misarella. The horse, terrified by the lightning and by the uncertain footing on the bridge, gave a great whinny and then bolted past Sharp, almost knocking him off the roadway. Its horseshoes made sparks from the stones. Then it was gone, and Sharp faced Christopher and Williamson on the saltador's thin crest. Kate screamed at the sight of the longsword. "Get up the hill!" Sharp shouted at her. "Move, Kate, move! And you, you bastard, give me my telescope!" Christopher reached out to stop Kate, but Williamson darted past the Colonel and obstructed his hand. And Kate, seeing safety a few feet away, had the sense to run past Sharp. Williamson tried to grab her, then saw Sharp's sword swinging towards him, and he managed to parry the cut with his French musket. The clash of sword and gun drove Williamson back a pace, and Sharp was already following, snarling, the sword flickering out like a snake's tongue to force Williamson another pace backwards. And then Christopher shoved the deserter forward again. Kill him! He screamed at Williamson, and the deserter did his best, swinging the musket like a great club. But Sharp stepped back from the wild blow, then came forward, and the sword seared through the rain to catch Williamson on the side of his head, half severing his ear. Williamson staggered. The wide-brimmed leather hat had taken some of the blade sting, but the sheer force of the blow still sent Williamson lurching sideways towards the roadway's ragged edge. And Sharp was still attacking. This time, lunging, and the point of the blade pierced the deserter's green jacket, jarred on a rib, and sent Williamson over the edge. He screamed. Then Christopher was alone with Sharp on the high arch summit of the Saltador. Christopher stared at his green jacketed enemy. He did not believe what he saw. He tried to speak because words had always been Christopher's best weapon, but now he found he was struck dumb. And Sharp walked towards him, and then a surge of Frenchmen came up behind the Colonel, and they were going to force him onto Sharp's sword. And Christopher did not have the courage to draw his own, and so, in sheer desperation, he followed Williamson into the rainy dark of the Miserella's ravine. He jumped. Vicente, Harper, and Sergeant Macedo had followed Sharp down the hill, and now encountered Kate. Look after her, sir. Harper called to Vicente. And then, with Sergeant Macedo, he hurried towards the bridge just in time to see Sharp leap off the roadway. Sir, Harper shouted. Oh, Jesus, bloody God! He swore. The daft, bloody bastard! He led Macedo across the road just as a flood of blue-coated infantrymen spilled off the bridge. But if any of the Frenchmen thought it strange that enemy soldiers were on the Miserella's bank, they showed no sign of it. They just wanted to escape. And so they hurried north towards Spain as Harper prowled the bank and stared into the ravine for a sight of Sharp. He could see dead horses among the rocks and half submerged in the white water, and he could see the sprawling bodies of a dozen Frenchmen who'd fallen from the Saltador's high span. But of Christopher's dark coat and Sharp's green jacket, he could see nothing. Williamson had fallen straight into the deepest part of the ravine, and by chance had landed in a swirling pool of the river that was deep enough to break his fall, and he'd pitched forward onto the corpse of a horse that had further cushioned him. Christopher was less fortunate; he fell close to Williamson, but his left leg struck rock, and his ankle was suddenly a mass of pain, and the river water was cold as ice. He clung to Williamson and looked about desperately, and saw no sign of any pursuit. And he reasoned that Sharp could not stay long on the bridge in the face of the retreating French. Get me to the bank, he told Williamson. I think my ankle's broken. You'll be all right, sir, Williamson said. I'm here, sir. And he put an arm around the colonel's waist and helped him towards the nearest bank. Where's Kate? Christopher asked. 
She runs, sir. She run. But we'll find her, sir. We'll find her. Here we are, sir. We can climb here. Williamson hauled Christopher onto rocks beside the water and looked for an easy way to climb the ravine's side, and instead saw Sharp. He swore. What is it? Christopher was in too much pain to notice much. That bloody jack to jack pudding, Williamson said, and drew the sabre that he had taken from a dead French officer on the road near the seminary. Bloody sharp, he explained. Sharp had escaped the rush of oncoming Frenchmen by jumping for the side of the ravine, where a gorse sapling clung to a ledge. Its stem bent under his weight, but it held, and he'd managed to find a foothold on the wet rock beneath, and then jumped down to another boulder, where his feet had shot out from beneath him, so that he slid down the big stone's rounded side to crash into the river. But the sword was still in his hand, and in front of him was Williamson, and beside the deserter was a wet and terrified Christopher. Rain hissed about them as the dark ravine was garishly lit by a stab of lightning. My telescope, Sharp said to Christopher. Of course, Sharp, of course. Christopher pulled his sopping wet coattails up, groped in one of his pockets and took out the glass. Not damaged, he said brightly. I only borrowed it. Put it on that boulder, Sharp ordered. Not damaged at all, Christopher said, putting the precious glass on the boulder. And well done, Lieutenant. Christopher nudged Williamson, who was just watching Sharp. Sharp took a step nearer the two men, who both backed away. Christopher pushed Williamson again, trying to make him attack Sharp, but the deserter was wary. The longest blade he had ever used in a fight was a sword bayonet, but that experience had not trained him to fight with a sabre, and especially not against a butcher's blade like the heavy cavalry sword that Sharp held. He stepped back, waiting for an opportunity. I'm glad you're here, Sharp, Christopher said. I was wondering how to get away from the French. They were keeping a pretty close eye on me, as you can imagine. I have lots to tell Sir Arthur. He's done well, hasn't he? He's done well, Sharp agreed, and he wants you dead. Don't be ridiculous, Sharp. We're English. Christopher had lost his hat when he jumped, and the rain was flattening his hair. We don't assassinate people. I do, Sharp said, and he took a step nearer again, and Christopher and Williamson edged away. Christopher watched Sharp pick up the glass. Not damaged, you see. I took good care of it. He had to shout to make himself heard over the seething rain and the crash of the river thrusting through the rocks. He pushed Williamson forward again, but the man obstinately refused to attack, and Christopher now found himself trapped on a slippery ledge between cliff and river, and the colonel in this last extremity finally abandoned trying to talk himself out of trouble and simply shoved the deserter towards Sharp. Kill him! he shouted at Williamson. Kill him! The hard shove in his back seemed to startle Williamson, who nevertheless raised the sabre and slashed it at Sharp's head. There was a great clang as the two blades met. Then Sharp kicked the deserter's left knee, a kick that made Williamson's leg buckle, and Sharp, who looked as though he was not making any particular effort, sliced the sword across Williamson's neck so that the deserter was knocked back to the right. And then the sword lunged through the rifleman's green jacket and into his belly. Sharp twisted the blade to stop it being trapped by the suction of flesh, ripped it free, and watched the dying Williamson topple into the river. I hate deserters, Sharp said. I do so hate bloody deserters. Christopher had watched his man defeated and seen that Sharp had not had to fight hard at all to do it. No, Sharp, he said. You don't understand. He tried to think of the words that would make Sharp think, make him step back, but the colonel's mind was in panic and the words would not come. Sharp watched Williamson. For a moment the dying man tried to struggle out of the river, but the blood ran red from his neck and his belly, and he suddenly flopped back, and his ugly face sank under the water. I do so hate deserters, Sharp said again. Then he looked at Christopher. Is that so good for anything except picking your teeth, Colonel? Christopher numbly drew his slender blade. He'd trained with a sword. He used to spend good money that he could scarce afford at Horace Jackson's Hall of Arms on German Street, where he'd learned the finer graces of fencing, and where he'd even earned grudging praise from the great Jackson himself. 
But fighting on the French chalked boards of German Street was one thing, and facing Richard Sharp in the Miserella's ravine was altogether another. No, Sharp, he said as the rifleman stepped towards him, then raised his blade in a panicked repast as the big sword flickered towards him. Sharp's lunch had been a tease, a probe to see whether Christopher would fight. But Sharp was staring into his enemy's eyes, and he knew this man would die like a lamb. Fight, you bastard, he said, and lunged again, and again Christopher made a feeble repast. But then the colonel saw a boulder in the river's centre, and he thought that he might just leap to it, and from there he could reach the opposite bank and so climb to safety. He slashed his sword in a wild blow to give himself the space to make the jump, and then he turned and sprang. But his broken ankle crumpled, the rock was wet under his boots, and he slipped, and would have fallen into the river, except that Sharp seized his jacket. And so Christopher fell on the ledge, the sword useless in his hand, and with his enemy above him. No! he begged. No! He stared up at Sharp. You saved me, Sharp! he said, realizing what had just happened, and with a sudden hope surging through him. You saved me! Can't pick your pockets, Colonel, if you're under water, Sharp said. And then his face twisted in rage as he rammed the sword down. Christopher died on the ledge just above the pool where Williamson had drowned. The eddy above the deserter's body ran with new red blood. Then the red spilled out into the main stream, where it was diluted first to pink and then to nothing. Christopher twitched and gargled because Sharp's sword had taken out his windpipe, and that was a mercy, for it was a quicker death than he deserved. Sharp watched the colonel's body jerk and then go still, and he dipped his blade in the water to clean it, dried it as best he could on Christopher's coat, and then gave the colonel's pockets a quick search and came up with three gold coins, a broken watch with a silver case, and a leather folder crammed with papers that would probably interest Hogan. Bloody fool, Sharp said to the body. Then he looked up into the gathering night and saw a great shadow at the ravine's edge above him. For a second he thought it must be a Frenchman. Then he heard Harper's voice. Has he dead? Didn't even put up a fight. Williamson, too. Sharp climbed up the ravine's side until he was near Harper, and the sergeant lured his rifle to haul Sharp the rest of the way. Sergeant Merceda was there and the three could not return to the bluff because the French were on the road, and so they took shelter from the rain in a gully formed where one of the great round boulders had been split by a frost. Sharp told Harper what had happened, then asked if the Irishman had seen Kate. The lieutenant's got her, sir, Harper answered. The last I saw of her she was having a good cry, and he was holding hard onto her and giving her a nice pat on the back. The man like a good cry, have you noticed that, sir? I have, Sharp said. I have. Makes him feel better, Harper said. Funny how it doesn't work for us. Sharp gave one of the gold coins to Harper, the second to Macedo, and kept the third. Darkness had fallen. It promised to be a long, cold, and hungry night, but Sharp didn't mind. Got my telescope back, he told Harper. He thought she would. Wasn't even broken. At least I don't think so. The glass had not rattled when he shook it, so he assumed it was fine. The rain eased and Sharp listened, and heard nothing but the scrape of French feet on the Saltador's stones, the gusting of the wind, the sound of the river, and the fall of the rain. He heard no gunfire. So that faraway fight at the Ponte Nova was over, and he did not doubt that it was a victory. The French were going. They had met Sir Arthur Wellesley, and he had licked them, licked them good and proper. And Sharp smiled at that. For though Wellesley was a cold beast, unfriendly and haughty, he was a bloody good soldier. And he had made havoc for King Nicola. And Sharp had helped. He had done his bit. It was Sharp's havoc. <laughs>